This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents Decision at Sea, Five Naval Battles That Shaped American History, by Craig L. Simons, narrated by Stephen R. Thorne. Author's Note The original idea for this book belonged to Thomas B. Buell, a retired naval officer and respected historian. Early in 2002, he envisioned a book that examined the changing nature of warfare at sea by describing three critical sea battles of American history, Lake Erie, Hampton Roads, and the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal. Tom composed a proposal based on this idea and won a contract from Oxford University Press for a book to be called The Sea Warrior Trilogy. Soon thereafter, Tom's doctor informed him that he had leukemia. Though it was hardly his first thought upon hearing this devastating news, Tom was disappointed that his vision for this book would go unfulfilled. It was a mutual friend, Paul Stilwell, who, in conversation with Tom, suggested that perhaps I might take over the project. Tom and I had known each other since the 1970s, when we had both served in uniform at the Naval War College, and he was immediately enthusiastic about the idea. After several phone conversations, during which we discussed the project, Tom sent me a small package containing some preliminary notes he had made and a few of the books he was consulting. Two days after I received that package, Tom died. This is, of course, a very different book from the one that Tom would have written. For one thing, I decided not to include the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, and I have added three other battles, Manila Bay, Midway, and the Persian Gulf. I made these decisions for reasons that I think are compelling and which are explained in the prologue. But if the coverage is different, I tried to be faithful throughout to Tom's notion that a key element in the analysis of any naval battle should be a consideration of the impact of warfare on the individual officer and sailor. Some idea of how Tom felt about those ideas is evident in the foreword, drawn from Tom's original proposal, which follows this note. Forward, by Thomas B. Buell A large stained glass window in the Naval Academy Chapel depicts a newly commissioned ensign in dress white uniform reading his commission, held reverently in his outstretched hands. A seascape occupies the background, and a figure of Christ rises on the horizon. This vision inspired me when I worshipped there as a midshipman. I perceived the naval profession as a special calling that demanded selfless devotion to the United States Navy and the nation. The spirit of naval heroes was everywhere, in portraits, banners, murals, busts, monuments, and memorials. The essence of the Naval Academy was clear and unmistakable. A naval officer was part of an elite society of which much was expected, and he led a life governed by ethics, morals, and certitudes. While he was in the world, he was not of it. As I matured in the profession, reality replaced imagery through observation and study. Though I recognized that naval leaders were fallible, they continued to fascinate me. There were two principal reasons. One was that as a career naval officer, my professional goal was command at sea, and I recognized that such an aspiration required the ability to lead under stress. I studied in order to learn from the masters. The other reason was intellectual inquiry. To learn how the great naval leaders developed their talents, how they thought and reasoned, and what compelled their actions. How did they manage the responsibilities and tension of high command? How did they prepare themselves for war, reflect about war, and behave when they made war? To discover the answers, I read, and eventually I wrote, naval history. For although history is a constantly changing tableau, it is also a seamless cloth, and by understanding how sea warriors in the past attempted to answer these questions, I could discern the essential nature of war at sea. The antagonists in the battles described in this book first had to contend with the sea. 
The sea's most fundamental characteristic is its vastness, for the oceans cover 75% of the Earth's surface. While Army officers think in terms of kilometers over terrain ranging from deserts to mountains, naval officers think in terms of transit time over great distances, hundreds and even thousands of nautical miles over a uniform water surface disturbed only by the wind. Naval officers prefer the freedom of the open seas, though they must nonetheless sometimes fight at close quarters in restricted waters, forcing them to think three-dimensionally by considering the depth of the water under the keel as well as the precise distances between ship and shoals. In the middle of the 20th century, their warfare environment included carrier-launched airplanes, and by the end of that century, it embraced orbiting satellites as naval warfare became genuinely global. Alfred Thayer Mahan notwithstanding, no one navy can truly control the sea, for a fleet is but a pinprick upon 135 million square miles of water. It may be a fleet of great power, able to defeat any enemy within range of its weapons, and thus temporarily control an area within its combat radius. But when the fleet moves on, the sea in its wake is again open to other ships to pass undisturbed. Hence, there is no equivalent to the trenches, fortifications, and front lines of land warfare, which allow armies to remain in place and in control indefinitely. Barclay controlled Lake Erie until defeated by Perry. The Virginia seized control of Hampton Roads for a day, only to lose it the next. In the Western Pacific, Japanese control of the waters around the Philippines proved almost equally fleeting. In the Persian Gulf, and in the modern world generally, the control of any sea is an elusive and ephemeral quality. The accountability of command, however, is absolute. This sometimes leads naval officers to be careful, even meticulous, their degree of caution or boldness contingent upon their willingness to take calculated risks. But sea duty also instills a sense of enormous confidence and independence first experienced when a junior qualifies as an officer of the deck underway and assumes the burden of responsibility for the ship while the captain is below. Decisions must often be made instantaneously, and as a junior officer makes those decisions and exercises his authority, he may over time come to feel more liberated than inhibited by the mantle of authority. Once in command, a captain's authority becomes nearly as absolute as his accountability. In the midst of battle, that authority must be exercised in an environment that is both chaotic and constantly changing. War is messy. The orderly battle line disintegrates into a melee. The eternal question for captains engaged in combat is one of assigning priorities. Which of the many crises a captain confronts must be dealt with first? Does he maneuver to conform to instructions that seem to have been overtaken by events? Or does he exercise his authority and independently close with the enemy? At the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, the great British hero of the Age of Sail, Horatio Lord Nelson, informed his commanders that no captain can do very wrong if he places his ship alongside that of an enemy. Nelson encouraged independent thought among his subordinates, and that day, at least, it paid off for him and for England. Despite dramatic improvements in communication since Nelson's day, the central dilemma remains, and both responsibility and accountability continued to reside with the ship's commanding officer. Each of the battles discussed in this book provides insight into the essential features of naval combat and command at sea. From the age of sail to the modern era, the one constant element is fighting spirit. While there have been many personalities among the Navy's great commanders, from the flamboyance of Bull Halsey to the reticence of Raymond Spruance, fighting spirit has always been the one essential characteristic of them all. Without the warrior ethic, without courage under fire, a naval officer cannot command. Prologue Naval Battles and History History is about to change, and more than any other human activity, war both causes and accelerates change. 
war propels history into fast forward, precipitating social and cultural transformation so swiftly and profoundly that often it is that transformation, rather than the object that provoked hostilities in the first place, that emerges as the principal consequence of war. Occasionally the change is self-conscious, the product of deliberate revolution, such as the one that took place in France in 1789. More often, however, change is a byproduct of war, unforeseen and even unimagined, as in the dramatic social and cultural revolution that resulted from the mass mobilization and ghastly bloodletting in Europe from 1914 to 1918. Despite the best efforts of policymakers who struggle to fulfill the Clausewitzian dictum that wars ought to be a means by which nations secure clear and discreet national policy objectives, wars create a momentum of their own that constantly threatens to seize control of events from the hands of the decision makers and send history careening forward like a runaway train. War also reflects change. Indeed, because war places society under pressure, it casts a bright light onto the values and character of the societies engaged in it. War invites, even demands, that citizens sacrifice their time, their treasure, their very lives to the object of the war, however ill-defined or imperfectly understood that object might be. In consequence, it is in the midst of war that citizens are most frequently called upon to embody the dominant values of their culture. The archaic chivalry of medieval warfare, one where army commander might politely offer another the opportunity to strike the first blow, reflected one set of values. The cold-blooded matter-of-factness with which the German Einsatzgruppen conducted the mass execution of Soviet Jews in 1942 reflected another. Once begun, war often becomes the dominant governmental and cultural concern, and because of that, war most accurately reflects both the prevailing technology and the dominant culture of the societies engaged in it. As is the case with all nations, the history and culture of the United States has been both defined by and reflected in its several wars. From the earliest days of the Republic, war delineated the stages of American transformation, as the country evolved from a frontier society along the Atlantic seaboard to become first a continental power, then a world power, then eventually the greatest power in history. At each stage of this metamorphosis, America's wars reflected the dominant national focus of its generation. In the early 19th century, America's wars focused on defending the frontier and protecting its overseas trade. At mid-century, the Civil War resolved a fundamental disagreement about the nature of American democracy and began a social and political revolution as profound as any in the country's history. At the end of the century, the United States defeated Spain in a war that marked America's emergence as a world power. In the 20th century, the American century, the United States confirmed its status as world power as it participated in two world wars, and by the end of that century, many Americans accepted as a matter of course that the United States had both the right and the responsibility to act as the world's policeman and to extend its military power into every corner of the globe. All these profound changes were the product of wars. All of them are likewise reflected in the way the nation conducted those wars. These changes were not instantaneous, nor were they the product of a single event. Still, it is possible to identify one battle from each epoch to serve as a useful historical milestone that illuminates the nature of these changes. No less an authority than Winston Churchill, who knew a thing or two about both history and war, insisted that battles are the landmarks of secular history. Churchill was referring to land battles when he made the remark, but as a former naval person, he surely would not have dissented from the assertion that naval battles, too, are milestones of historic change. For Britain, the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, the victory at Trafalgar in 1805, and the victory over the U-boat menace in 1943 were all crucial and historic moments, 
marking as they did the dawn, apex, and sunset of British naval supremacy. For the United States, too, the stages of national transformation can be identified with specific naval battles that both reflected and provoked cultural and societal change. This book is based on the premise that five landmark naval battles were milestones not only of American naval history, but also of the country's national history. Oliver Hazard Perry's victory on Lake Erie in 1813 was a rare fleet engagement for the U.S. Navy in the age of sail, and a bracing bit of good news in an otherwise disappointing war. But more importantly, Perry's frontier navy, itself constructed of the trees of the western forests, secured the American claim to the Northwest Territory, and was therefore an essential prerequisite for the subsequent westward expansion that would eventually make the United States a continental power. The Battle of Hampton Roads in 1862 was the world's first engagement between armored warships, and in that respect, it foreshadowed the age of machine warfare. But in the process, it also demonstrated the industrial strength and economic resilience of the Union states, factors that helped ensure the survival of the Union itself and launched the reunified United States into the age of industry. The Battle of Manila Bay in 1898 was the nation's first that involved the ocean-going steam and steel warships of what historians have labeled the New Navy. It also marked America's debut as a nascent world power and secured a series of overseas possessions that dramatically altered America's place in world politics. After that, the national insularity that many Americans had taken for granted would prove impossible to sustain, and the United States became, if not quite an empire, then at least a major power on the world stage. Midway was not the world's first carrier battle, but it was the carrier battle that changed the course of the Second World War, not only in the Pacific, but globally, and put the United States on the path to superpower status. Operation Praying Mantis in 1988, the most obscure of the battles profiled here, not only revealed the capabilities of a new generation of electronically integrated missile systems, but fixed the United States at the center of the Middle East political struggle and marked the emergence of the United States in its new role as the world's policeman, a role it would continue and expand upon in the 21st century. Technology, as well as culturally and politically, each of the battles described in this book marked a departure from an existing paradigm, all but the first. The Battle of Lake Erie occurred near the end of an era in which the dominant model of naval warfare had remained relatively static for two and a half centuries. Ever since the end of the 16th century, warships had been essentially floating platforms for artillery. War at sea entailed maneuvering wooden-hulled, sail-driven vessels in such a way as to bring their broadsides of cast-iron guns to bear against the enemy. The most effective way to do that was for warships to sail single file in a long column, which was called a line ahead. Because a line is no stronger than its weakest element, it soon became evident that only those ships carrying more than 50 guns should occupy a position in this line. They were called ships of the line. They carried their heavy guns in two or sometimes three long rows along each side, and when those guns were fired all at once, this was known as a broadside. There were smaller warships, too. Frigates carried fewer guns, usually between 20 and 40, in one row on the weather deck and were used to scout for the enemy battle fleet or to escort merchant ships from port to port. Even smaller vessels, sloops and brigs with 12 to 20 guns, carried dispatches from place to place and harried the trade of others. But in the European wars of the 17th and 18th centuries, it was the ships of the line that won or lost wars. The product of three centuries of evolution, ships of the line were magnificent engines of war. Each of them carried between 60 and 100 guns, though 74 eventually became standard, and each required a crew numbering up to a thousand men. 
with their three towering masts, complex webs of ropes, lines, and cables, and hand-carved and gilded filigree, especially around the stern. They were works of art, as well as engines of war. And it is no wonder that they have been the focus of painters and model builders ever since. The French, in particular, built beautiful ships. If pressed, many British naval officers would admit that French ships were often better than their own. But during the century and a quarter of almost continuous warfare between the two countries, after 1689, many of those beautiful French ships ended up flying the British ensign. This was because what mattered most in a fleet engagement during the Age of Sail was not the beauty of the design or the sophistication of the technology, but the skill and discipline of the crew. Because France, as a continental power, necessarily focused on land war, her naval crews were often less experienced than those of Britain, and in battle after battle, British fleets with fewer ships and fewer guns outperformed their French counterparts. Throughout all those wars, a pattern or template of naval warfare emerged that served to guide the naval officers who were charged with the command of war fleets. The keys to success, they learned, were 1. A fleet commander had to maintain strict control over his ships, deploying them in a well-ordered line-ahead formation so that an enemy fleet would face an unbroken wall of cannon. Such a battle line might number anywhere from half a dozen to three dozen ships of the line, and when so many vessels were arrayed end to end, a cable's length apart, 200 yards, the battle line might extend for several miles. A watchful fleet commander would maintain the discipline of this extended battle line by signal flags, enjoining each captain to keep his ship in its proper place. 2. British commanders, at least, also sought to gain and hold the weather gauge. That is, they tried to ensure that the wind blew away from their fleet and toward that of the enemy. The side with the weather gauge could control the action. No fleet could attack upwind, so whoever held the weather gauge could choose the moment of attack. For their part, the French were often happy to accept the lee gauge because frequently their objective was not the destruction of the enemy fleet, but rather the protection of a convoy, and holding the lee gauge allowed them to break off the action when their immediate goal had been achieved. In addition, the wind blew the white smoke from hundreds of cannons on the ships with the weather gauge into the faces of their adversaries. These well-understood advantages often led to elaborate maneuvering before the battle, as each fleet commander sought to gain the weather gauge. Finally, once the two fleets were side by side, sailing in parallel lines, a half cable's length apart, 100 yards, victory or defeat depended on how quickly the gunners could fire their guns. Other factors being equal, a ship whose crew could fire around every three minutes was likely to defeat a ship whose crew could fire only every five minutes. Aiming the guns was a very imprecise science, but given the close range at which the ships fought, Pointing the gun in the general direction of the enemy was often all the aiming that was required. To be successful in all three of these predictors, the secret was constant drill. Drill in fleet maneuvers, in station keeping, and in gunnery. Service in war fleets of the age of sail, therefore, meant endless days of nearly constant drill. Officers called for the men to make sail, shorten sail, clear for action, secure from quarters, and fire as the target bears. But sometimes, too, success depended on the willingness of a bold commander to violate these time-tested rules of engagement and do the unexpected. The archetypal naval battle of the Age of Sail was the victory of Lord Nelson over the combined fleets of France and Spain off Cape Trafalgar on October 21, 1805, a victory that certified England's undisputed command of the seas during the Napoleonic Wars, and which is still celebrated annually in England. For the United States, however, the most important naval battle of this era was the one that took place 25 years earlier, on September 5, 1781, off the entrance to Chesapeake Bay. No Americans participated in this battle, 
and by the standards of the age it was neither a very big battle nor tactically decisive. Nevertheless, the Battle of the Capes was the battle that secured American independence, for it prevented the rescue of Lord Cornwallis and his trapped army at Yorktown and was the proximate cause of his surrender. Though it may be technically incorrect to cite this as one of America's great naval battles, a short description of it is appropriate here, for not only did it contribute significantly to American victory in the Revolutionary War, but it provides a useful benchmark for the consideration of the subsequent battles that are discussed in this book, and in that respect, it is a useful prototype of naval warfare at the apex of the Age of Sail. A Prototype of Naval War, The Battle of the Capes On the morning of September 5, 1781, the British frigate Solbay was sailing southward, running before the wind, as it approached the entrance to Chesapeake Bay. At nine o'clock, a lookout stationed in the foretop called down to the deck to report that he could see a fleet of warships anchored just inside the southern headland, Virginia's Cape Henry. The Solbay's captain, Charles H. Everett, was skeptical. He suspected that the lookout was fooled by the bare trunks of trees on the edge of the American wilderness. Taking a long glass with him, Everett climbed the rigging to have a look himself. As he steadied himself in the foretop and the image swung into view through his glass, he could no longer doubt. There were indeed a number of large warships anchored there, and they were ships of the line. Since all British ships of the line were accounted for, these vessels could only be French. He counted them as his own vessel drew closer. When he got to eight, he thought it must be the squadron of Admiral de Barras from Newport, though how the Frenchman came to be there he could not imagine. Then he kept counting, and when he reached the mid-teens, he knew that it could only be the French main battle fleet of the Comte de Grasse from the West Indies. After returning to the deck, Everett sent signal flags whipping up the halyards of the Sol Bay to be read by the flag lieutenant on the British flagship London, several miles astern, where the news then became the problem of the British fleet commander, Rear Admiral Thomas Graves. The sequence of events that brought the fleets of Graves and de Grasse to Chesapeake Bay in the first week of September 1781 had begun more than a year earlier when Major General Charles Cornwallis initiated a lengthy land campaign in the Carolinas that was designed to pacify the southern colonies. Harassed by irregular forces commanded by Thomas Sumter, the Gamecock, and Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, Cornwallis's small army nevertheless worked its way north from Charleston, fighting a series of small and indecisive battles with American forces at places such as Camden in South Carolina and Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina, before entering Virginia in the spring of 1781. In late July, Cornwallis marched his army to Yorktown on Chesapeake Bay to await support from the Royal Navy. Instead, on August 26th, it was the French fleet of Admiral de Grasse that arrived. The arrival of de Grasse's fleet at that time and place was one of the most unlikely and, at the time, consequential events of the whole war. The Franco-American alliance, signed three years before, in 1778, had prompted George Washington to nurture a hope that, with French naval support, he might at last be able to win a decisive victory over the British. Washington knew that as long as the Royal Navy commanded the sea, the British Army could never be pinned down and defeated unless it foolishly ventured inland, as John Burgoyne had done at Saratoga. Because the Royal Navy did command the sea, whenever British land forces got into trouble, they headed for the coast, where their navy could resupply, reinforce, or, if necessary, evacuate them. But with the French alliance, the Americans, too, had a fleet, or at least a fleet that was on their side. To make maximum use of it, however, the Franco-American allies would have to achieve a kind of coordination that was virtually unprecedented in the age of sail, and in the end, it took more than two years to achieve it. The first piece of the puzzle, the key piece, was the fleet of Admiral Francois-Joseph-Paul Marquis de Grasse-Tilly, 
or simply the Comte de Grasse, in the West Indies. De Grasse's orders specified that the protection of French possessions in the West Indies was his first priority. After all, most Europeans held the sugar islands of the Lesser Antilles to be of far greater value than all of the mainland American colonies combined. But in midsummer of 1781, de Grasse received a letter from the French general Jean-Baptiste de Rochambeau, who wrote him from Newport that the American Revolution was foundering and that swift action by de Grasse and his fleet might be essential to sustain it. Boldly, de Grasse took it upon himself to ignore his orders and focus instead on the needs of his American allies. I believe myself authorized to take some responsibility on my own shoulders for a common cause, he wrote. Despite the pleas of French merchants in the Caribbean and the risk to his own career, de Grasse decided to take his entire fleet to the American coast. On August 14, 1781, Washington received a letter from de Grasse indicating that he planned to arrive at the mouth of Chesapeake Bay at the end of the month. Washington then made a decision that was as bold as de Grasse's. Leaving a small covering force to keep an eye on the British in New York, he started south with an army of 7,000 men, over half of them French soldiers under Rochambeau. This combined force of French and Americans marched overland across New Jersey and into Pennsylvania, then through Philadelphia and southward to the head of the Elk River at the top of Chesapeake Bay. There, some embarked on barges and small boats to finish the trip by water while others continued to march through Baltimore and across the Potomac into Virginia, then along the banks of the York River to join the Marquis de Lafayette's covering force at Williamsburg outside Yorktown. At the same time, de Barras left Newport with six ships of the line, plus four frigates and 18 transport ships carrying Rochambeau's artillery. For Washington's plan to work, all these elements, the troops marching overland, those going by sea, de Barras's squadron with the siege artillery, and most important of all, de Grasse's battle fleet, had to arrive at the same place at more or less the same time, without encountering any British forces en route. The key element in all of this was de Grasse's battle fleet, which consisted of 28 ships of the line, including his flagship, the Ville de Paris, the largest warship in the world at the time. The British suspected that de Grasse might send some portion of his fleet to aid the Americans, but they also assumed that he would have to leave at least half of it in the West Indies, and as a result, they sent only 14 ships of their own after him, under the command of Sir Samuel Hood. The British might have sent more ships from the home fleet to reinforce their American holdings, but threatening French naval movements in European waters convinced the decision-makers at Whitehall to keep the home fleet close to Britain. Hood guessed at once that de Grasse was heading for Chesapeake Bay, and he set a direct course for Virginia. He arrived at the entrance to Chesapeake Bay on August 25th and looked in past the capes to discover that the French were not there. Hood then made another assumption. If de Grasse wasn't in the Chesapeake, he must have headed instead for New York. He therefore immediately sped away to the north to join his commander, Thomas Graves, in New York Harbor. A few days after Hood disappeared over the northern horizon, the first of de Grasse's vessels loomed over the southern horizon. Like Hood, who had taken the direct route to the Virginia coast, de Grasse had gone first to Spanish Cuba. Spain was a French ally in the war against Britain, and then hugged the American coastline as he worked his way north. As a result, he did not arrive off the Cape Henry headland until August 29th, dropping anchor in Linhaven Bay just inside Cape Henry. Over the next few days, he landed 1,500 troops and an equal number of sailors to join the American army under the Marquis de Lafayette, thereby ensuring that Cornwallis would remain trapped in Yorktown until Washington's army arrived. With de Grasse holding the entrance to the bay and a Franco-American army holding the lines around Yorktown, Cornwallis was in a box. His survival depended entirely on whether or not the Royal Navy could drive off the French fleet, regain control of Chesapeake Bay, 
and resupply or reinforce him. When Hood arrived at New York on September 1st, he found that the French fleet was not there either. He instantly concluded that he had been right the first time and that de Grasse had sailed for the Chesapeake after all, though he could not imagine how he had missed him. He pressed Admiral Graves, who was senior to him, to join forces and return to the Chesapeake to challenge de Grasse. Graves concurred, but he was able to contribute only five of his eight ships, and as a result the British fleet headed south with a total of 19 ships of the line plus a handful of frigates. Since Graves assumed that de Grasse had no more than 14 ships, at most 20 if he had somehow managed to join forces with de Barras, he counted on superior British gunnery to overwhelm the French. Not until he read the signal flags from the Sol Bay on the morning of September 5th did Graves realize that de Grasse had not 14 or even 20 ships of the line, but 28. To his credit, the news from the Sol Bay did not deter Graves from his objective. At 10 o'clock in the morning, he ordered his ships to clear for action. This involved not only casting loose the guns and bringing up powder and shot from the magazine, but also knocking down temporary bulkheads to provide an uninterrupted gun deck, lashing up the hammocks to get them out of the way, and to provide a cushion for the woodwork. Splinters were a major cause of injury in a naval engagement, and throwing sand on the decks so that the gunners did not slip on the blood that would soon be flowing. This complicated evolution usually took between four and six minutes, and then, with everyone in place, Graves watched while the French, too, prepared for battle. De Grasse learned of the approach of the British fleet at about the same time that Graves learned of the presence of the French. The Frenchman could have stayed where he was and tried to defend the entrance to the bay. Control of the Chesapeake, after all, was the object of the whole campaign. But he knew that de Barras was coming south from Newport with the siege artillery, and he feared that if he did not go out to fight the British, they might intercept and capture de Barras's whole squadron. Since his ships were at anchor, the first thing to do was get underway. Hauling up the heavy anchors took so much time, so de Grasse ordered his captains to slip their anchors, that is, to tie the anchor line to a buoy so that the anchor could be found later, then cut the line with an axe. While that was taking place, other hands climbed the towering masts to loosen the sails. Though routine, this was always dangerous work, for after climbing to the yards some sixty or eighty feet above the deck, the men then had to edge out on the foot ropes suspended below the yards, holding on to the yard itself until they could reach the knots that kept the sails furled. They then untied the knots and shook the heavy canvas sails loose so that other men on the deck below could haul in on the lines and pull them taut. De Grasse ordered his ships to form a battle line as best they could, promiscuously was the word he used, without worrying about the previously established order of sailing. This led to a kind of race in which the most eager captains with the fastest ships sought to take the lead, while others whose ships were less nimble or who had to round the shoal water off Cape Henry fell to the rear. In an age when personal honor was reflected by a captain's willingness to put himself and his men in the position of maximum danger, this was a race for distinction and preferment, as well as pride. With evident satisfaction, de Grasse later reported, all the captains applied themselves, and the fleet was under sail in less than three quarters of an hour. As the French ships straggled out of the bay in no particular order, Graves's fleet continued to close the range, their ships in precise alignment under topsails and jib. The French admired the precision of the British line. One French officer later wrote, They came down upon us with a following wind, and with an assurance which made us think they did not know our strength. But even as the English fleet bravely sailed toward the enemy, Graves worried about the tactical problem of bringing all the enemy ships to battle in accordance with the prescribed formula. The two fleets were approaching each other on opposite tacks, if they continued as they were, the battle would be a passing engagement. In order to put all of his own ships alongside those of the enemy on the same tack, Graves would have to turn his column around 
to head east. At a few minutes past two, therefore, Graves' flagship hoisted the signal for all ships to wear together. This was when the months and even years of constant drill paid off. All 19 ships in the British line of battle executed the same maneuver at the same time, only 200 yards apart, as each ship put down its helm, the yards swinging round, and the ships settled back into line on the port tack, but now in reverse order. By three o'clock, the two fleets were side by side, two miles apart, sailing eastward. The French had a clear numerical advantage. De Grasse had left four of his ships behind to watch the York and James Rivers, but that still gave him 24 ships of the line to Graves' 19. More importantly, the French also had 500 more guns, 2,000 to 1,500, and at least two of the English ships, Terrible and Ajax, were leaking so badly that they had their pumps going even before the battle began. Indeed, their leaks made them so unseaworthy that they kept falling out of position until Graves fired three shots to leeward to punctuate the signal, Keep Better Station. But to balance these weaknesses, there was the long tradition of superior British gunnery and the fact that de Grasse had sent 1,500 of his sailors ashore, which meant that several of his ships were severely short-handed. And, of course, there was the evident disorganization of the French battle line. The first four or five French ships that rounded the Cape Charles headland sorted themselves out into a passable line of battle, but much of the rest of the fleet was bunched up well to the rear. The French van was isolated and, in Hood's view, ripe for the picking. Hood's division, which had initially occupied the British van, was now in the rear. Graves' order to wear together had reversed the order of the British fleet, and Hood waited impatiently for Graves to signal General Chase, which would release him and all other commanders from the discipline of the line-ahead formation in order to fall upon the disorganized French. Instead, Graves kept the signal for line-ahead flying, though he decreased the interval to a half-cable's length, 100 yards, to tighten up the formation. Later, Hood wrote with obvious disapproval that the French disorder afforded the British fleet a most glorious opening for making a close attack, but it was not embraced. In fact, far from dashing at the enemy, Graves deliberately waited until the French ships had successfully rounded Cape Henry and organized themselves into a more or less coherent battle line before issuing the order to attack. His notion of a fleet engagement was so tied to the concept of parallel battle lines that he felt compelled to wait until all ships on both sides were in their proper station before the battle could begin. Finally, at four o'clock, Graves raised the signal for close action, but he also kept the signal for line ahead flying. Graves' difficulty was that the flag hoist system allowed him to send only very specific orders, Lord Howe had issued a new set of signal codes when he arrived in New York in July 1776, only a week after the American Declaration of Independence was signed. These had been modified by Vice Admiral Marriott Arbuthnot and adopted by Graves, who issued them to Hood. But even these revised codes gave commanders very limited options. Each set of signals was coded to a particular order in the Royal Navy's signal book. The signal for close engagement, for example, was a white pendant over a blue and white checkered square. What Graves wanted was for his whole fleet to ease down gradually against the enemy battle line so that each vessel took on its opposite number. But there was no signal for such a maneuver. Improvising, Graves ordered the signals for engage the enemy and line ahead at the same time, hoping that his captains would figure it out. The use of signal flags to issue orders to a fleet underway was still evolving in the late 18th century. Not until 1790 did the Royal Navy adopt Lord Howe's system as standard. Even then, it was sometimes necessary to spell out non-standard orders. At Trafalgar in 1805, Nelson kept his signal officers busy during the long approach to battle by ordering them to spell out the now-famous order England expects that every man will do his duty. They didn't. 
As the British van, commanded by an admiral with the historic name of Francis Drake, edged down toward the French van to engage, the rest of the British battle line remained locked in its tight line-ahead formation, so the opposing battle lines formed an acute angle to one another. Even after the lead vessels began firing broadsides, the ships in the rear of both lines remained out of range. Eager as he was for a fight, Hood felt obliged to remain a well-disciplined half-cable's length behind the ship in front of him. He was not happy about it. He was angry that Graves had not pounced on the isolated French van when he had the chance. He was angry that Graves kept the signal for line ahead flying, even after the action opened. Above all, he was angry that Graves did not set an example of close action, in his words, by adopting a less conventional and more aggressive plan for the battle. The ships at the front of the two columns hammered away furiously at each other, though this time the British did not dominate the gunnery duel, as they so often did. In part, this may have been because the most eager French captains had charged to the front when de Grasse ordered them underway, so the French ships that constituted the van of their fleet were those led by the most aggressive French commanders. Moreover, the British van contained several of the ships that entered the battle already in a weak condition, including the leaky Terrible and Ajax. At 4.15, Graves hauled down the signal for line ahead, but the rest of his fleet never did get fully involved. At 5 o'clock, with the sun already low in the sky, De Grasse ordered his fleet to bear away, and at six, the firing died out. Though no one knew it yet, the battle was over. For whatever reason, the British had got the worst of it. The lead British ship, the Shrewsbury, suffered 26 killed and 46 wounded, including the ship's captain, who lost a leg. The second ship in the line, the Intrepid, counted 65 shot holes in her starboard side, in addition to which her sails and rigging were badly cut up, and both her main mast and foremast were so weakened that they threatened to go over the side. Eventually, the Intrepid lost its weakened main mast, and the captain of the Terrible reported that his pumps could not keep up with the water, which was rising at the rate of eight feet per hour. On September 11th, six days after the battle, Graves decided to abandon the Terrible, and after the crew was removed, it was burned. Altogether, the six ships in the British van suffered 54 killed and 153 wounded, whereas in the six ships of Hood's rear division, there were no casualties at all. French casualties were comparable, a total of 209 killed and wounded, but their ships were relatively undamaged. For the next three days, the two fleets maneuvered as each sought to gain or keep the weather gauge. At the same time, the British worked furiously to repair their battered and crippled vessels, while Graves tried to figure out his duty under these unusual circumstances. When he ordered his ships to prepare for battle on the 6th, several captains replied that they were in no condition to renew the fight. When Graves sent to Hood for his advice, that officer was icily correct and altogether unhelpful. I dare say, Hood replied, Mr. Graves will do what is right. On September 10th, five days after the battle, Graves called for a conference of flag officers on board the London. At that conference, when Graves asked Hood why he had not engaged during the fight, Hood replied, You had the signal up for the line. When Graves asked Drake why he had engaged, Drake replied, on account of the signal for action. Graves turned back to Hood. What say you to this? Hood replied, The signal for the line was enough for me. As the English admirals engaged in this kind of unprofitable bickering, de Grasse managed to maneuver his ships into the windward position. Then he disappeared. Graves literally lost sight of him. The next day, Hood wrote Graves a formal note suggesting that de Grasse must have returned to Chesapeake Bay, as indeed he had, and implying that since this was the object of the whole campaign, the British should head there as well. Hood got no answer to that, but on the 13th he received an equally formal note that, 
along with Hood's response, speaks volumes about the character of formal communications in the 18th century, as well as the thinly disguised tension that existed between the beleaguered graves and his frustrated subordinate. On board HMS London, Thursday morning, 6 o'clock. Admiral Graves presents his compliments to Sir Samuel Hood and begs leave to acquaint him that the French fleet are at anchor above the Horseshoe Shoal in the Chesapeake and desires his opinion what to do with the fleet. Barfleur, Thursday morning, 7 a.m. Rear Admiral Sir Samuel Hood presents his compliments to Rear Admiral Graves, is extremely concerned to find by his note just received that the French fleet is at anchor in the Chesapeake, though it is no more than what he expected. Sir Samuel would be very glad to send an opinion, but he really knows not what to say in the truly lamentable state we have brought ourselves. That afternoon, in a council of war on board the London, the British commanders agreed to return to New York, refit, and make another try of it later. Lord Cornwallis, whose cornered army was the focus of the whole campaign, still hoped that the Royal Navy might give it another try. But the odds had become much longer. Washington had arrived at Yorktown with the rest of the American army. Worse, while Graves and de Grasse had maneuvered further and further away from the Virginia Capes, de Barras had arrived with eight more French ships of the line and had slipped into the bay, giving de Grasse a total of 36 such vessels. Moreover, de Barras brought the heavy siege artillery the Franco-American allies needed to isolate Yorktown completely. Just as there was a studied formality to engagements at sea, so too was there a regular procedure for sieges ashore. With heavy siege guns, Washington and Rochambeau could begin working their way, yard by yard, toward the British lines. And finally, Cornwallis was running out of food and supplies. On October 3rd, he ordered 200 horses drowned in the York River because he did not have enough forage to keep them alive. In New York, the British made great efforts to patch together a relief expedition. Eventually, they gathered some 25 ships of the line, plus an equal number of transports, crammed with an embarked army of over 7,000 men. The sailing date was set for October 19th, but though the British in New York could not have known it, on that very day, outside Yorktown, the British army marched out of its lines to lay down its arms in formal surrender. When Graves reached Chesapeake Bay two days later, he learned that not only had Cornwallis surrendered his army, but a total of 36 French ships of the line now occupied the bay. True to his character, Hood wanted to remain on station and blockade them. But with the odds so long, and with 7,000 embarked soldiers to feed, blockade was an unlikely stratagem. Graves had to face the fact that he was too late. The next day, he led his armada back to New York. Graves lost his job. His command of the American station had always been a temporary one, though he might have kept it had he won a victory. Instead, the arrival of Rear Admiral the Honorable Robert Digby ended his short tenure, and Graves was ordered to Jamaica to serve under Vice Admiral Sir Peter Parker. Whether or not this was meant as a chastisement, Graves took it as one. I must beg to state to the lordships in my own behalf, he wrote, that being superseded by a junior officer and sent to another station where I can only be second and possibly third in command, implies such a disapprobation of my conduct as will certainly discredit me. It was characteristic of his generation and his station in society to express as much concern about how his transfer would affect his reputation as he did about the loss of Cornwallis's army. After all, he seemed to ask, what was his crime? He had followed the rules precisely. In responding to Hood's subsequent criticism of his conduct of the battle, he replied, My aim was to get close, to form parallel, and attack together. Wasn't that precisely what a fleet commander was supposed to do? If Graves had played by the rules, de Grasse had bent them. First, 
in virtually abandoning the West Indies to bring his entire fleet to Chesapeake Bay, second, by going out to meet the British challenge rather than trying to defend the bay, and finally, by discarding the hoary rules of combat to improvise when necessary. Then, too, while Graves and Hood had bickered over whose fault it was that de Grasse had got away, de Grasse and his subordinates engaged in a genuine exchange of ideas about how best to react to the British challenge. A quarter century later, Lord Nelson would emphasize the importance of command cooperation, and he christened his subordinate captains a band of brothers. In the Battle of the Capes, it was the French high command, and not the British, that behaved in accordance with this new concept of cooperative command. For the French and the British, the Battle of the Capes was simply one more fleet engagement in a long list of such encounters. But for the Americans, it was epical. Though it was part of a complex global strategy involving naval and land forces separated by thousands of miles, in the end, Graves' failure to drive de Grasse from the Virginia Capes was the proximate cause of Cornwallis' capitulation, the event that led directly to American independence. In London, George III wanted to continue the fight for his North American colonies, but his prime minister, Lord North, knew better. He knew that after this disaster, the country would not sustain a continued war. When he heard that Cornwallis had surrendered, he cried out, Oh God, it is all over. For the United States, however, it was only the beginning. Part 1. Wooden Warships and the Western Frontier The Battle of Lake Erie, September 10, 1813 Lake Erie is the southernmost of the five Great Lakes. At its western end, it is fed by the Detroit River, which carries the discharge from the three largest of those lakes, Superior, Michigan, and Huron. And at its eastern end, it is drained by the Niagara River, which spills spectacularly into Lake Ontario. Along its southern shore, connected today by the asphalt ribbon of Interstate 90, it is a string of cities historically associated with the coal and steel-based industry of the late 19th century. Buffalo, Erie, Cleveland, Toledo, and Detroit. Modern Americans are likely to conceive of this region as the Rust Belt, an area where the old economy flourished in the 19th and early 20th centuries, where brick chimneys spilled black smoke into the sky and where endless trains of boxcars and flat cars carried the products from a hundred factories to the world's consumers. Given that, it is difficult to envision Lake Erie the way Americans did in the early 19th century, as a distant frontier of dense forests and untracked wilderness, a body of water whose shores were largely unpopulated, if not, in some areas, virtually unexplored. The town of Erie, was a tiny frontier settlement on Presque Isle Bay. Cleveland had fewer than a hundred residents, and Detroit was Fort Detroit, a garrisoned western outpost for trappers and traders. In 1813, Lake Erie represented not the east, but the west, and it was the key to the great western empire granted to the United States by the British in the Treaty of Paris in 1783. That treaty had been a diplomatic coup for the United States. Not only did it acknowledge the United States to be free, sovereign, and independent, it also established the national boundaries of the new country as extending to the River Mississippi, thus granting to the new nation a Western empire beyond the hopes of all but the most optimistic. Of particular interest was the area west of the Alleghenies and north of the Ohio River, a region called simply the Northwest, an area that would eventually encompass the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. The treaty called for British troops to be evacuated with all convenient speed from this territory, but the British seemed to find any speed inconvenient. This infuriated Americans, who had always suspected that the British government intended to keep them hemmed in along the coastline. 
One of the charges that Americans had leveled against George III in the Declaration of Independence was that he had encouraged the merciless Indian savages to attack American settlements on the western frontier. If that was not literally true, it was certainly true that the British hoped to limit American expansion in the West, even after independence, and they sought to achieve this goal by encouraging the aspirations of the native tribes. In some small part, this may have been due to British concern for their erstwhile Indian allies, but primarily it was because the British recognized that a thriving and commercially vibrant United States would pose a threat to British mastery in the Atlantic. Because there were so few roads in the Northwest, the lakes and waterways were crucial. Travelers from the East Coast to the Western frontier generally ascended the Hudson River to Albany then worked their way westward along the Mohawk River Valley to Lake Ontario and along its southern shore to Lake Erie, which provided communication with Ohio and Michigan Territory. The ability to move men and supplies across the western lakes determined control of not only the northwest, but also Upper Canada, the southernmost part of modern Ontario. In 1813, whoever controlled Lake Erie controlled the west, and with it the future course of American history. On the 10th of September in 1813, that future was decided in a battle between two small squadrons of sailing vessels on Lake Erie. It was America's most important engagement during the Age of Sail, and if the numbers involved were relatively modest, the strategic consequences were enormous. At first light, on September 10, 1813, the two brigs and seven small gunboats that constituted the American naval squadron on Lake Erie lay quietly at anchor in the sheltered waters of Put-in Bay in the lee of South Bass Island. As dawn spread slowly across the surface of the lake, a sailor stationed at the cross trees of the main mast on the flagship Lawrence peered into the gray mist to the northwest, the direction from which the enemy was most likely to approach. As the sky brightened, he noted a small irregularity that emerged from the gray curtain, and with the sun at his back, he discerned the glint of sunlight off canvas. He did not wait for the image to solidify. Cupping his hand around his mouth, he shouted down to the deck below, Sail ho! Where away? the deck officer called back. Off Snake Island, came the reply. Then the sailor cried out again, Sail ho! Then again, Sail ho! Six sail in sight. In his cabin, at the stern of the Lawrence, 28-year-old Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry was on his feet, even before the deck officer could formally relay the news. He knew at once that the appearance of six sail could only mean that the British fleet was out and approaching. He rushed topside from his cabin and began issuing the commands that would get the Lawrence and the eight other vessels of his command out of the bay and into the open waters of Lake Erie, where they could meet the enemy. A single gun boomed out from the Lawrence, the prearranged signal to get underway. Bosun's pipes twittered, and the ship came to life. Sailors spat into their hands before grasping the capstan bars and leaning into them to heave up the ship's anchor. Other sailors climbed outboard of the rails to ascend the rope ladders, called rat lines, to the horizontal spars or yards, then edged out onto the foot ropes slung below the yards in order to loose the sails. A few of them moved gingerly, looking down as they placed their bare feet on the single strand of rope. Watching from the deck below were other sailors, who only weeks before had been members of the militia army of General William Henry Harrison, and who found themselves aboard a ship now only because of Perry's desperate need for manpower. As the sails were sheeted home, the ship began to move, almost imperceptibly at first, and the helmsman gently tested the feel of the tiller as the ship's keel bit into the water. These activities were duplicated throughout the squadron, as one by one the vessels of Perry's command got underway. Perry had been anticipating this moment for over five months, ever since he had arrived at Presque Isle on the lake's southern shoreline in late March, with orders to oversee the completion of a squadron of warships. Now his nervous energy was evident in his body language, 
as he paced back and forth on the small quarter-deck, glancing upward to see how the sails were drawing, peering around him at the activity within the squadron, and turning occasionally to steady his glass on the approaching enemy. The fact that the British were out and apparently determined on a fight was the good news. Perry had been seeking just a fight ever since his squadron had been completed in late July. The bad news was that the wind was blowing from the southwest, which would give the British the weather gauge. As long as the wind blew from the British toward the Americans, the British commander could decide when, or even if, to engage, and more importantly, at what range. Both of Perry's big ships were armed primarily with short-range carronades, stubby, short-barreled guns that were deadly at close range, but useless at a distance. If the British held the weather gauge, they could remain at whatever range they preferred and pick him to pieces with their long guns. Perry wanted a fight at close range, preferably at the traditional half-cable's length, about 100 yards, from which distance he was confident that he could blast the English ships to kindling. But the contrary wind made that unlikely. Almost certainly the British commander had chosen this moment to seek battle, precisely because the wind direction would allow him to dictate the character of the fight. Perry was reluctant to surrender such an advantage without a struggle. As the vessels of his squadron straggled out of the bay in a rough line-ahead formation, he set a course to gain a westerly heading in an effort to seize the weather gauge. For three hours, from seven to ten, he tried to force his square-rigged, two-masted brigs into the teeth of a seven-knot breeze, tacking back and forth with a great expenditure of time and effort. The novice sailors on the Lawrence struggled mightily to brace the yards as close to the wind as the geometry of wind and sail would allow. Then at Perry's command, they swung the yards around by brute force as the tiller went over and the ship heeled grudgingly onto the other tack. Forward progress was measured in feet. At times, it seemed that the contrary wind was pushing the American ships sideways, and meanwhile, the British ships were coming ever closer. They were easily visible from the deck now, and the surgeons made on board the Lawrence was impressed by the display. The vessels were freshly painted, he recalled, and with the morning sun shining upon their broadsides, and their red ensigns gently unfolding to the breeze, they made a very gallant appearance. At mid-morning, with the British squadron hull up and closing, Perry reluctantly conceded the weather gauge to the enemy. He abandoned the idea of a fight from close range and gave the order to wear ship to put the Lawrence and the rest of the squadron on an easterly heading. It would give the British a serious, perhaps even decisive, tactical advantage, and the Lawrence's sailing master, William Taylor, was bold enough to say so. I don't care, Perry shot back. To windward or to leeward, they shall fight today. Then Perry's luck changed. The southwest wind weakened and died, and then almost imperceptibly, it began to blow from the southeast. At once, Perry countermanded the order to wear ship, and as the new breeze strengthened and the sails on the Lawrence stiffened, the American vessels settled comfortably on a northwesterly route with the wind to their backs. In that moment, the tactical advantage shifted dramatically and unpredictably from the British to the Americans. His spirit soaring, Perry ordered the battle flag that he had prepared raised to main truck of the Lawrence. It was a large black square on which a sailor's widow had stitched white block letters to form the words, Don't give up the ship. Every man on board knew that this was more than command guidance. They were the dying words of James Lawrence, captain of the ill-fated American frigate Chesapeake, who had been mortally wounded in a duel with the British frigate Shannon on the 1st of June, and in whose honor Perry's flagship had been named. Perry no doubt meant the flag to be an inspiration as well as an injunction, and when it broke at the top of the mast and could be read, it elicited a rousing cheer from the crew. If nothing else, the flag was a symbol of Perry's determination to bring things to a decisive conclusion. Perry knew that in the next few hours, the men on board the two squadrons, now swiftly closing on each other, would decide the control of Lake Erie, and with it, 
the outcome of the campaign for mastery of the American Northwest. The war that brought Perry to Lake Erie had its roots in the continuing, indeed seemingly endless, series of wars between Britain and France that dated back to 1689. The latest chapter in this epic struggle had begun in 1793, a decade after the end of the American Revolution. And by the dawn of the new century, the armies of France were being led by an inspired and unpredictable genius named Napoleon Bonaparte. By then, the British had developed a well-worn strategy for conducting their wars against France, counting on their continental allies to keep the French army occupied on land the British themselves relied heavily, if not quite exclusively, on their navy to blockade the coast of France, to harry its trade, and to seize its colonies. Only in Spain, where the future Duke of Wellington fought a war of attrition and maneuver with the French occupiers, did Britain commit its soldiers to the land war. On one hand, such a strategy took maximum advantage of Britain's superiority at sea and minimized British casualties. But on the other hand, it was enormously expensive. To maintain a worldwide fleet of nearly a thousand warships required not only money, but also manpower. And as a result, the Royal Navy had an unquenchable need for sailors, or at least for men who could be turned into sailors. To get them, Royal Navy captains fitting out ships for service were authorized to press men into service, that is, simply to take them, in whatever public place they could be found, lounging on the docks, having a pint or a smoke at the pub, even sleeping in the rented room of a boarding house. The press gang could not, however, enter a man's home. That, at least, was sacrosanct. Ignorance of the maritime profession provided no security from the press gangs, even those who had never been to sea were fair game. Rated as landsmen and assigned the most rudimentary tasks, they were expected simply to learn on the job. The justification for this draconian policy was the presumption that every British citizen owed service to his king whenever the security of the nation was at risk. The press was the British counterpart of the French Le Vie en Masse, that secured the cannon fodder for Napoleon's armies. After the end of the brief Peace of Amiens in 1803, with the war already in its second decade, the pickings had become pretty scarce along the waterfront, and Royal Navy captains had to be increasingly creative to secure a crew. Royal Navy warships stopped inbound British merchant ships at the harbor's mouth, and the men on board who had been eagerly looking forward to setting foot on shore after a long voyage instead found themselves pressed into the Royal Navy. This practice extended into the open sea as well, and became so common that British merchant captains, like their French counterparts, often fled at the sight of a Royal Navy warship on the horizon. Of course, flight aroused the suspicions of warship captains, who set out in pursuit and soon caught and stopped the slower merchant vessels. Sometimes the warship only spoke the vessel, with officers literally shouting across the intervening distance to discover the identity and nationality of the suspicious merchantman. But often the captain of the warship decided to send a boat for closer inspection. When the boat bumped alongside, a Royal Navy lieutenant, generally a young man in his early twenties, would climb onto the deck and ask the skipper for his papers. Once satisfied that the vessel was not French or bound for a French port, the lieutenant might ask the captain to muster his crew. Any likely-looking sailor, particularly one with a seaman's pigtail or tattoo, would then and there be pressed into service, taken off the merchantman and carried back to the warship to serve for the duration of the war. If the warship was seriously shorthanded, men might be pressed into service whether they had previous naval experience or not, even if they claimed not to be British citizens. What rankled Americans was that this practice of impressment often included American vessels. Stopping American ships at sea to check their papers was annoying enough, but when the British began conscripting able-bodied Americans off those ships, it was intolerable. The British insisted that they took only men who could be identified as British citizens, men who by their English birth owed service to their king by British law. 
But men who had been born in the British Isles and subsequently emigrated to America did not think of themselves as British subjects. Besides, Royal Navy captains who were desperate for manpower inevitably stretched the definition of British subject. Any bloke with an accent, or for that matter anyone who could not prove that he wasn't British, was likely to be pressed into service. Eventually, some 10,000 men who claimed to be Americans were pressed into service to feed the insatiable manpower demands of the Royal Navy. American protests over this practice nearly boiled over into war fever in 1807, when the British frigate Leopard stopped the American warship Chesapeake, just outside its namesake bay. James Barron was the Chesapeake's commanding officer, and because he did not expect to encounter a hostile environment until he arrived in the Mediterranean, he was apparently unconcerned that the Chesapeake's deck was littered with crates of supplies, its guns secured, and its powder and shot stowed below. Technically, Barron was the commodore of the Mediterranean squadron, and Charles Gordon was the captain of the Chesapeake. But Barron was the senior officer present afloat, SOPA, and therefore responsible for the decisions made during the encounter with the Leopard. Afterward, it was Barron, and not Gordon, who was court-martialed and suspended from the service for five years for taking the vessel to sea in such an unready state. When the Leopard signaled that it had dispatches to deliver, Barron obligingly hove to and waited for the small boat containing a blue-coated lieutenant to be rowed across. The dispatches turned out to be a letter from the British captain demanding that three men, all of them deserters from the Royal Navy, whom he believed to be on board the Chesapeake, be turned over to him. Barron was convinced that there were no British deserters on his ship and refused the request. The lieutenant made it clear that he was under specific orders and that serious consequences might result if Barron did not accede. When Barron remained adamant and sent the lieutenant back to his ship, the leopard opened fire. Unable to reply due to the disorganized state of the gun deck, the officers and men on the hapless Chesapeake simply absorbed the punishment until finally a single gun could be fired in a gesture of defiance before Barron ordered the flag lowered. As the white smoke from the guns drifted away, the lieutenant returned and claimed his three deserters, and the leopard departed. News of this outrage raced through the states. Impressing sailors from merchant vessels was bad enough, but opening fire on an American ship of war elevated the dispute to a crisis. President Thomas Jefferson came under tremendous pressure to do something. Jefferson, however, saw little national benefit other than the mitigation of hurt pride to be gained from a war with England, and his reaction was muted. Still, his complaints were sufficient to secure an apology from the British, who were no more eager for war than he was. The British Commodore, who had ordered the recovery of the deserters, was recalled, and two of the seized men were returned. One had already been hanged for desertion. Nevertheless, American anger and bitterness lingered, as British insults to American nationality and pride continued. Less dramatic but equally divisive were the disputes between America and Britain over economic policy. By 1806, Britain had gained unquestioned command of the sea, due largely to Lord Nelson's spectacular victory at Trafalgar in October 1805 over the combined fleets of France and Spain. For their part, the French had gained dominance on land due to Napoleon's equally spectacular victories over the Austrians and Russians at Austerlitz, 1805, and the Prussians at jena Auerstadt, 1806. The British were masters of the sea, the French were masters of the land. Because neither side could effectively threaten the other, each side sought to apply indirect pressure through economic sanctions. Napoleon began the economic warfare by declaring from French-occupied Berlin that no European nation would henceforth be allowed to trade with England, the so-called Berlin Decrees. England reciprocated with an order in council proclaiming that all nations trading with France or its allies would be treated as hostile. Caught in the middle of these opposing declarations was the neutral United States. 
Jefferson tried to avoid entanglement by declaring an embargo on all American trade, a policy that failed to influence the great powers abroad and which led to widespread smuggling at home before it was finally repealed in 1809. A third source of conflict between the United States and Britain was British sympathy for and support of several of the Western Indian tribes in the Old Northwest. Despite the terms of the Treaty of Paris, which ceded the territory north of the Ohio and east of the Mississippi to the United States, the British maintained close relations with the native tribes of the Northwest, and particularly the Iroquois. On one hand, such a policy was intended to keep the peace and protect the handful of Canadian trappers and traders who ventured into the region of the Great Lakes. But in addition, British support for the Indians was a deliberate strategy to counterbalance American influence in the area. Americans resented the continued British influence in the Northwest and suspected that British agents were deliberately encouraging Indian raids against American outposts. American suspicions increased in 1808 when the Shawnee war chief Tecumseh, brother of the visionary leader known as the Prophet, met with British officials at Fort Malden on the Canadian side of the Detroit River to urge that they form a military alliance to drive the Americans from the region. The British did not say yes, but neither did they say no. Tecumseh met with the Americans, too. In 1810, he told the American militia general William Henry Harrison that the Western Indians would not sign any more treaties that gave away Indian lands, and that further encroachments by the Americans on those lands would be met with force. When Indian raids against American outposts continued, Harrison organized a campaign to capture and punish those who were conducting the raids. As his militia army approached the Prophet's village, on the Tippecanoe River in what is now central Indiana, the Indians struck. The prophet had assured the warriors that American bullets could not harm them, and they attacked fearlessly, if improvidently. In the Battle of Tippecanoe, November 7, 1811, they suffered horrible losses, but they also killed or wounded nearly 200 Americans before they were driven off, and the next day Harrison's men burned the prophet's village. Frustrated and embittered by his brother's defeat, Tecumseh again appealed to the British. This time he arrived at Fort Malden bearing a beaded belt, or wampum, that the British had given the Iroquois years earlier, after the French and Indian War, as a token of permanent friendship and support. Brandishing this token, Tecumseh called upon the British to honor their pledge. This time the British were more receptive. Having decided that war with America was now likely, if not imminent, the British agent, Matthew Elliott, sent off a request for 500 British troops to act in concert with the Indians in an attack on Fort Detroit once war commenced. Americans in the area were now convinced that this Anglo-Indian alliance was a direct threat to their security. In March 1812, the Niles Weekly Register declared flatly, that the Indian raids on the frontier are instigated and supported by the British in Canada. The convergence of these events in Europe, on the high seas, and in the forests of the American Northwest brought the crisis in Anglo-American relations to a climax. One group of mostly Western and Southern congressmen, soon dubbed the War Hawks, argued that because British dominance at sea was insurmountable, the best means of bringing England to account was to threaten her Canadian possessions. It was obvious that the United States lacked the resources to create a navy that could confront the British on the high seas. But the British commitment to the ongoing European war meant that British Canada was weakly garrisoned. The War Hawks argued that the invasion and occupation of Canada would not only suppress the Indian raids, but also enable the Americans to hold Canada as a bargaining chip in the subsequent negotiations concerning both impressment and the hated orders in council. One of the prominent war hawks, House Speaker Henry Clay, wrote a friend in 1813, When the war commenced, Canada was not the end, but the means, 
the object of the war being the redress of injuries, and Canada being the instrument by which that redress was to be obtained. This new bellicosity led Congress to enact a number of measures during the winter of 1811 through 1812 designed to put the country on a war footing. One act authorized an increase in the size of the regular army from 10,000 to 35,000. Another authorized the president to call out 100,000 militia volunteers. When it came to naval preparations, however, Congress balked. A bill introduced by South Carolinan Langdon Shevs to build 10 new frigates failed to pass in either house, not because member believed that war could or should be avoided, but because they perceived that the coming war was likely to be fought along the Canadian border and not on the high seas. Many congressmen were instinctively suspicious of standing naval forces and argued that a permanent naval establishment was likely to become a tool of oppression. After all, wasn't British tyranny on the high seas the source of the current problem? Navies, Congressman William Bibb of Georgia insisted, are calculated to produce mischief. The British were not intimidated by the American preparations, but neither were they eager to add one more nation to their long list of foes in a war that had been going on intermittently for nearly two decades. In June 1812, therefore, the British repealed the orders in council, but it was too late. That same month, the U.S. Congress declared war. The American decision to declare war was astonishingly reckless. To be sure, Britain was engaged in a world war with Napoleonic France, which would prevent her from focusing all of her national strength against the United States. But the disparity in power between Britain and America, particularly at sea, was an unbridgeable gulf. The U.S. Navy in 1812 consisted of a total of 17 ships of war and 165 harbor defense gunboats, most of which carried only a single cannon and which could not operate on the high seas. By contrast, the Royal Navy had over 1,000 warships on its Navy list, 719 of them in commission, 261 laid up in ordinary, and 62 more under construction. And many of those ships were double or triple deck ships of the line carrying up to a hundred or more guns each. A fair measure of the disparity in naval power between the opponents is the fact that the Royal Navy had three times as many ships as the United States Navy had guns. The Warhawks insisted that this didn't matter. They hoped to seize Canada with a militia army and hold it as hostage for future negotiations, and they insisted that the conquest would be an easy one, a mere matter of marching, as more than one described it. The Warhawks noted that Britain had wrested Canada from the French less than 50 years before, and they insisted that the allegiance of the population to British rule was questionable. In fact, Americans convinced themselves that the Canadians would not fight, or at least that they would not fight effectively. One congressman described them as a debased race of poltroons who would bolt and run at the mere sight of an army of the United States. But in order to overawe the poltroons of Canada, the United States would first need an army, and in spite of congressional authorization to raise new troops, its army was no more ready for war than its navy. In 1812, the U.S. Army comprised two very different elements, a frontier constabulary, consisting of small garrisons strung out across the western frontier to keep an eye on the Indians, and a quite separate body of men who were assigned to the coastal artillery along the Atlantic seaboard. But there was no field force, no army that could march to Canada or any place else. Where would this army of the United States come from? The answer? was the militia. The American citizen soldier was then, and to a certain extent remains today, part of American popular culture. The prototype was the Minuteman, who stood on Lexington Green to defy the Redcoats in 1775. Despite Washington's subsequent skepticism about the value of militia troops during the Revolutionary War, an American myth emerged about the fighting prowess of the militia. According to this myth, 
America's security depended on its farmer soldiers, men who in the time of danger would seize their muskets from over the mantelpiece, muster on the village common, and march off to war to defend the Republic from either the heathens on the frontier or the hired legions of a European enemy. This symbolism survives today in the Army Reserve, which employs the silhouette of a Minuteman as its official emblem. The mythology of the citizen soldier survives in popular culture as well. A film of the 1980s, entitled Red Dawn, reflected the patriotic anti-communism of the Cold War era by depicting a handful of high school students with shotguns and pickup trucks defending Colorado from a Soviet invasion. By 1812, the idea that the nation's military strength rested in its militia had become a matter of faith. In fact, the militia had never performed all that well in battle. And in any case, by 1812, the leaders of the various militia units were either superannuated leftovers from the revolution, or, more often, ambitious politicians who had obtained militia commissions for their social cachet or political value. A militia army meant indifferent discipline, insecure logistical support, and questionable leadership. Despite that, American optimism was not entirely misplaced, for Canada was indeed vulnerable. In 1812, Canada was not the continental giant it is today. It consisted primarily of a series of towns and villages along the valley of the St. Lawrence River. Some likened British Canada to a tree lying on its side. The roots of this tree spread out from the Gulf of St. Lawrence, past Newfoundland, and into the Atlantic Ocean. The trunk was the St. Lawrence River, reaching inland past Quebec and Montreal to the branches of the tree, which were the five Great Lakes. Lower Canada referred to Quebec and the lower reaches of the St. Lawrence near the roots of the tree even though they appear above the rest of Canada on a map. And Upper Canada meant the area south and west of Montreal, bounded by lakes Ontario and Erie to the south, and Huron to the north. To kill this tree, it was fairly obvious that Americans should aim to sever the trunk, and the obvious place to apply the axe was Montreal. An American thrust up the traditional invasion route of the Hudson River Valley and along the axis of Lake Champlain to the St. Lawrence would cut the upriver settlements off from the life-giving river, and Canada would fall. But it didn't happen that way. A number of factors conspired to wreck this strategic plan before it even got started. First of all, the absence of a standing U.S. Army meant that a militia field army had to be assembled, and that took time. While time passed, Americans were distracted by other wartime demands. Most importantly, the British deliberately diverted attention from the vulnerable trunk of the Canadian tree to its branches by unleashing the Indian threat in the Northwest. The campaign that should have begun at Montreal, therefore, began instead at Detroit. And it began badly. In June of 1812, while Congress debated a declaration of war against England and Napoleon launched his ill-fated invasion of Russia, an American brigadier general named William Hull was marching what he grandly called the American Army of the Northwest through the forests of Ohio and Michigan toward Detroit, cutting a military road as he went. A Revolutionary War veteran and governor of Michigan Territory, Hull had enough military experience and knowledge of the local geography to realize the dangers of launching an invasion of Upper Canada before gaining naval control of Lake Erie, and his first instinct was to postpone an offensive until the lake was secured. But under pressure to act quickly, Hull decided that an American conquest of the lake's north shore would deny British warships their bases and thereby secure naval control without a navy. His first instinct was the correct one. If Hull's advance to Fort Detroit was less disastrous than Napoleon's march to Moscow, his campaign was nevertheless a strategic calamity of the first order for the United States. To begin with, Hull chose to build his road through the Black Swamp, which slowed his progress considerably. Even more ill-considered was his decision to send his sick, 
and all of his baggage ahead on the small schooner Cuyahoga across Lake Erie. On the very day that the Cuyahoga set sail, news arrived at British-held Fort Malden at the mouth of the Detroit River that Congress had declared war. When the Cuyahoga sailed blithely past Fort Malden en route to Detroit, six British soldiers in a rowboat stopped it, clambered on deck, and declared it to be a prize of war. The British thereby obtained not only a number of American prisoners, as well as most of the American Army's entrenching equipment and all of its baggage, but also a copy of Hull's orders, his personal correspondence, and the Army's muster rolls. Only after Hull arrived at Detroit in early July did he learn that war had been declared and that he had already suffered a serious setback. The news bred caution in a man who was already supremely cautious. It was Napoleon Bonaparte, now en route to Moscow, who asserted that, in war, it is not men who make the difference, but the man. What won battles, in other words, was not numbers, but leadership. Whether that was true of Napoleon's victories and his defeats, it was certainly true of the campaign along the banks of the Detroit River in the summer of 1812. Though Hull commanded an army of 2,600 men, including one regular U.S. Army regiment, he lacked the will to use his army effectively. By contrast, his British opponent, Major General Isaac Brock, had only about 700 men, half of them Canadian militia, but he possessed both a burning determination and a willingness to take risks. Hull began his campaign by issuing a proclamation to the Canadians, announcing that he bore them no hostility and offering peace, liberty, and security as long as they did not interfere with his invasion. If they did, however, he promised instant destruction. Alas, Hull's actions did not match his words. Once he finally crossed the Detroit River into Canadian territory to begin his march toward the British outpost at Fort Malden, he moved slowly and cautiously, stopping en route to build a blockhouse. Because the British controlled the waters of both Lake Erie and the Detroit River, all of Hull's supplies had to come overland, which made them vulnerable to raids. And when Brock's Indian allies raided his supply lines, Hull concluded that he was overextended. While a bolder man might have pressed on, Hull decided, as he said later, that an attempt on Malden should never be made until there was an absolute certainty of success, though he should have known as well as anyone that in war there is no such thing as an absolute certainty. Even so, Hull decided to give up his advance and fall back across the river to Fort Detroit. Brock had planned to evacuate Fort Malden if the Americans arrived in force, but upon learning of Hull's retreat, he decided instead that an aggressive show of force now not only would allow him to keep the initiative, but also might attract more Indian allies to his side. Despite the long odds, therefore, he decided to follow up Hull's retreat and invade the United States. His decision was as bold as Hull's was cautious, for Fort Detroit was a substantial citadel in that distant frontier. Its log and earth walls were 22 feet thick and protected by 26 artillery pieces. Undaunted by that reality, Brock crossed the river and invested Detroit from the landward side, sending the schooner Queen Charlotte with 18 guns and the brig General Hunter with 10 to block the Detroit River. Though Brock had only about 400 regulars, an equal number of militia, and some 600 Indian allies, barely half of whole strength, he declared that Detroit was under siege. His claim was more than bluff. With British ships controlling the river and Brock's Indian allies making the overland supply routes uncertain, Detroit was cut off from either supplies or support. Hull was terrified that if the siege proved successful, Brock would not be able to control his Indian allies, and the families inside Fort Detroit would be butchered. When Brock promised safe passage for the Americans, if they surrendered, Hull accepted. The impact of this disaster spread ripples all across the frontier and changed American strategy in Washington as well. Throughout the Northwest, 
the British success at Detroit emboldened the native tribes, and violence exploded all along the frontier from Ohio to Indiana. Hull himself was court-martialed, found guilty of neglect of duty and cowardice, and sentenced to die, though President Madison commuted his sentence in recognition of his Revolutionary War contributions. The fall of Detroit also provoked a dramatic change in U.S. grand strategy. The initial American thrust toward Montreal fizzled when an American militia army under Major General Henry Dearborn reached the Canadian border in November, and the New York militia, which made up the bulk of his command, refused to leave their state. Even before that absurd denouement, President James Madison and Secretary of the Navy Paul Hamilton decided it was essential to refocus national attention on the northwest frontier, regain Detroit, and pacify the western Indians. Hull's fate underscored the reality that for an American army to operate effectively on the northwest frontier, it would first be necessary to gain naval superiority on Lake Erie. Alas, when Brock captured Detroit, he also captured the only armed vessel the United States had on that lake, the 14-gun brig Adams, which the British renamed Detroit and added to their fleet of four other small warships to make up a squadron totaling 57 guns. As long as the British controlled the lake, they also controlled all the lands that were washed by it from Ohio to Michigan. To defeat the Indians, therefore, it would first be necessary to build a fleet that could wrest control of Lake Erie from the British. Without the ascendancy over those waters, Madison wrote, we can never have it over the savages. Ironically, then, the land war against Canada would depend on the Navy, after all. In fact, in the war so far, the tiny American Navy on the high seas had provided the only news that Americans could cheer about. Only three days after William Hull had ignominiously surrendered Detroit to the British, his nephew and adopted son Isaac Hull, in command of the frigate Constitution, 44 guns, revived American morale as well as the family honor by winning a decisive victory over the British frigate Guerriere, 38 guns, south of Newfoundland. It was in this fight that some of the British cannonballs allegedly bounced off the side of the stoutly built Constitution, giving her the immortal nickname Old Ironsides. Soon afterward, even as the vaunted American invasion of Canada was collapsing, other single-ship victories by American frigates helped boost American morale at home. In October, Stephen Decatur in the United States, 44 guns, defeated the British Macedonian, 38 guns, and in December it was the Constitution again, this time commanded by William Bainbridge, defeating the Java, 44 guns, in a brutal slugfest off the coast of Brazil. After that, the British Admiralty ordered Royal Navy frigate commanders to avoid one-on-one -on -one engagements with the large American frigates. These American successes did not significantly affect the overall strategic situation, however, and within months, a tightening British blockade of the American coast kept most of the U.S. warships imprisoned within their harbors. While those vessels sat idle, the United States had no ships at all on Lake Erie where they were now so desperately needed. To bring energy and a sense of purpose to the American naval presence on both Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, Madison appointed 40-year-old Navy veteran Isaac Chauncey to command American naval forces on both western lakes. Though Chauncey had little experience with naval combat, he had served a tour as commander of the New York Navy Yard and was knowledgeable about the construction and repair of ships, which was precisely the skill most needed in the fall of 1812. Chauncey's orders granted him wide latitude. He was to do whatever was necessary to obtain command of the lakes Ontario and Erie with the least possible delay, and to achieve that, his orders gave him unlimited authority to purchase, hire, or build any vessels that he thought necessary. He could appropriate any supplies he needed and commandeer all the manpower he wanted, including ship carpenters, caulkers, riggers, sailmakers, and company as may be required. 
Though Chauncey would have command on both lakes, he could not be in both places at the same time. So Hamilton ordered him to choose one of the lakes for his own headquarters and send some officer in whom you can confide to take command of the other. Chauncey set up his own headquarters at Sackett's Harbor, at the eastern end of Lake Ontario, and to take command on Lake Erie, he chose Lieutenant Jesse Duncan Elliott. Elliott was 30 years old in the fall of 1812 when he arrived on the shores of Lake Erie. A broad-faced man of middle stature, he had gotten something of a late start in his profession. Whereas most professionally ambitious young men received a midshipman's warrant in their teens, Elliot did not become a midshipman until he was 21, an age when many young officers were already prepping for their lieutenant's exam. Perhaps because of that, he was a man in a hurry, eager for the public and professional glory that adhered to those who achieved military success. Like many officers during the age of sale, he was prone to measure his own worth by the yardstick of professional comment and public opinion. After all, not only were public acclaim and promotion gratifying, they were tangible evidence and validation of one's honor. In the 19th century, having honor not only required the demonstration of certain personal characteristics, such as bravery and truthfulness, but those values had to be confirmed and validated by the publicly expressed opinions of others. An unwitnessed act of honor was of little importance. Having been promoted from midshipman to lieutenant only two years before, Elliot looked to his assignment on Lake Erie as an opportunity to make his name in the service, gain promotion, and, not incidentally, validate his honor. Elliot arrived in Buffalo in the first week of September, 1812. Before he could challenge the British for command of the lake, he first had to build a fleet. Moreover, that fleet would have to be built from scratch. Vessels could not be brought from Lake Ontario because of Niagara Falls, and there were no existing facilities on Lake Erie for building warships. The entire American naval effort on Lake Erie would depend on conjuring a fleet out of the standing timber of the American forest. Worse, Talks with the local militia commanders convinced Elliot that there was no suitable place on the shores of Lake Erie where a squadron of American gunboats might be built. All of the potential harbors along the southern American coastline either were too shallow to accommodate a shipyard or, if they were deep enough, could not be defended from British raids. Still, he would have to set up shop someplace and the place he selected was the small frontier town of Black Rock on the American side of the Niagara River, a few miles north of Buffalo. Elliot was aware that the site had severe limitations. First of all, there was no hope of building an American fleet in secret there. The Niagara River was so narrow that not only could the British on the north bank watch his activities, but soldiers on the two sides could actually shoot at each other. Worse, the western exit from Niagara River into Lake Erie was commanded by a British fort, Fort Erie, on the northern shore. Even if Elliot managed to build his ships literally under the hostile eyes of his enemy, those vessels would be trapped in the Niagara River as long as the British commanded the exit. But the American militia general, Stephen Van Rensselaer, assured him that was not a problem, for he could remove that difficulty simply by taking possession of the British fort. Of course, this was before it had become evident that American militia might be unwilling to leave their state of origin. So Elliot got to work. Chauncey had ordered him to construct two 300-ton ships, which would make them the biggest warships on the lake. The Queen Charlotte, the largest of the British warships, displaced 255 tons, as well as six small gunboats. Getting started was relatively easy. He hired men to fell trees, strip them of their branches and bark, and begin sawing them into thick planks. But progress was slowed by a shortage of skilled carpenters, fitters, and joiners, and he lacked most of the materiel necessary to outfit a ship of war, including sails, rigging, blocks, anchors, cables, and, of course, guns, all of which had to be brought overland from the East Coast. Elliot chafed at the delays, 
and in October he planned an operation that would enable him to obtain the nucleus of an American squadron in one swift blow. That month, two British warships of the Canadian Provincial Marine dropped anchor off Fort Erie. They were the three-gun brig Caledonia and the 14-gun Detroit, formerly the U.S. brig Adams, captured at Detroit. At about the same time, Elliot learned that a number of American sailors, forwarded from Lake Ontario by Chauncey to serve as crew for Elliot's vessels, were only a day's march away. Elliot decided to use the new arrivals to surprise the two British ships and capture them. On the night of October 8th, he gathered about a hundred men in Buffalo Creek and embarked them onto two barges. Rowing across the mouth of the Niagara River in the darkest hours of the night, the Americans approached the two British vessels silently, then swiftly clambered up the sides of the two ships in a rush and captured them both. Locking the prisoners in the hold, Elliot ordered the anchor cables cut and raised the topsails, and within minutes, the two vessels were moving downriver toward the American base at Black Rock. But they were not moving very fast. The wind died to a flat calm, and British gunners on the northern bank of the river opened a constant and destructive fire with grape and canister. Elliot managed to get the smaller Caledonia to a safe anchorage under the American battery at Black Rock, but the larger Detroit proved unmanageable in a dead calm on a narrow river. After carrying on a running fight with British gunners for several hours and practically annihilating a boarding party of British soldiers that tried to retake the vessel, Elliot decided to abandon the Detroit, which by then had become a perfect wreck. This daring exploit was not a complete success, but it made Jesse Elliott a hero, the first American hero of the war in the Northwest, though Hull and Van Rensselaer provided little competition for such an accolade. Congress voted him a ceremonial sword, and a grateful Navy Department promoted him to Master Commandant over the heads of 22 other lieutenants who were senior to him. Elliot had gambled and won. He had weakened the British squadron on Lake Erie by capturing two of its five vessels and simultaneously strengthened the American squadron. Not incidentally, he had won honors and promotion for himself. Surely, it would not be long before he would be hailed again as the conqueror of Lake Erie. But Elliot was not the only naval officer dispatched to Lake Erie to build an American squadron. In early September, only days after Hamilton ordered Chauncey to take command on both of the western lakes, Daniel Dobbins showed up in Washington. Dobbins was a merchant ship captain who made a living bringing supplies to American outposts in the northwest. He and his vessel, the Salina, had been captured by the British when they seized the American outpost on Mackinac Island between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. In the 19th century, it was a fairly common practice to grant prisoners what was called parole, a system in which the captive pledged himself not to bear arms against the enemy that had captured him, unless by some arrangement both sides agreed to negotiate an exchange. Even if some prisoners occasionally defaulted on their parole, such a system avoided the expense and inconvenience of transporting, housing, and feeding large numbers of prisoners. So along with the rest of the American garrison at Mackinac, Dobbins was granted parole, and the British used Dobbins' vessel as a cartel to send the paroled American prisoners to Detroit. When Detroit fell in July, he was accused of having violated his parole, and he had to flee, hiding out in a schooner that was taking paroled prisoners to Cleveland. From there, Dobbins made his way along the lakeshore to Erie, then overland to Washington, where he arrived in early September bearing the news of Hull's capitulation. Secretary of the Navy Paul Hamilton grilled Dobbins about British strength on the lake. Dobbins reported that the British had four armed vessels, they actually had five, plus another eight small schooners and sloops that could be converted to military use. Galvanized by Dobbins' report, Hamilton fired off another letter to Chauncey, who had already left for Sackett's Harbor, telling him that while he was to build ships on both lakes, the effort on Lake Erie should now be considered paramount. At the same time, 
Hamilton appointed Dobbins a sailing master in the Navy and sent him back to the northwest frontier with orders to build four gunboats in Presque Isle Bay near Erie, Pennsylvania, about 90 miles west of Elliott's base at Black Rock. Elliott was not happy to hear of Dobbins' arrival. He made sure that Dobbins understood who was in charge and told him bluntly that Presque Isle was utterly unsuitable as a building site, for there was a shallow bar across the mouth of the bay that would make it all but impossible to get warships from the building site out into the lake. In part, Elliot's objections were genuine. He had considered Presque Isle as a base and rejected it. But in addition, he resented Hamilton's interference with his authority as the senior naval officer on Lake Erie. Elliot's peak never had a chance to blossom into open hostility, however, for in November, Chauncey's shipwrights at Sackett's Harbor on Lake Ontario completed and launched a 24-gun frigate that Chauncey named Madison after the president, and Chauncey picked Elliot to be her commander. Elliot thereupon quit his outpost at Black Rock and moved over to Lake Ontario. Technically, that left Dobbins in command of the American naval effort on Lake Erie. In the long run, this clearly would not do. Someone with higher rank than that of sailing master had to be found for such a crucial theater of war. Coincidentally, that same month, 27-year-old Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry applied to the Navy Department for active service. Pudgy and baby-faced, with dark curly hair and sideburns, Oliver Hazard Perry looked much too young to be a Master Commandant with 14 years of service in the United States Navy. Partly this was because he simply looked younger than he was, but partly, too, it was because Perry had started his naval career at a young age. His father, Christopher Raymond Perry, had been a successful privateer during the Revolutionary War, and by the time of the so-called Quasi War with France in 1798, the elder Perry was a post-captain, the highest rank then available in the U.S. Navy. Perry Sr. managed to get a midshipman's warrant for his 13-year-old son, and young Oliver served in that capacity on board his father's ship. After the war, the teenage Oliver stayed in the Navy and served in the Mediterranean, where he was one of a handful of junior officers who fought with distinction under Edward Preble during the Barbary Wars and came to be known as Preble's Boys. He made lieutenant at age 21 and commanded his own ship two years later. Since then, however, most of Perry's professional service had involved the more mundane service of constructing and maintaining coastal defense gunboats. Like most officers of his generation, Perry disliked gunboat service. Indeed, he disliked the whole idea of relying on gunboats for the nation's naval defense. Gunboats were small, usually 60 to 80 feet long, and lightly armed. Most carried only a single gun forward. Rigged with a single mast, they often had to be rowed from place to place, functioning more like floating artillery than actual warships. This was not the kind of service Perry had envisioned when he chose the Navy as a career. He petitioned the Secretary of War for command of the brig Argus, but when that was not forthcoming, he accepted the nomination for service on Lake Erie with great satisfaction. Though Perry got his orders to go to Lake Erie in the dead of winter, he started out at once, traveling overland from Newport to Albany, accompanied by his 13-year-old brother, Alexander, who had his own warrant as a midshipman, and a black family servant named Cyrus Tiffany. At Albany, Perry caught up with his commanding officer, Isaac Chauncey, and they traveled together up the Mohawk River Valley to Sackett's Harbor on Lake Ontario before Perry pressed on to Black Rock on the Niagara River. Perry's first look at Black Rock convinced him that its close proximity to British soil made it unsuitable for an American shipyard, and he directed that all useful materials there should be forwarded to Presque Isle. Then he was off again traveling the additional 75 miles further west to Presque Isle Bay, near the town of Erie, Pennsylvania, where Dobbins was constructing four gunboats, and where the naval contractor Noah Brown had started work on 22-gun brigs. 
Perry's trip from Black Rock to Erie illuminated the difficulties that he would encounter in trying to build a war fleet on the banks of a frontier lake. The few roads that existed were all but impassable, rutted and soggy with melting snow. He started out in a horse-drawn sleigh that was dragged over the thin sheet of ice along the southern shore of the lake. But the ice was untrustworthy in late March, and the horses occasionally broke through the crust. Eventually, he had to abandon the ice and trust to the sloppy roads ashore. Finally, on March 27th, his party arrived at Erie, and he got his first glimpse of the shipyard where he was to supervise the construction of an American fleet. Erie itself was a pleasant little town consisting of about 90 buildings clustered near Presque Isle Bay, which was formed by an arm of the land that reached out into the lake. That peninsula shielded an arrowhead-shaped body of water some two miles wide, extending nearly five miles into the forest to a picturesque waterfall whose cascade provided a constant musical backdrop. On its shores, the keels of two 20-gun brigs had been laid, the ribs of each vessel sticking up like the bones of a skeleton. Workers were in the process of nailing thick planks onto those ribs. But Noah Brown, the New York shipbuilder who had the government contract to build the brigs, was very nearly at the end of what he could do in this wilderness shipyard without iron fittings, cordage, sails, guns, or anchors. Nor did he have the carpenters, blacksmiths, joiners, and other experts necessary to complete the detail work on the two vessels. And finally, even if somehow all these obstacles could be overcome, there were no officers or sailors to man the ships if and when they were finished. All these elements necessary to success, the materials, the skilled workers, guns, officers, and a crew, would have to be found and brought to Erie along various routes at least as torturous as the one Perry had just traveled. Daunting as all that was, what astonished Perry most was that the site was completely unprotected. There were no fortifications to defend the bay from a British raid, and the only cannon at the site was an old iron boat howitzer that had been found on the beach and which locals used to celebrate the 4th of July. The only security force was provided by a half-dozen civilians who had been hired to watch the ships at night. An observer who arrived a few days after Perry noted in his diary that a sergeant's command might destroy the whole place in an hour. Perry tackled the security problem first. He sought out the local militia commander, David Meade, and begged him to call out his command. Meade did so, but only seven men responded. Eventually, Pennsylvania Governor Simon Snyder, in response to a plea from the Secretary of War, formed a provisional regiment of infantry, and soon nearly 800 armed men swarmed around the shipyard. They repaired the tumble-down blockhouse at the foot of the bay, and when some cannon finally arrived, they mounted them there. At times, the Pennsylvania militiamen must have seemed like dubious security. Like most militiamen, the soldiers considered themselves free agents, and they chafed at the imposition of any kind of discipline. Their elected officers felt the need to be friendly with the volunteers under their command, which made it all but impossible for them to give unwelcome orders. The officers and men played cards together, drank together, and engaged in foot races and wrestling matches. But at least there were now enough armed men around the shipyard to prevent it from being destroyed by a sergeant's command. Perry's next problem was finding the guns to arm his vessels once they were completed. Cannon could not be manufactured in the wilderness. They had to be brought from the east. Assuming that guns could be found at all, they would have to be dragged by brute force over abysmal forest roads or smuggled by boat across a lake that was regularly patrolled by the British. Dobbins managed to acquire two long 12-pounders in Black Rock, which he successfully transported to Erie in an old salt boat, sailing only at night and keeping close to the U.S. side of the lake. Perry himself traveled overland to Pittsburgh, where he secured four more guns, which had to be dragged by sledge overland. It was ruinous on the animals. 
One contemporary estimated that a total of 3,200 horses died over the winter hauling materials from Albany to Sackett's Harbor, to Buffalo, and finally to Erie. When Lieutenant Thomas Holdup arrived at Erie with two midshipmen and 40 sailors, Perry welcomed them effusively, then ordered Holdup back to Buffalo for guns, powder, and shot. In a few days, he returned with two more 32-pounders and, just as vital, some sails. Carronades, the heavy, short-barreled guns that made up the bulk of Perry's firepower, were forged in Georgetown, near Washington, D.C. Other pieces of ordnance were located, acquired, and either dragged along frontier roads or smuggled by boat into Presque Isle Bay. Meanwhile, construction work continued on the two brigs and four small gunboats at the shipyard. Each morning, teams of men went out into the forest to cut timber. Horses dragged the felled trees to the edge of the bay, where other teams cut them into planks. After that, it got more complicated, for besides Brown and Dobbins, there were few at Erie with the expertise necessary to turn a wooden shell into a living warship. On the very day he had arrived at Erie, Perry had sent an urgent dispatch to Philadelphia, begging for carpenters and blacksmiths. But it would take weeks for them to arrive, and he knew that as soon as the ice melted, the British squadron would try to blockade his shipyard and make it difficult, if not impossible, to get any more guns or supplies. He knew, too, that the British were hard at work constructing a big warship of their own at their base on the Detroit River. Whoever completed their new ships first, armed them, manned them, and got them into the lake would gain an enormous advantage. There was no time to worry about making the brigs into works of art with figureheads or scroll work. Perry insisted that good was good enough. Plain work was what was needed. The contractor, Noah Brown, put his finger on the key issue when he noted that the ships will be needed for one battle. If we win, that is all that is wanted of them. In May, Perry learned of a pending attack on Fort George, downriver from Niagara Falls on the Canadian side of the river. Eager for action, he left the construction work in the hands of the contractor and departed from Erie in a four-oared boat. Landing near Buffalo, he completed the journey by pony, his long legs nearly dragging on the ground as he rode. He took part in the successful attack on May 27th, then busied himself recruiting sailors for his Lake Erie squadron. Returning to Erie via Black Rock, he determined to bring the five gunboats still languishing there to join his squadron at Presque Isle. It took several days to work the small craft upriver through the rapids, but finally, in mid-June, the last vessel cleared the rapids and Perry set sail for Erie. It was a risky journey, for at any moment the British squadron might appear over the horizon and blast his little squadron of five boats into pieces. Only later did he find out how close it was. On one occasion, a man from shore watched the British squadron disappear over the horizon in one direction, just as Perry's little flotilla hove into sight from the other direction to anchor in the same spot. Only a thick haze prevented the British from spotting the vulnerable Americans. Combined with the four gunboats built in Presque Isle Bay, the five boats Perry brought from Black Rock gave the Americans a total of nine vessels for their Lake Erie fleet. Two of the nine gunboats, the small schooners Ohio and Amelia, were used as supply vessels and did not participate in the subsequent naval action. None of them, however, carried more than four guns, and most carried only one. The two brigs were the key to everything. Without them, the Americans could not contest the British for command of the lake. Thankfully, the carpenters and blacksmiths had finally arrived from Philadelphia, and they began to put the finishing touches on the two large hulls. Upon his return to Presque Isle, Perry was delighted to discover that both brigs were now afloat and that the riggers were busy aloft. At about the same time, he learned from a British deserter that the enemy's big ship would not be ready for at least a month it began to appear that he might win the shipbuilding race for the control of the lake. Even without their new ship, the British were becoming bolder. 
Beginning in mid-July, the British squadron began appearing almost daily off Presque Isle Bay. The enemy ships came close in toward the shore, as if about to execute a landing, or they exchanged fire with the small American gunboats that dropped down the harbor to meet them. Then they sailed off again over the horizon. Unable to take the sea, Perry could only watch and wonder when they might next appear. Perry had assumed a Commodore's privilege by giving names to the small schooners whose construction he had supervised. But the new Secretary of the Navy, William Jones, sent him names for the two brigs. One was to be named Niagara, and the other was to be the Lawrence, in honor of James Lawrence, who had been killed in a frigate duel off Boston on June 1st. In honor of the martyred Lawrence, Perry ordered all the flags of the squadron to half-mast, and directed that each man was to wear a strip of black crepe around his left arm, the arm nearest the heart. Soon thereafter, he ordered the preparation of a large black wool flag, bearing the last words of the dying Lawrence, Don't give up the ship. Of course, the problem of manpower still persisted. Perry sent letter after letter pleading for sailors, his frustration evident as he repeatedly expressed his mortification. He had fewer than 150 men with him at Erie, and he wrote Secretary Jones that he would need a minimum of 403 officers and men to fit out the vessels in his squadron. Jones replied that 500 men were on their way and should arrive shortly. But instead of 500, only 65 arrived, along with one lieutenant and three midshipmen. A week later, 53 more arrived, but the total was still less than a quarter of the promised 500. The source of the discrepancy was obvious. All of the men had been sent first to Sackett's Harbor, and Chauncey had kept most of them for his own squadron, forwarding only those he felt he could spare. As might have been expected, the few who arrived at Erie were not the pick of the litter. Perry complained to Chauncey that they were a motley set of blacks, soldiers, and boys. Chauncey was unapologetic. He said he would send more men as soon as the public service will allow me to send them from this lake. In other words, he would send them only after his own campaign on Lake Ontario had been decided. Indeed, far from apologizing, Chauncey charged Perry with bigotry, picking up on his reference to blacks, soldiers, and boys, and responding, I have yet to learn that the color of the skin or cut of the trimmings of the coat can affect a man's qualifications. I have nearly fifty blacks on board of this ship, and many of them are amongst my best men. Chauncey was deliberately changing the subject. Perry's complaint was not fundamentally racial. About 10 to 15 percent of the men he had brought with him from Rhode Island were black, roughly the same percentage of blacks in the U.S. Navy. Perry's complaint was not that Chauncey had sent him black sailors, but that he had forwarded the least experienced hands. Navies in the early 19th century, including both the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy, made very little distinction about either race or nationality when it came to recruiting crews. In consequence, both navies had black sailors who worked alongside white sailors. Moreover, because quarters were crowded aboard ship and because the nature of the work precluded segregated work teams, black and white sailors slept, ate, and worked together. There were, however, no black officers in the U.S. Navy until the Civil War. In fact, Chauncey's letter struck Perry as so judgmental and censorious that Perry read it as a calculated insult. In that age of tender sensibilities, even the most carefully worded criticism threatened an officer's public honor. After reading the letter several times, Perry decided that he could not serve under a man who could write such a letter, in every line of which there is an insult. He sent Secretary Jones his resignation, declaring, I cannot serve longer under an officer who has been so totally regardless of my feelings. Jones was new in the job, but he was used to this kind of touchiness, and he replied with a letter designed to both assuage Perry and remind him of his duty. The indulgence of such feelings must terminate in the most serious injury to the service, Jones wrote. It is the duty of an officer, 
to sacrifice all personal motives and feeling when in collision with the public good. Jones knew his man. Perry swallowed his anger and got about the business of doing the public good. If Chauncey would not send him the men he needed, he would simply have to find them elsewhere. Perry had handbills printed asking for volunteers and circulated them among the militia forces. Aware of how much his own success depended on Perry's, William Henry Harrison also gave Perry permission to recruit among the soldiers of his army, and even to draft soldiers who had sea experience, whether they volunteered or not, though Perry balked at this latter suggestion, since it sounded too much like impressment. In the end, some sixty militiamen volunteered to transfer to the Navy, and Perry convinced another sixty to sign up for a single cruise, expecting that the issue would very likely be resolved in a single cruise anyway. These volunteers gave Perry a total of just over three hundred men. He was still short-handed, but he calculated that he had just enough to man the vessels. The men might be inexperienced, but then much of the work aboard warships in the age of sail involved the application of human muscle, hauling on a rope, loosing or furling a sail, or levering a cannon around a deck. For those things, soldiers would do almost as well as sailors, as long as there was someone to tell them which rope to haul on. The soldiers hardly knew what they were getting into. As Richard Henry Dana wrote in his classic account, Two Years Before the Mast, there is not so helpless and pitiable an object in the world as a landsman beginning a sailor's life. Captain George Stockton of the Pennsylvania militia would have agreed. After a few days on board, he sent Perry a note stating that he had volunteered in good faith, but that his total ignorance of this service meant that he had come on board without the preparation necessary. Some of the soldiers, he wrote, were naked for clothes, no money to buy soap or any article of grocery. He wondered if it were consistent with my duty here, if he could return to camp for a few days to make provisions for the soldiers. Perry's success in finding the necessary manpower created yet another problem. He now had over 300 mouths to feed. A survey of the rations that had been forwarded from Pittsburgh showed that much of the bread supply was moldy and unfit for men to eat. The beef was putrid and covered with vermin. Of course, shipboard rations in the age of sail were notoriously bad, but Perry's squadron wasn't even at sea yet. Nevertheless, in late August, Perry had to reduce the bread ration to 12 ounces per day per man, and a week later, he decreed that every other day the men would receive raw flour instead of bread. All this must have made Captain Stockton wonder what he had gotten himself into. By the end of July, Perry had a virtually complete naval squadron of two 20-gun brigs, several small gunboats, and two supply schooners, all of which were at last afloat, armed, and manned, even if the manpower was largely inexperienced. The two brigs were the most powerful vessels on Lake Erie, or at least they would be if he could get them into the lake, for as yet they were still inside Presque Isle Bay. Back in the spring, when Dobbins had first set up shop there, Jesse Elliott had criticized the site because a shallow sandbar stretched across the mouth of the bay. While that barrier helped protect the shipyard from British raids, it also kept Perry ships trapped inside. Perry had been aware of this from the beginning, of course, and he had a plan to deal with it. He would float his ships across the bar by using what were called camels. These were specially built scows, or barges, deeply laden with ballast or filled with water. The filled barges were secured alongside the ship to be moved, then emptied out so that they acted like giant water wings, virtually lifting the vessel up and over the bar. In order to lighten the vessels as much as possible, however, it would be necessary to take the heavy guns off the ships first, if the British fleet showed up while the unarmed vessels were being floated over the bar, it could be disastrous. All through July, the British had appeared off Presque Isle Bay almost daily. They were there again on July 31st, though they sailed away that night 
and the next morning Perry directed his squadron down to the head of the bay to get ready for the tedious and labor-intensive process of crossing the bar. He positioned the small gunboats to guard the entrance, then set his men to work. One crew sounded and marked the deepest water, while others attached block and tackle to the big guns on the Lawrence, hoisted them over the side, and lowered them gingerly into small boats, which took them to the beach. The next day, the previously prepared camels were secured alongside the ship. Some 50 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 8 feet deep, the barges were about half the size of the brigs themselves. They each had square holes cut in the bottom and were virtually submerged, with only their gunwales showing. Sailors maneuvered them along each side of the Lawrence and then ran long, heavy beams through the sweet ports of the Lawrence to rest atop the thwarts of the scows. Once everything was in place, the sailors plugged the holes in the bottom of the camels and began pumping out the water. Slowly, inch by inch, the Lawrence rose out of the water. But not enough. The crew on the Lawrence gently coaxed it forward over the bar until halfway across it suddenly lurched to a stop, aground, in just over six feet of water. Somehow, more weight had to be removed. Working all night, the men hoisted out the rest of the ship's guns, took off the cables and anchors, and even lowered the spars and topgallant yards and sent them all to the beach. Then the entire process was repeated, this time with the support beams resting on large blocks of wood that were set atop the camels to give the brig more clearance over the shoal. Again, the Lawrence rose from the water. Foot by foot, it eased forward. Finally, just after dawn on August 4th, it came safely to anchor in deep water. The barges were submerged again, and the whole process was repeated with the Niagara. It went more quickly the second time. By 11 a.m., the Niagara, too, was across the bar. Just as Perry was beginning to breathe a bit easier, lookouts on the Lawrence called down that the British fleet was approaching. Five vessels led by the Queen Charlotte, were standing toward them with every sail set. The timing could hardly have been worse. The two American brigs were at last in deep water, but they were completely unprepared for battle. The Lawrence had most of its guns remounted on their carriages, but the Niagara's guns still lay useless on the beach. It was an extraordinary moment. All that Perry and others had worked so long and so hard to accomplish might be undone in a moment, simply due to bad luck. Still, it would be several hours before the enemy ships were within range, and Perry was determined to play the game out. He called upon the men to perform what one called the most uncommon and extraordinary exertions to return the guns to the Niagara and prepare it for action. The boats plied back and forth from the beach as men who had been up all night for two consecutive nights worked on pure adrenaline to restore the last of the guns, raise the topgallant mast and spars, and reset the rigging. Even if they succeeded, Perry knew that he did not have enough men on board to handle the guns in a fight. He appealed to the militiamen for help, and those who volunteered were rowed out to the brigs. One of Perry's officers, watching them take up positions on the deck of the Lawrence, suspected that until that moment, two-thirds of them had probably never seen water except in their own wells. Still, there was nothing to do but bluff it out. The bluff worked. Seeing the American fleet apparently over the bar and ready for a fight, the British did not press the issue. After exchanging a few long-range shots with the gunboats, they turned and sailed back up the lake. Having narrowly avoided disaster, Perry changed at once from prey to predator. Once the Niagara was fully restored to readiness, he resolved to pursue the English squadron and defeat it before it could be augmented. That night he wrote to Jones to explain his decision. I have great pleasure in informing you, he wrote in his bold flowing script, that I have succeeded after almost incredible labor and fatigue to the men, 
in getting all the vessels I have been able to man over the bar. They are neither well officered or manned. But as the emergency of General Harrison and the whole western country is such, I have determined to proceed on service. My government, should I be unsuccessful, I trust will justly appreciate the motives which have governed me in this determination. The next morning, he directed his ships toward Long Point, directly across the lake, where he suspected the British had gone. But after looking into the harbor there and seeing no enemy vessels, he concluded that they had returned to the safety of Fort Malden, near Amherstburg. Unwilling to try his untested cruise with such a challenge, he returned to the anchorage off Erie. At dinner that evening, which he ate on board the Lawrence with his purser, Samuel Hamilton, Perry confessed that he was not sure what to do next. He knew the country was watching and waiting for news, and that much was expected of him. He knew, too, that Harrison was waiting for support. But he feared that his undermanned and inexperienced crews would not be able to stand up to a pitched battle with the British. In Hamilton's words, he felt the danger of delay, but he is not insensible to the hazard of encountering an enemy without due preparation. Then, even as Perry talked, a midshipman entered the cabin to deliver a letter from Lieutenant Jesse Elliott, the hero of the Black Rock Affair and the former commander on Lake Erie. The letter announced Elliot's imminent arrival at the head of almost a hundred sailors from Lake Ontario. Chauncey had finally caved in to Perry's repeated pleas for manpower. Hamilton reported to his diary that Perry was electrified by the news, declared that he had not been so happy since his first arrival, that now he had a commander, just such a one as he wanted for the Niagara, he was at ease and would sail as soon as they arrived. The fleet sailed on August 12th. It was a harrowing experience for the militiamen, most of whom became deathly seasick at once and remained in that condition for the whole of the cruise. The first stop was the entrance to Sandusky Bay near the campsite of General William Henry Harrison's American Army. On August 19th, Harrison himself came on board the Lawrence, bringing with him a dozen officers and a handful of friendly Indians. The Indians were fascinated by Perry's big canoes, and especially by the heavy iron cannon, which fired a salute to Harrison. They were also impressed by the ship's spyglass, which brought the shore so much closer just by looking through it. Perry and Harrison had a valuable interview, the best part of which, from Perry's viewpoint, was Harrison's offer to send him another hundred volunteer soldiers to use as marines on board the ships of the squadron. With his ships now fully manned, Perry gave orders for the squadron to make sail for the British base at Amherstburg at the mouth of the Detroit River, where it would seek battle with the British for the command of Lake Erie. 130 miles due west of Erie, at the northwest corner of the lake, Fort Malden guarded the entrance to the Detroit River. That fort and the nearby town of Amherstburg had been the object of William Hull's disastrous campaign exactly one year before. Now, it was the base of Robert Barclay's small British squadron on Lake Erie. At 27, a year younger than Perry, Barclay bore the temporary rank of commander. But despite his age, Barclay had plenty of battle experience behind him. He had fought at Trafalgar as a teenage midshipman, and like his idol, Lord Nelson, he had lost his left arm in combat. In preparing his squadron for the confrontation with the Americans, Barclay had experienced virtually all of the same logistical and manpower problems that had plagued Perry. If anything, Barclay's difficulties had been greater. To begin with, Amherstburg was even more geographically isolated than Erie, and the roads, trails, really along the north shore of the lake, were virtually impassable, meaning that all communication with the rest of Canada depended on use of the lake. In addition, Barclay's superiors provided him with even less support than Perry got from Jones or Chauncey. A pair of modern scholars comment astutely that Barclay began his operations on Lake Erie not only without a left arm, but also with his right one figuratively tied behind his back. Still, 
Barclay was determined and energetic, and he vowed to do what he could. His command consisted of the 17-gun ship-rigged Queen Charlotte, the brig General Hunter, 10 guns, and the schooner Lady Prevost, 13 guns, plus a handful of smaller and mostly unarmed schooners and sloops. While this squadron was sufficient to command the lake in June, when Barclay arrived, he knew it would not be able to stand up to the two big American brigs once they were completed. His great hope was the Detroit. Named for the vessel captured by Elliot off Black Rock and destroyed in the ensuing fight, this was a 100-foot-long, 20-gun vessel, currently under construction at the Amherstburg shipyard. Designed as a ship with three masts, as opposed to Perry's Briggs, which had two, it was otherwise a virtual match for either the Lawrence or the Niagara. Technically, at 490 tons, it would be the largest warship on the lake, since Perry's Briggs displaced 480 tons each. Barclay felt that with the Detroit and the Queen Charlotte, he would have a good chance to match up with Perry's twin Briggs. But although the British had begun work on the Detroit in December 1812, before the Americans got serious about their two Briggs, progress was slow. In part, this was because, unlike Noah Brown, who encouraged plain work on the Lawrence and Niagara, the British contractor, William Bell, took perhaps too much pride in his careful craftsmanship. But in addition to that, the work lagged because the British in Amherstburg were even more destitute of supplies and materiel than the Americans at Erie. Manpower, too, was a bottleneck problem. If Perry was frustrated with Chauncey for sending him only about 260 sailors, Barclay got none at all from his theater commander, Sir James Yeo. Like Perry, Barclay recruited what men he could from the army, obtaining infantrymen from the British 41st Regiment and militiamen from the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. But he was less than enthusiastic about them. Unconsciously echoing Perry's complaint to Chauncey about blacks, soldiers, and boys, Barclay wrote Yo, I am sure, Sir James, if you saw my Canadians, you would condemn every one, with perhaps two or three exceptions, as a poor devil not worth his salt. Except for the 19 sailors he brought with him, Barclay had no experienced Navy men at all. And finally, he lacked both powder and shot, as well as cordage, sails, anchors, or even matches to fire the guns. Once at sea, the crews on some of his ships had to fire their cannon by shooting at the touch holes with pistols because the slow match was unusable. Barclay appealed for help, writing the Governor General, Sir George Prevost, that if prompt assistance is not sent up, the great superiority of the enemy may prove fatal. There was still hope, he insisted. The Detroit will soon be ready to launch, but there is neither a sufficient quantity of ordnance, ammunition, or any other stores, and not a man to put in her. Provost replied that he would encourage Yo to send whatever men he could, but he did not hold out much hope. You must be sensible of the impossibility in the present state of the country of supplying you with all the articles of which you stand in need. And he ended with an astonishing instruction. You must endeavor to obtain your ordnance and naval stores from the enemy. In other words, Provost expected Barclay to capture whatever supplies he needed from the Americans. In the end, Barclay managed to cobble together a mixed battery of 19 guns for the Detroit, including eight 9-pounders, six 12-pounders, two 18-pounders, and three 24-pounders, it had no 32-pounders at all, guns that constituted the main battery on both the Lawrence and the Niagara. Barclay's best hope was to keep the American squadron pinned up inside Presque Isle Bay until the Detroit was finished. During his reconnaissance in late July in the Queen Charlotte, he saw that the two American brigs were nearly complete, and he returned in the first week of August with his whole squadron to establish a blockade. But when he arrived on August 4th, the Americans were already over the bar and into the open lake, or so it appeared to him. 
Unaware that Perry's ships were woefully unready for a fight, Barclay decided that there was no reason to provoke a fight with the Detroit so near completion, so he turned his squadron around and headed back to Fort Malden. Barclay was now in a quandary with few good options available to him. The presence of a superior American squadron on the lake meant that the British could no longer use the lake to bring supplies or reinforcements to Amherstburg. By September, supplies in the fort and navy yard were already dwindling. Barclay had his own crews on half rations, and the circumstances were exacerbated by the presence of large numbers of Indian allies who encamped about the town and expected to be fed. If those expectations were not met, the Indians might easily change sides. Barclay's only chance was to regain naval superiority on the lake, which would allow the British once again to move supplies across its surface. As he expressed it later, he felt obliged to fight the enemy to enable us to get supplies and provisions. As soon as the Detroit was completed, assuming that he could find enough men to put in her, he would have to offer battle. When Perry set out for Fort Malden in late August, his goal was to establish a blockade of Amherstburg. Only a few days out, however, sickness broke out on board most of the ships in the American squadron. The surgeon's mate on the Lawrence, Usher Parsons, called it bilious remittent fever and attributed it to drinking the unhealthy water of Lake Erie. But whatever it was, it ran quickly through the squadron and struck Perry himself, who, for all his eagerness, had to confine himself to his cot. He gave orders for the squadron to find a safe anchorage at Put-in Bay, a well-known harbor near Bass Island, not quite halfway between Fort Malden and Long Point. He knew that as long as his squadron occupied Put-in Bay, the British could not use the lake route for their supplies. Eventually, Barclay would have to come out to drive the Americans away. On September 10th, he did. The early phases of a fleet engagement in the Age of Sail proceeded in a well-established pattern and with a certain pageantry. Upon sighting and identifying the foe, the opposing commanders first ordered their ships cleared for action. The order was signaled by a drummer who beat the long roll, a bass-voiced trilling that sent a shiver up the spine of every sailor who ever heard it. This produced a profound reaction throughout the ship as the hands scrambled to take their pre-assigned stations. The gunners gathered around their giant iron weapons, casting them loose from their bindings. The marines went aloft, their rifles slung over their shoulders as they carefully ascended the ratlines. Once positioned in the fighting top, they would use their shoulder arms to pick off officers or other targets of opportunity on the enemy's deck. Other Marines, including all the volunteer soldiers, took up positions on the more stable main deck. The most inexperienced men, and both squadrons had plenty of these, were assigned to carry the powder and shot to the guns from the magazine below or to assist in heaving the great guns into position, for although there were pulleys and ropes, known as block and tackle, to assist, any movement of the guns was done mainly by brute force. The officers took their stations too. The midshipmen and the lieutenants each commanded a section of guns, and it was their duty to ensure that all the men were in their places, that they had all the equipment necessary, including lit matches, and that once the fighting started, they stayed focused on their tasks. The ship's captain took a position on the quarterdeck near the helmsman, who was usually the quartermaster when at battle stations. Perry's 13-year-old brother, midshipman Alex Perry, also stayed on the quarterdeck since Perry planned to use him as a kind of aid to relay messages and orders. While the drums rolled and men pushed to their positions, there was a hurricane of action aboard the ship. Then, when everyone was in place, the officer of the deck often the captain himself, would shout, Silence about the deck! And the whole ship would suddenly become still. Only the creaking of the masts interrupted the artificial silence. Everything was now ready, and there was nothing more to do but wait for the enemy to come within range. In the relatively light airs on Lake Erie, Perry's squadron approached the British at an almost glacial pace, about three knots, 
During sea battles in the Age of Sail, there were moments of frantic activity, often followed by long periods when there was nothing to do but wait, watch the slow approach of the enemy, and contemplate one's own mortality. Aboard the Lawrence, a sailor named David Bunnell recalled that we neared the enemy very slowly, which gave us a little time for reflection. The men stood in awful impatience, not a word was spoken, not a sound heard, except now and then in order to trim a sail, and the boatswain's shrill whistle. To Bunnell, it seemed like the awful silence that precedes an earthquake. Another thought it was like the stillness of the atmosphere that precedes the hurricane. To break that silence and the tension, Perry stepped onto the top of a gun slide so that he could be seen. Holding up the flag he had prepared, he called out, My brave lads, this flag contains the last words of the brave Captain Lawrence. Shall I hoist it? It drew the desired response, and amidst the cheering, Perry had it run up to the masthead. Then, to make sure that the men didn't have to fight on an empty stomach, he ordered that the noontime bread and grog ration be distributed early. While the men ate and drank, he went round the ship to check on each gun and gun crew to see that everything was in order and to spread confidence. At each gun, he exchanged a few words with the gun captain, generally a senior enlisted man. Well, boys, he would remark, are you ready? And they would reply cheerfully, all ready, your honor. Finding one gun manned by veterans who had come with him all the way from gunboat service in Narragansett Bay, he exclaimed, Ah, here are the Newport boys. They will do their duty, I warrant. More privately, Perry consulted with his purser, Samuel Hamilton, asking him to take charge of his personal papers in the event of his death. The ship's official papers Perry placed in a canvas sack, adding a lead bar as a weight so that the package could be tossed overboard in the event of disaster. Perry also found a job for his African-American servant, Cyrus Tiffany. Handing him a musket and a bayonet, he told old Tiffany to go down to the berth deck and guard the passageway so that once the shooting started, skulkers could not find safe haven below the waterline. Both squadrons were sailing in the traditional line-ahead formation. In the American squadron, the small schooners Scorpion and Ariel led, followed by the Lawrence and Caledonia, with the Niagara and four more small vessels bringing up the rear. Perry passed orders by trumpet and followed them with a signal flag that read, Engage as you come up, everyone against his opponent in the line. As Perry envisioned it, he would take on the British flagship, the brand new Detroit, with his own vessel, leaving the Queen Charlotte to Elliot in the Niagara. Whatever happened in the fight between the smaller vessels, Perry knew that it was the duel between the two big ships on each side that would decide the outcome. At fifteen minutes before noon, with the opposing squadrons about a mile apart, Barclay opened the action by firing a shot from one of the long 24-pounders on the Detroit. The shot fell short, and Perry did not bother to reply. Most of his guns were stubby 32-pounder carronades that fired a huge iron ball but had a relatively short range. He believed it was crucial to get as close as possible as quickly as he could. Carrying mainsail, topsail, and topgallant sails, Perry sailed boldly toward the enemy line, signaling to the other vessels to do the same. For a quarter of an hour, as the American fleet closed on the British line, the men on the Lawrence simply had to take the fire of the British long guns without any real opportunity to reply except with their single 12-pound long gun. The three lead ships in the American line of battle, Scorpion, Ariel, and Lawrence, all closed with the British. The fourth ship, the Caledonia, was slow and soon fell behind. Elliot, in the Niagara, kept his own vessel in line behind it, and as a result, the five trailing ships in the American squadron did not come up as quickly. Just as Hood's division in the Battle of the Capes failed to come up to support Graves, so now did Elliot remain in the line of battle well beyond effective range. In fact, because of the range, Elliot ordered his carronades to cease firing and employed only his single long gun. That created an opportunity for Captain Robert Finnis on the Queen Charlotte. 
Seeing that the Niagara was staying out of range, Finnis brought his ship up just behind the Detroit to join her in pounding Perry's Lawrence. Now the battle became a slugfest between the Lawrence and the two British big ships. Men on both sides loaded and fired as fast as possible. The recoil of each shot sent the guns leaping backward to jerk against the restraint of the gun tackle. Then the gun crews swarmed over their weapons, sponging out the burning embers of the last round, jamming a sack of pre-measured black powder into the muzzle and rolling a 32-pound iron ball in after it. If wadding was available, they added that to hold the ball in place. All of this was then rammed home down the muzzle of the gun. Then the gun had to be run out, which simply meant that the men of the gun crew had to lay hold of the ropes and haul away until the muzzle pointed out the gun port. A long pin, or wire called a vent pick, was inserted down through the vent on the top of the breech to prick the bag of powder in the gun barrel, and a quill primer, a kind of narrow straw filled with fine grain powder, was inserted into the vent. The gun captain trained the gun on the target, peering down the length of the barrel, essentially aiming by sight line. Then he stood aside as a slow match was touched down on the powder. A flash from the priming powder was followed almost instantly by the explosion of the powder in the barrel, and the gun leaped backward again to restart the process. It was exhausting work. It was also dangerous. Though Perry's Lawrence was supported by the Ariel, four guns, and Caledonia, two guns, it was taking a fearful beating from the two British big ships. At such close range, the slaughter was fearful. The dead were moved aside to be out of the way. The wounded were assisted below decks to the wardroom, which surgeon's mate Parsons was using as a hospital. Almost at once, there was confusion at the main hatch, as those assisting the wounded below were stopped by a defiant Cyrus Tiffany, brandishing his bayoneted musket. Only Perry's personal intercession convinced Tiffany to let the wounded go below and receive treatment. Even then, there was little safety in the surgeon's cockpit. Not only did the wounded have to suffer the ministrations of 19th century medicine, but the Lawrence's shallow draft meant that Parsons had to do his work above the waterline. So even as he worked to splint fractures or tie off arteries, cannonballs occasionally came crashing through his work area. Parsons had just applied a splint to midshipman Harry Laub when a ball punched through the bulwark, struck the midshipman full in the chest, and dashed him against the other side of the room, which instantly terminated his sufferings. Above, on the gun deck, the battle continued in full fury. David Bunnell, who moments before had stood in awful impatience, now watched as a cannonball smashed through the bulwarks and cut both legs off the man who was standing next to him. Only minutes later, another cannonball struck another member of his gun crew in the head, covering Bunnell with brains and causing him to wonder momentarily if they were his own. One shot struck fair on the muzzle of a gun, sending bits of iron flying in all directions. Bunnell recalled that one man was filled full of little pieces of cast iron from his knees to his chin. Even more fearful than the cannonballs themselves were the giant splinters, some of them several feet in length, ripped from the ship's hull and sent flying across the deck. Then there was grape, clusters of nine iron balls, roughly the size of golf balls, that were fired at close range like giant buckshot. As a counterpoint to these terrors, one shot struck the hammocks on the Lawrence and exploded a mattress, which caused feathers to drift down on the perspiring men like snow. Another shot smashed the cooking pot and sent green peas rolling about on the deck. The terrible and the mundane combined to present the ghastly image of one of the ship's pigs, with both of its rear legs shot off, dragging itself across the deck to gobble down the spilled peas. Though land warfare had its own terrors, the confined space of a ship of war focuses the violence of combat. With no possible avenue of escape, with the guns firing every few minutes, and with missiles of all kinds flying across the deck, time itself lost meaning. Within an hour, five of the eight men assigned to Bunnell's gun were down, killed or wounded. To keep the guns in action, 
the officers stepped forward and joined the gun crews, straining against the ropes and lifting in the cannonballs like ordinary seamen. After two hours, the fire from the Lawrence began to slacken. Some twenty men were dead, and more than three dozen were wounded. Out of a crew of one hundred and fifty, many of whom still suffered the effects of bilious fever, more than half the ship's complement was out of action. Most of the guns had been put out of action, too. Their carriages shattered, or the guns themselves dismounted. There weren't enough able-bodied men left to work the few guns that still functioned. There were no men to bring powder and shot up from the magazines. Desperate for ammunition, the survivors of Bunnell's gun crew fired a crowbar and a brass swivel gun from their cannon. It was the sailing master on the Lawrence, William Taylor, who first asked the question that many may have been thinking, where was the Niagara? The vessel had not only dropped further astern, but was moving inexorably to windward, passing by on the unengaged side and thus putting the Lawrence between itself and the enemy. Lieutenant Delaney Forrest pointed this out to Perry. That brig will not help us. See how that fellow keeps off? He will not come to close action. Looking about his own ship and glancing over at the Niagara, Perry contemplated his circumstances. Though he did not know the precise numbers, he could see that over half his crew was killed or wounded. Indeed, he and his brother Alex were the only officers still unscathed. Taylor described the scene in a letter to his wife. Every gun was dismounted, gun carriages knocked to pieces, every strand of rigging cut off, masts and spars shot and tottering overhead, and in just an unmanageable wreck. It was obvious that the Lawrence was no longer capable of offering resistance, much less defeating the enemy. Whatever firepower remained in the American squadron existed in the still undamaged Niagara. Perry came to a decision. From his station on the gun deck, Bunnell heard him call out, Man the boat! And a small party of the able body did so, bringing a small boat alongside. Perry ordered a sailor to haul down the black flag with Lawrence's dying words stitched on it, though the American flag continued to fly from both the foremast and the spanker gaff. Perry then met quietly with Lieutenant John Yarnall, whose face was covered with blood from a head wound, and told him to take command of the ship, but telling him also not to sacrifice lives unnecessarily. Then Perry took his flag down into the boat and ordered the men to shove off. It took 15 minutes to row the half-mile from the Lawrence to the Niagara. The small boat immediately became the target of every gun in the British fleet that could bear on it, and shot splashes erupted nearby, though none hit. Tradition has it that Perry stood during the trip, just as George Washington is supposed to have stood during the crossing of the Delaware. And contemporary evidence suggests that in that age of the grand gesture, he did indeed begin the trip standing. But the four rowers soon begged him to sit, for both his own safety and theirs, and after that Perry sat prudently in the stern sheets. Finally, the boat bumped alongside the Niagara, and Perry scrambled up the side. There he was met by Captain Elliot. Elliot's first words were to ask how the day was going, as if he were some kind of neutral observer. Perry might have responded sharply to such a question, but instead he replied simply that it was going badly. Almost as if to punctuate that remark, the sound of cheering drew the attention of both men, who saw that the Lawrence had struck its flag, and the British were cheering their victory. Perry then asked Elliot why the gunboats were so far astern. Elliot said he did not know, but he volunteered to find out and bring them into the fight. No doubt happy to see him go, Perry gave his permission, and Elliot, like Perry, left his own ship in a small boat to go round up the strays. According to Alexander Slidell Mackenzie, Perry's first order on the Niagara was to back the main topsail, brail up the main trysail, put the helm up, and bear down before the wind with squared yards for the enemy. In layman's terms, he turned the ship to starboard and sailed directly at the British squadron. On board the Detroit, Barclay was still savoring his hard-fought victory over the Lawrence, which had come at a terrible cost, when he spied this new threat bearing down on him. 
because his own ship was nearly as damaged as the Lawrence, his port battery virtually wrecked. He tried to wear ship so that he could present his starboard broadside to the charging Niagara. But his maneuver was too complicated for a badly damaged ship and an exhausted crew. Moreover, it completely confused the Queen Charlotte, which was close astern. The Charlotte had lost both its captain, Robert Finnis, and its first lieutenant, Thomas Stocko, leaving it in command of a provisional Canadian lieutenant named Robert Irvine. As Barclay later expressed it, Irvine's experience was much too limited to supply the place of such an officer as Finnis, and the combination of Barclay's maneuver and Irvine's inexperience soon resulted in the two British ships becoming tangled up with each other. Into the midst of this self-inflicted confusion came Perry in the Niagara. After two and a half hours of being pounded, he was about to turn the tables. Passing through the British line of battle, the Niagara fired its first full broadsides of the battle in both directions. They were devastating. The starboard broadside swept the length of the two British vessels that had become tangled together. Barclay, who had been wounded earlier in the fight with the Lawrence, received a second wound and had to be carried below. His first lieutenant, John Garland, was mortally wounded. Dozens of others fell as well. The Niagara's port broadside smashed into the Lady Provost, doing similar execution there. Perry's bold maneuver had completely reversed the tide of battle. Already weakened by the long battle with the Lawrence, the British were staggered by this new assault. Within minutes, both of the British big ships struck their flags, the Queen Charlotte first, then the Detroit. Two of the smaller ships struck as well. Two others tried to escape, but they were chased down by the American gunboats and captured. In less than 15 minutes, Perry had completely reversed the battle and turned defeat into victory. The butcher's bill was sobering. Some 123 Americans had been killed or wounded, 21% of Perry's total complement of the nine ships. On Perry's Lawrence, the losses were particularly horrific. Out of just over 150 men on board the Lawrence, 83 of them were on the casualty list, a loss rate of 55%. Of the 96 American casualties on board the Lawrence, 37 suffered from splinter wounds, 25 from compound fractures, and 10 from contusions. Surgeon's mate Parsons performed six amputations on board. None of the six survived. In the days of the Roman legions, when a unit lost 10% of its force, it was said to be decimated. The Romans didn't even have a word for losing 55%. British losses were worse. A total of 134 were killed or wounded out of a smaller complement of men, a loss rate of 30%. On five of the six British vessels, both the captain and the first officer were killed or wounded. Ironically, Jesse Elliott was the first American officer to board the surrendered Detroit after the battle. Rowed over from the small gunboat Somers, he climbed up the side of the British flagship and at once slipped and fell in the gore that covered the deck, smearing his uniform coat with blood. The first sight that met his eyes was a surreal one. Barclay had brought a black bear on board the Detroit as a mascot, and now, in the aftermath of battle, the bear was wandering about the deck, lapping up the blood. Elliot found the wounded Barclay below, where Barclay offered Elliot his sword. Elliot refused it, knowing that the honor belonged to Perry. But he did take the Detroit's flag and carry it with him over to the Niagara. Perry's first reaction on seeing the blood-covered Elliot climb onto the deck of the Niagara was to ask him if he was badly wounded. Assured that he was not, Perry was so euphoric due to the sudden reversal of fortune that he greeted Elliot enthusiastically, thanking him for the important part he had played in the victory. Others listening nearby wondered at the warmness of Perry's welcome and may have exchanged covert glances. The end of the battle did not mark the end of labor. The wounded, both friend and foe, had to be cared for, and the battered vessels had to be made secure and seaworthy. And, of course, General Harrison must be told. The whole point of the battle, after all, was to regain control of Lake Erie, 
so that with logistical support restored, Harrison's army could take the offensive against the British and their Indian allies. Perry had promised Harrison that he would dispatch and express to you the moment the issue of our contest with the enemy is known. Now, therefore, he used the back of an old envelope to write a quick note to Harrison. Dear General, we have met the enemy, and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. Yours, with great respect and esteem, O. H. Perry. Later, Perry would write a longer official report for the Secretary of the Navy. He took some time in preparing it, and no doubt he expected that his official report would be printed in the papers and be widely read. It never occurred to him that it was the short note to Harrison that would become immortal. In a carefully scripted naval minuet that was centuries old, the officers of each surrendered vessel came on board to offer their swords in token of formal surrender. With Elliot back on board the Niagara, Perry returned to the battered Lawrence to conduct this ceremony. Following the prescribed protocol, the British officers each offered their compliments to Perry on his victory, then tendered their swords to him hilt first. Perry fulfilled his part of the prescribed code, remarking in each case that the officer should keep his sword, since he had distinguished it by making so gallant a defense. Another tradition of the sea was that in his formal report, the commanding officer should name all those who had performed well during the battle. Being named in dispatches not only confirmed one's public honor, but was the surest and swiftest path to promotion. Just as he had refused all the tendered swords, so too was Perry suitably generous in his report. Those officers and men who were immediately under my observation evinced the greatest gallantry, he wrote, and he mentioned several by name, including Yarnall, Forrest, and Taylor. But what to do about Elliot? In the description of the battle, Perry finessed the role played, or not played, by the Niagara. At half-past two, the wind springing up, Captain Elliot was enabled to bring his vessel, the Niagara, gallantly into close action. Of course, the report having already mentioned that the battle had begun at noon, it was clear that between noon and half-past two, the Niagara was somewhere other than in close action. Perry also wrote that when he went personally on board the Niagara, that ship was very little injured. Any veteran of naval combat would be able to read between the lines. But then Perry included this. Of Captain Elliot, already so well known to the government, it would almost be superfluous to speak. In this action, he evinced his characteristic bravery and judgment, and, since the close of the action, has given me the most able and essential assistance. Thus did Perry hope to avoid any unpleasantness about the role that Elliot had chosen to play in the battle. Meanwhile, there was a war to fight. Within a week, Perry began to transfer Harrison's army first to South Bass Island, then to Middle Sister Island, and finally to Fort Malden, which the British abandoned as soon as they learned of Perry's victory. Perry then accompanied Harrison's army during its pursuit of the retreating British, as he was a spectator and volunteer aide to Harrison at the Battle of the Thames, October 5, 1813, which shattered what remained of the British army in Upper Canada. In that same battle, Tecumseh himself was killed, and with him died the dream of a great Western Indian Confederation. After the battle, the commander of the Kentucky militia, Colonel Richard Johnson, claimed that he had personally killed Tecumseh, and the fame he gained as a result helped make him presidential candidate Martin Van Buren's running mate in 1836. The losing presidential candidate that year was Johnson's commander at the Battle of the Thames, William Henry Harrison, who turned the tables on Van Buren four years later and became president in 1841. Perry's triumph was complete, but there was a bitter epilogue. In the immediate aftermath of the fight, Perry believed that Elliot lamented his behavior during the battle. Perry later claimed that Elliot admitted to him that he had missed the fairest opportunity of distinguishing himself that ever man had. If it was not quite an apology, Perry took it as one. Because the end result had proved so positive, 
he chose to overlook Eliot's performance during the battle. When Eliot wrote to ask him to comment in candor on Eliot's role in the battle, Perry responded generously, It affords me great pleasure that I have it in my power to assure you that the conduct of yourself, officers, and crew was such as to meet my warmest approbation. Eliot promptly saw to it that Perry's letter was published. Of course, whatever Perry might say officially, everyone in the fleet had witnessed the conduct of the Niagara under Eliot's command. Even while the battle was being fought, the men on the Lawrence were muttering about it to themselves and to each other. Wounded men brought down into the cockpit of the Lawrence complained bitterly, even as the surgeon bound their wounds, that the Niagara was deliberately staying out of the battle, leaving the Lawrence to bear the full burden of the fight unsupported. Afterward, talk inevitably spread, first inside the fleet, and then in the towns and forts ringing the lake, and eventually in the public press. Perry told his friends to stop it, he believed that public controversy would sully the American victory. Honor enough has been gained, he insisted. And perhaps the controversy would have died in whispered rumors if Eliot himself had not insisted on bringing it up. Eliot heard the continued mutterings and found them intolerable. Having once been the hero of Lake Erie himself, he could not bear that this sobriquet was now being applied to Perry and that in practically the same breath his own conduct was found wanting. His reaction was to become defensive and to blame the rumors on Perry's refusal to give him the credit he deserved. He was angered further when Congress promoted Perry to captain with his commission backdated to September 10, 1813, while Elliot's reward was merely to assume command of the squadron on Lake Erie, where, of course, there was no longer an enemy for him to fight. One factor in Eliot's resentment may have been that while Eliot himself had started his career late and scratched his way to official notice, Perry, the captain's son, had benefited from family influence. Eventually, Eliot came to believe that he should get at least equal credit for the victory, and he argued, selfishly, that the officers and men of the Lawrence should not share in the prize money, because after all, the Lawrence had struck its flag. On at least one occasion... Eliot went so far as to declare that it would have been better if the British had won, just to prove that Perry did not deserve the victory. Lieutenant William B. Shubrick warned Eliot in a friendly way that Perry held Eliot's reputation in his hands, and the least you and your friends can say, the better for you. It was good advice, but it elicited the opposite reaction. Instead of remaining quiet and being grateful for Perry's restraint, Eliot wrote Perry a challenging letter. The wrongs I have suffered are many, Eliot wrote, thus setting a tone of wounded victim. I am at a loss to know how it was possible you could have made such representations. Eliot all but ordered Perry to stop making base, false, and malicious reports, especially in the society of the ladies or that of young Navy officers. It was now clear to Perry that since Eliot was going to make the issue public anyway, it was time to have it out. He prepared 11 specific charges against Eliot and submitted them to the Navy Secretary for a court-martial. He also wrote to Eliot to inform him of the charges, addressing him in language that seemed calculated to provoke a duel, calling Eliot impudent as well as base, and referring to his unmanly conduct during the battle. Stung by Perry's letter, Eliot did challenge Perry to a duel but Perry scornfully rejected it because, he said, Eliot was no gentleman. It never came to a duel nor to a court-martial. James Monroe, who succeeded Madison in the White House, wanted no airing of the Navy's dirty laundry at such a time, and the court-martial charges were simply filed away without action. The feud between Perry and Eliot became an issue for historians as well. Two of the most distinguished of America's naval historians, James Fenimore Cooper and Alfred Thayer Mahan, took opposite sides. Writing 30 years after the battle, Cooper took Eliot's side, arguing that Perry's orders compelled Eliot to hold his position in the line of battle and insisting that Eliot's arrival with the trailing gunboats was as important to the eventual American victory as Perry's breaking the British line. 
Mahan drew exactly the opposite conclusion, pointing out that Perry's orders required every captain to follow the movements of the Lawrence, which Elliot failed to do, and noting that Perry had used Nelson's phrasing at Trafalgar in declaring that no captain could do very wrong if he placed his ship alongside that of the enemy, which Elliot also failed to do. On balance, Mahan makes the more convincing argument. The bickering over the prize money continued a while longer. Eventually, Congress approved the sum of $260,000, which was divided up in the traditional way, with the greatest portions going to those at the top. Congress appropriated $255,000 in general prize money, plus an additional $5,000 for Perry. Accordingly, the largest amount went to the overall theater commander, Isaac Chauncey, at Sackett's Harbor, who never came within 200 miles of the battle, but who nevertheless got $12,750. Perry and Elliot got $7,140 each. The other officers throughout the fleet each received between $1,214 and $2,295, and the individual sailors, including the militia volunteers, got $214.89, paltry by comparison, but a substantial sum in 1818. After the war was over, Perry got command of a frigate, the brand-new 44-gun Java, named in honor of Old Ironside's second great victory, and he took her on a Mediterranean cruise in 1816 through 1817. Two years later, during a diplomatic expedition up the Orinoco River in Venezuela, he caught yellow fever, and after battling the disease for a week, he died on his 34th birthday. Perry's youngest brother, Alex, who had survived the battle on Lake Erie unscathed, died three years later at the age of 22, while trying to save the life of a drowning sailor. Elliot lived for another quarter century, but he remained a stormy petrel. In 1820, he played a key role in provoking a duel between James Barron of the Chesapeake Leopard Affair and Stephen Decatur, who had supported Perry in the feud with Elliot. The origin of the duel was a stupid quarrel that probably would have been settled amicably, but for Elliot's poisonous influence. As it was, both men fell wounded, Decatur mortally so. Perry and Decatur were the two most distinguished public heroes of the War of 1812, and Decatur's death only one year after Perry's left a great void in Navy leadership. As for Elliot, he disgracefully fled the scene of the duel rather than stay by the wounded baron. In spite of that, Elliot was later promoted to captain, and eventually he commanded both the West Indies Squadron, 1829 through 1832, and the Mediterranean Squadron, 1835 through 1838. The Treaty of Ghent, which brought an end to the war in 1815, essentially restored the status quo between the United States and Britain without resolving most of the issues that had led to war in the first place. The British continued to insist that they had the right to impress British-born sailors from American ships at sea, although since the war in Europe had ended with Napoleon's defeat, they gave up the practice of doing so. Likewise, the British did not accept America's broad definition of neutral rights— but once again, the return of peace to Europe meant that America no longer occupied its precarious neutrality, making the issue moot. On one issue, however, there was a clear resolution. Perry's victory on Lake Erie, which made possible Harrison's victory at the Battle of the Thames, convinced the British to drop their demand for an independent Indian federation in the Northwest. The way was clear for the westward expansion of the United States. Eighty years after the Battle of Lake Erie, a young American historian named Frederick Jackson Turner presented a paper at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, in which he argued that the presence of a proximate frontier played a decisive role in defining America's culture, values, and character. Although Turner had, and still has, his critics, it is self-evident that the conquest, settlement, and defense of the frontier were critical in American history. But the mastery of the frontier was due not only to pioneers in buckskin or stalwart settlers carving farms out of the wilderness. 
it was possible in the first place because of the victory of Oliver Hazard Perry's small naval squadron over its British counterpart on September 10, 1813. With only 15 vessels involved, most of them small gunboats, it was not a large engagement, but it had enormous strategic significance. An entire British squadron was captured intact. The command of Lake Erie shifted in one day, indeed, in a single maneuver from Britain to America. And when it did, the momentum in the war for the Northwest changed as well. For the United States, the Battle of Lake Erie was a Lilliputian Trafalgar fought on fresh water, with consequences every bit as profound for America's future as Trafalgar was for Britain's survival. Perry's victory secured the northwestern frontier for the United States. Moreover, the Battle of Lake Erie marked the pinnacle, for Americans at least, of a type of naval warfare that had been evolving for most of two centuries. Perry won the Battle of Lake Erie with wooden-hulled, square-rigged sailing vessels that would have been familiar to Sir Francis Drake or even Christopher Columbus. Perry and his men maneuvered their craft by manipulating a complex network of lines and sails, and they fought by working smooth-bore, muzzle-loading iron guns that had to be manhandled about the deck by brute force. The men who served them required relatively little expertise. Both Perry and Barclay fought with almost as many soldiers as sailors on board their vessels, yet their men fought valiantly and stubbornly. For their part, the officers adhered to a professional culture that was centuries old and which was dominated by a code of behavior in which public honor was at least as important as private conduct. And yet, in terms of both technology and culture, the Battle of Lake Erie was a template of naval combat that was already passing. Six years earlier, Robert Fulton had successfully tested a steam-powered vessel on the Hudson River. Part 2. Iron, Steam, and National Union The Battle of Hampton Roads, March 8th and 9th, 1862 If the mastery of the frontier was the nation's first great challenge, the second, and arguably its most traumatic, was the need to resolve the question of its own character as a democratic republic. Westward expansion eventually forced the nation's leaders to confront the question of whether slavery, too, should be allowed to expand. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 had banned slavery from the territory that was later secured by Perry's victory in 1813, and consequently both Indiana, 1816, and Illinois, 1818, came into the Union as free states. But both Mississippi, 1817, and Alabama, 1819, entered as slave states. In 1819, the year Perry died of yellow fever, the territory of Missouri applied for admission. Since there were already several thousand black slaves working the rich bottomlands of the Missouri River, it naturally sought admission as a slave state. During the congressional debate, however, Representative James Talmadge of New York rose to offer an amendment that would make slavery illegal in Missouri as a condition of its admission. Southerners were first horrified, then outraged. Despite the small number of slaves in Missouri, the stakes were enormous because the passage of Talmadge's amendment would establish the precedent that Congress could restrict the growth of slavery in the American West. The abolition of slavery was never the central issue in this dispute. Rather, what split the country in half was an argument over the expansion of slavery into the West. If slavery could not expand, Southerners believed, it could not survive. Without new lands to bring under cultivation, the natural increase of the slave population would eventually create a society where there were more slaves than there was work for them to do. The price of slaves would plummet. Their idleness would provoke an intolerable social crisis. The South, therefore, insisted that slavery must be allowed to spread, first into the western territories beyond the Mississippi River, and eventually southward as well, as the United States acquired part of Mexico and some of the islands of the Caribbean. 
A majority in the North insisted just as strongly that slavery should be restricted to the states where it already existed. Over the next four decades, this argument was marked by occasional agreements and compromises, one of which allowed Missouri to become a slave state in 1821. But it was never resolved. Worse, from the Southern point of view, the growth of Northern political power seemed to foreshadow a time when the South would be unable to control or even influence the debate. In 1812, the war hawks of the South and West had held the balance of political power in America. But by mid-century, that power had shifted to the North and the Northwest. When, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president without a single vote from the Deep South, on a platform of preventing slavery from expanding at all, Southerners could read the writing on the wall. Without waiting to see what policies this new president might adopt, seven Southern states took the extraordinary step of seceding from the Union to form their own confederation. The ensuing civil war changed the nation. In part, this was due to the triumph of Lincoln's vision of permanent union over the Southern concept of state sovereignty. But in part two, it was a product of the war itself. Each side fielded armies of up to 100,000 men, more than 30 times larger than Harrison's army at the Battle of the Thames, and those armies had to be organized, transported, supplied, and fed. Before the war was over, more than three and a half million men would serve in uniform on one side or the other. Meeting the demands of such a large-scale war required the full capacity of a unified nation with a complex and integrated bureaucracy. Whatever its theoretical commitment to state sovereignty, the Confederacy, as well as the Union, had to deal with this reality, and both sides did so by imposing conscription and martial law on the states. It is one of the many ironies of history that the South's decision to secede and fight a war of independence generated far more sweeping changes in Southern society and culture and was far more destructive of state rights than would have been the case if Southerners had simply acquiesced to Lincoln's election. Eventual Union success in the Civil War was due primarily to the sacrifices of the soldiers on the ground who bore the brunt of battle and gave their lives profligately in the conviction that the Union was worth dying for, as well as to the administration that sustained them through four years of war. But the Union war effort was aided significantly by Northern naval superiority, which was nowhere showcased more poignantly than in the timely arrival in Hampton Roads, Virginia, of the USS Monitor on the night of March 8, 1862, literally, in the nick of time to neutralize the offensive potential of the Confederate ironclad Virginia. The dark, squat object that crept menacingly out of the Elizabeth River early on the morning of March 8, 1862, looked nothing at all like the elegant vessels of Perry's or Barclay's squadrons on Lake Erie. For one thing, the Confederate States' ship Virginia boasted no masts or spars, nor sails of any kind. The black smoke emerging from its single stack amidships marked it as a steam-powered vessel. Somewhere, deep inside that dark hull, coal-fed fires transformed water into steam, which drove pistons that turned a crankshaft attached to a 17-foot bronze propeller. The only visible evidence of all this internal activity, besides the black smoke, was the roiling brown water astern a V-shaped wake that spread slowly across the placid surface of the roadstead. To add to the menacing, even sinister aspect of this grotesque craft, its entire superstructure was coated with iron plate, four inches of it, bolted on top of nearly two feet of oak and pine, the rounded heads of the bolts giving its skin a knobby appearance. For all that, the most ominous aspect of this odd craft was that not a single human figure was in sight. No sailor clung to the absent rigging. No officer walked its weather deck. If there were men, stripped to the waist, hunching over its guns and ready for combat, they were not visible from the outside. Indeed, to those observing it for the first time, including more than 250 U.S. Navy officers and men who would perish at its hands that day, 
This object seemed hardly a vessel at all, and as if in testimony to that, the quartermaster on one of the Union warships in the roadstead announced its appearance by declaring, That thing is a coming down. One Union officer likened it to a creature. The water hisses and boils with indignation, as like some huge, slimy reptile she slowly emerges from her loathsome lair. But to most of the hundreds of observers watching from the shoreline, this smoke-belching, iron-plated thing was neither vessel nor creature, but a machine, a giant, self-propelled, armored engine of war. Inside that engine of war, directing its movements, was 61-year-old Franklin Buchanan, who had been a naval officer for most of his life. Buchanan had joined the Navy in the last days of the War of 1812, and his first sea service had been as a midshipman on board the frigate Java, where his commanding officer and first role model had been Oliver Hazard Perry. By 1862, Buchanan had accumulated nearly 50 years of active naval service, including a role as the founding superintendent of the Naval Academy at Annapolis, where the superintendent's house is named for him, and a tour as the flag captain under Matthew C. Perry, Oliver's brother, during that officer's mission to open Japan to Western trade in 1853 through 1854. As a Marylander, Buchanan had been horrified by the outbreak of hostilities, and he had resigned his commission in the conviction that his own state would soon secede and join the Confederacy. But Maryland did not secede, and almost at once Buchanan regretted his decision. Somewhat sheepishly, he tried to recall his resignation. The Union Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, would have none of it, and responded curtly, By direction of the President, your name has been stricken from the rolls of the Navy. Angry at such cavalier treatment, as he saw it, Buchanan retired to his country estate on Maryland's eastern shore, where he nursed his anger and disappointment for two more months, growing more truculent by the day at what he considered the Lincoln administration's high-handed behavior. In the end, he decided that he could not remain idle while others fought the great war of his generation. In July, only days after the Confederate victory at Bull Run, he left his Maryland home and made his way surreptitiously across the James River to Virginia to offer his services to the Confederacy. The Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, chose Buchanan to command the Virginia because he believed the Marylander had the perfect combination of realism and boldness. The Virginia is a novelty, Mallory wrote in his letter of appointment. It is untried and its powers unknown, and the department does not give specific orders as to her attack on the enemy. But Mallory also made it clear that he hoped for great things from this experimental vessel, and that he expected Buchanan to seize the initiative. Action, prompt and successful action, now could be of serious importance to our cause, Mallory wrote. If Mallory wanted action, Buchanan was just the man for the job. One of the Virginia's officers, after hearing Buchanan's initial address to the crew, described him as a typical product of the old-time quarterdeck, as indomitably courageous as Nelson, and just as arbitrary. Buchanan wasted no time. The Virginia got underway for its first sea trial as an ironclad on the morning of March 8, 1862. Technically, the ship was not yet finished. The shields for its broadside gun ports had not been installed, and the engine had never been tested. But Buchanan was a man in a hurry. When the Virginia left its berth in the Gosport Navy Yard and eased slowly down the Elizabeth River, escorted by a few small gunboats, only two men on board, besides Buchanan himself, knew that this was no trial run. Buchanan had decided that the run across the width of Hampton Roads was enough of a trial for the ship's questionable engine plant. Assuming that the engines could get him there, he planned to steer his experimental craft directly at the enemy. As the Virginia left the river's mouth and moved into Hampton Roads, Buchanan ordered the helm over, and slowly, ever so slowly, the prow of the great ironclad swung to port until it was aimed directly at the two Union warships anchored off Newport News Point. Buchanan 
and the Virginia were about to make history. If the appearance of the Virginia in Hampton Roads marked a milestone in naval warfare, the Civil War in which it fought was itself a milestone in defining the character of the nation. The country's regional differences were already manifest when Perry won his signal victory on Lake Erie in 1813. The war hawks of the South and West had looked disdainfully on those, mostly from New England, who had opposed the War of 1812. And many in New England suspected that the war hawks had motives of their own for promoting an invasion of Canada. In the years since then, however, the issues had changed, and the balance of political power had shifted. The sectional squabble over the admission of Missouri proved to be only the first of a series of disputes over the rights of slaveholders in the West. After the American victory in the war with Mexico, 1846 through 1848, the nation almost broke apart over the question of whether slavery would be allowed in the territories annexed after the war. A few years later, the dispute over slavery in Kansas actually led to the spilling of blood. At the same time, continuing immigration and closer mercantile connections between the mid-Atlantic states and the Old Northwest had increased the relative strength of the northern states within the national government. Southerners, such as the former war hawk John C. Calhoun, who had championed the consolidation of national power in the central government because they assumed that the southern states would always dominate that government, began to perceive as early as the 1830s that this was no longer likely. Threatened with the reality of the North's new political influence, they constructed a dramatically different interpretation of Republican government, asserting that national authority was subordinate to and dependent on the states, rather than the other way around. With Lincoln's election in 1860, Southern leaders realized that they had lost control, and they took the bold step of declaring themselves out of the Union. Like the American Declaration of War on England in 1812, the secession of the South was a bold, even reckless step, and like that earlier declaration, it was based on several false assumptions. The first of these was the South's overestimation of its own economic leverage. Southerners believed, or at least they asserted, that the agricultural products of the southern states were so vital to the world's economy that a cotton-hungry planet would side with the South in order to ensure continued access to its goods. When Lincoln declared a blockade of Confederate ports a week after Fort Sumter, the Richmond Examiner editorialized that such a declaration was fatuous because, according to the Examiner, the world needed the South more than the South needed the world. If the world respects the blockade, the Examiner declared, all of mankind, civilized and savage, must suffer for the necessities of life, for all consume or use cotton, tobacco, rice, and other of our agricultural products. And if those products be excluded from the markets of the world, the supply will be so deficient that universal want and privation will ensue, and starvation often occur throughout every state and country and continent of the world, and in every isle of the ocean. Instead, of course, the nations of the world found other sources for their cotton, tobacco, and rice, and it was the Confederacy that suffered want and privation, if not actual starvation, for the lack of access to the world's markets. The South's second great error was to underestimate Northern determination. Southerners could not believe that Northern shopkeepers and tradesmen would willingly shed their blood to compel the Southern states to remain in the Union against their will. The South's image of the North, grounded in four decades of sectional feuding and stereotyping, was that of a money-grubbing secular society where notions of honor, self-sacrifice, and courage simply did not exist. The Fire Eaters, who pushed hardest for secession in the crisis winter of 1860 through 1861, publicly offered to drink every drop of blood spilled in a Southern war for independence. Such offers drew cheers and laughter from Southern audiences, who understood clearly what was being implied, that Northern men did not have the stomach for war, and when confronted by the united resolve of a defiant South, they would necessarily acquiesce in a peaceful and bloodless separation. 
That assumption, too, proved spectacularly misplaced. Over the next four years, northern shopkeepers and tradesmen, as well as mechanics, clerks, teachers, farmers, lawyers, and others, 350,000 in all, laid down their lives to preserve the Union. And finally, the South underestimated the vast potential of the North's own economic powerhouse. In this case, Southerners were misled not just by their conviction that agriculture trumped industry, but by a historical phenomenon that caught almost everyone by surprise. For the Civil War turned out to be two things at the same time, both the world's last old-fashioned war and the world's first modern war. It was a war of galloping cavalry charges and open-field infantry attacks, a war in which regimental flags had a talismanic, almost religious, significance. A war where military orders were frequently subscribed, as Perry had ended his note to Harrison, yours with great respect and esteem. But if such elements hearkened back to the past, other aspects of the war foreshadowed the future, for the Civil War was also a conflict of mass conscript armies, armed with rifled muskets, of rapid troop movements by railroad, of instantaneous communication by telegraph, and, in its final phase, of both trench warfare and the kind of violence against society best exemplified by Sherman's famous march to the sea. It was, in short, a total war sustained by the mass production of standardized arms, uniforms, tents, and even rations. The war marked a revolution in naval warfare as well. That revolution was already evident even before the war began in April 1861, as the graceful frigates and sloops of the Age of Sail gave way during the 1840s and 50s to coal-fired steamships. Many resisted the change. Coal was filthy. Its ubiquitous dust permeated everything on board, making it impossible to maintain the kind of spit-and-polished cleanliness that had long defined successful command at sea. Moreover, while the wind was free, coal was expensive, and it was not available everywhere. A reliance on coal made warships operating thousands of miles from home dependent on foreign ports for fuel. In consequence, steam warships in the 1850s were often called auxiliary steamers, and they carried a complete set of masts and spars so that they could navigate from place to place under sail. Propellers were generally two-bladed rather than four-bladed, so that when a ship was under sail, the propeller could be fixed in a vertical position to reduce its drag on the water. Many steamships had hinged crankshafts so that the propeller could be lifted out of the water altogether. Others had hinged smokestacks that could be lowered to the deck. Practicality, as well as tradition, led naval architects to design steamships that still looked as much as possible like ships that had fought on Lake Erie. Naval gunnery was changing, too. Naval guns still loaded from the muzzle, but by 1861, the guns had grown so large that their capacity was no longer measured by the weight of the shot, for example, 32-pounders, but by the diameter of the muzzle, for example, 7 inches. And once war began, the pace of change accelerated. Naval guns grew from 7 inches to 9 inches, to 11 inches, and finally to 15 inches, guns so large they dwarfed the human figures that served them. Before the war was over, the Union Navy forged a 20-inch gun that weighed over 10 tons, and though it was never deployed in battle, it was larger than the biggest naval guns of World War II. Moreover, not only were these guns bigger, but many of them were rifled, that is, they had grooves cut in a corkscrew pattern inside the barrel that put a spin on the projectile, enabling it to keep a true trajectory for a much longer distance, and the projectiles they fired were more often than not explosive shells rather than solid shot. In addition to these bigger and more dangerous naval guns, there were entirely new devices, including what federal sailors called infernal machines, by which they meant underwater torpedoes or mines, as well as the first submarine that successfully, albeit at the cost of its own destruction, sank an enemy warship. 
That vessel was the famous Confederate submarine Hunley, which sank the USS Housatonic off Charleston Harbor on February 17, 1864, but which herself perished in attempting to return to port. Above all, the war at sea featured the emergence of armored warships, commonly called ironclads, vessels so different from Perry's majestic brigs on Lake Erie as to be virtually unrecognizable as warships. In this contest, metal would count almost as much as metal, and in a contest where the weapons of war required the application of industrial productivity, the Union states had an overwhelming advantage over their southern counterparts. Yet the North did not immediately take advantage of its overwhelming industrial superiority. Part of the reason for that was once the U.S. Navy found itself in the unfamiliar position of being the dominant naval power and, consistent with the inherent conservatism of the superior power, its initial instinct was to rely on the time-tested weapons of naval warfare. Lincoln's first order for the Navy was to announce a blockade of the southern coast. Blockade was a traditional wartime tool of maritime powers, though historically the great powers had used it not so much to stifle trade as to confine the enemy battle fleet in its own ports. Throughout the Napoleonic Wars, Britain had successfully maintained a blockade of the French Navy for most of two decades. In the Civil War, the U.S. Navy did not have to worry about keeping a Confederate battle fleet bottled up, because for all practical purposes, the Confederacy had no navy. Instead, the goal of the Union blockade of the Confederacy was much more ambitious, to close all of the ports and harbors along the coast, literally stopping all trade. In Lincoln's words, it was to prevent entrance and exit of vessels from the ports aforesaid. Such a goal was easier to proclaim than to achieve. The Confederacy claimed a coastline of some 3,500 miles, and the U.S. Navy had fewer than 90 warships. On the other hand, the North did not need cutting-edge technology or warships of innovative design to execute its blockade strategy. Indeed, almost any vessel, or at least any steam vessel, for sailing ships proved to be inefficient on blockade duty, would suit. The Navy Department therefore went on a buying spree, purchasing steam merchant vessels, reinforcing their decks so that they could carry the weight of naval guns, and then sending them down to serve on the blockade. By 1864, the U.S. Navy boasted a ship's list of over 400 such vessels and over 600 ships altogether. The Confederacy could not hope to match these numbers, nor did it try. Just as the Union adopted the traditional strategy of superior naval powers, the Confederacy adopted the kind of naval strategy traditionally employed by weaker naval powers— a naval policy nearly identical to the one pursued by the United States in 1812 for its war against Britain. It would rely on its armies to master the war on land, conduct a war on commerce against Union merchant ships, and defend the coast by relying on shore fortifications supported by a few cutting-edge naval weapons. If Southerners did not conceive of the land war as a mere matter of marching, as some of the war hawks had proclaimed in 1812, they did harbor great confidence in the superiority of their land armies, a confidence that seemed to be well-founded after several of the early land engagements resulted in Confederate victories before Union numerical and industrial superiority began to dominate. At sea, the idea of commerce raiding was particularly appealing because it would hit the Yankees where Southerners believed it would hurt them most— in their pocketbooks. To execute such a policy, the Confederacy sent agents to Europe to purchase a handful of fast raiders. This eventually resulted in the acquisition of the Alabama, Florida, and Shenandoah, vessels that collectively destroyed more than 150 American merchant ships and provoked a near panic among the bankers and businessmen of the North's Atlantic seaboard. The protection of the southern coast proved more difficult. In those places where the Confederates were able to occupy existing forts built in the 1830s and 40s by the Army Corps of Engineers, such as Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor or Fort Morgan at the entrance to Mobile Bay, they were able to fend off repeated naval assaults. 
But where they had to depend instead on fortifications thrown up since the onset of war, such as at Hatteras Inlet in North Carolina or Port Royal in South Carolina, the Union Navy generally had its way, blasting those dirt and log defenses into surrender within a matter of hours. To prevent Union domination of the coastline, Confederacy Navy Secretary Stephen R. Mallory hoped to supplement the coastal forts by acquiring a few ships whose defensive characteristics were such that they could stand up to a whole squadron of conventional Union warships. Knowing that the enemy could build 100 ships to one of our own, he wrote his wife, my policy has been to make such ships so strong and invulnerable as would compensate for the inequality of numbers. In a word, he wanted ironclads. As early as May 8th, less than a month after Fort Sumter, Mallory urged the Confederate Congress, which had not yet moved from Montgomery to Richmond, to authorize the construction of an ironclad warship. I regard the possession of an iron-armored ship as a matter of the first necessity, he wrote. Such a vessel at this time could traverse the entire coast of the United States, prevent all blockades, and encounter, with a fair prospect of success, their entire navy. The concept of iron-armored warships was not a new one. Robert Fulton had designed and built a self-powered floating battery, which he called Demologos, for the defense of New York Harbor at the end of the War of 1812, though it never saw action. In 1854, the United States had experimented with a similar craft, the Stevens Battery, but it was still unfinished in 1861 and had design flaws that made it unlikely that it would ever be completed. In 1857, the French had initiated a program to build ten ironclad warships, thus stealing a nautical march, to use a mixed metaphor, on their British rivals, and the first of them, called Gloire, had been launched in 1859. Inspired, or rather provoked, by the French to reciprocate, the British had also begun construction of an armored warship. Unlike the French Gloire, which was protected by iron armor bolted over a wooden frame, the British Warrior was built entirely of iron. The Warrior remains in honorary commission today and is moored at Portsmouth near HMS Victory, Nelson's flagship at Trafalgar. Mallory's first thought was to try to buy the Gloire from the French outright. The French refused, however, not only because they were unwilling to relinquish the jewel of their fleet, but also because it would be an obvious violation of neutrality. If Mallory wanted armored warships for his new navy, he would have to find a way to build them at home. His problem was that the Confederacy lacked the facilities, what today would be called the industrial infrastructure, necessary to build such a vessel from scratch quickly. The design, fabrication, and construction of the engine plant alone was likely to take a year or more. Mallory therefore sought a shortcut, and he found one thanks mainly to the federal commander of the Gosport Navy Yard near Norfolk, Virginia, Commodore Charles McCauley. Only days after Confederates fired the first shot of the war at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor and Virginia seceded from the Union, Macaulay feared that a noisy mob of citizens outside the Navy Yard gate might try to storm the place. On April 20, 1861, he ordered that the yard be evacuated. Not only was his decision premature, but the evacuation was poorly coordinated and incompletely performed. Though Macaulay ordered his men to destroy whatever could not be carried away, much of value was left behind, including repair facilities, machine shops, a huge granite dry dock, and the partially burned hull of the steam frigate Merrimack. Months later, long after the Merrimack had been transformed into the ironclad Virginia and won its first dramatic victory, an argument emerged over who deserved the credit for planning and building the South's first ironclad. One candidate was a lieutenant in the Confederate Navy named John Mercer Brooke. On June 3, 1861, Brooke met with Mallory in Richmond to urge the construction of an iron-plated warship, and a week later, he submitted a sketch of a casemate ironclad. For technical advice about the feasibility of the concept, Mallory sent for Chief Engineer William P. Williamson 
and naval constructor John L. Porter. Porter is the other contender for credit as the designer of the CSS Virginia. He had no idea why Mallory had summoned him, but he had been thinking about an ironclad warship independently, and when he traveled to Richmond, he brought with him a design of his own for an ironclad warship. When he arrived there on June 23rd, he was surprised and pleased to discover that building an armored warship was the very project Mallory had in mind. In fact, Brooks' drawing and Porter's model were strikingly similar. They both featured an iron fort or casemate with angled walls, Brooks at a 45-degree angle, Porter's at 40 degrees, built atop a flat-bottomed hull. After tests ashore, the walls of the casemate were eventually constructed at a 36-degree angle. The principal difference was that in Porter's model, the casemate covered the entire hull, whereas in Brooks' plan, both the ship's pointed prow and its rounded stern extended beyond the casemate, partly to prevent the bow wave from crashing up on the armored shield and partly to increase buoyancy. Porter agreed that this was a desirable feature, and he volunteered to turn the rough sketch into a finished design. For more than a quarter of a century afterward, indeed until the day they died, Brooke and Porter quarreled about which of them deserved credit for the design of the CSS Virginia. In 1887, they each wrote articles for Century magazine, emphasizing the centrality of his role and disparaging that of the other. Both men, along with Chief Engineer Williamson, then headed back to Norfolk to see if the whole of the partially destroyed Merrimack, which had been raised from the bottom of the Elizabeth River and placed in the masonry dry dock, would suit as a platform on which to construct their ironclad. Williamson thought it would, though both Brooke and Porter were dubious. They had each envisioned a flat-bottomed vessel, with some justification, they feared that using the Merrimack's V-shaped hull would give the ship too great a draft for operations in coastal waters. Nevertheless, they allowed themselves to be convinced, since, as they put it in their letter to Mallory, it would appear that this is our only chance to get a suitable vessel in a short time. By mid-July, the work was underway. Porter supervised the refit as carpenters cut away the charred timbers on the Merrimack and began to erect a frame for the casemate. Williamson focused on repairing the cranky engines. Brooke designed the rifled guns that would make up the ship's armament, and he took charge of procuring the iron plate that would constitute its armor shield. In the end, it was the iron armor that proved to be the bottleneck. Tests conducted in October proved that two-inch iron plate was dramatically more effective than one-inch plate, even several layers of it. But there was only one facility in all of the Confederacy capable of rolling two-inch plate, the Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, and covering the Virginia's casemate with two layers of two-inch iron plate would require nearly 800 tons of iron. There was simply not that much iron available in all of Virginia. Brook scavenged scrap iron, old smoothbore cannon, even tools, all of which was melted down into iron plate, but he still came up short. To make up the difference, the Confederacy began ripping up hundreds of miles of its own railroads, a measure of both its industrial weakness and its desperation. The Confederate Navy and Southern Railroads competed for scarce iron throughout the war. In January 1863, the Confederate Congress passed legislation that authorized the Navy to seize excess iron from railroads, but state governors protested and put so many roadblocks in the way that the Navy remained desperately short of iron. Even with crews working around the clock, production was limited and frustratingly slow. By October, only two tons of the two-inch iron armor had reached Gosport, and the last of it did not arrive until February 1862. The Confederacy had begun with a considerable head start in the arms race to construct an ironclad warship, but as delay followed delay, the window of opportunity was swiftly closing. Mallory agonized over every delay, and he had to play referee when Brooke and Porter quarreled over proposed changes in the design. Weary of the squabbling, 
Mallory sent Lieutenant Catesby Op Roger Jones to Gosport in November to take charge of the project and eventually to become the ship's executive officer. Jones had an impressive pedigree. He was the son of Roger Jones, the AP in his name was Welsh for son of, who had been the Army's adjutant general, and he was the nephew of Thomas Op Catesby Jones, who had commanded the U.S. Naval Squadron in the battle for New Orleans during the War of 1812. Moreover, Jones himself was a competent professional, and events would prove him to have been a good choice. But to command the ship, Mallory wanted a more senior officer, someone who would be aggressive enough to take full advantage of the vessel's presumed capabilities. Such a disproportionate amount of the Confederacy's naval resources was being committed to this project that it was crucial to have just the right man in command, lest the vessel's capabilities be squandered. Mallory wanted a sea warrior, and he chose 61-year-old Captain Franklin Buchanan. One hundred miles away in Washington, officials had known for some time what the Confederates were up to in Norfolk. The Union's Navy Secretary, Gideon Wells, had even obtained a copy of Mallory's May 8th letter to the Confederate Congress, claiming that one rebel ironclad vessel could encounter, with a fair prospect of success, the entire U.S. Navy. At first, Wells did not take this boast seriously, his skepticism fed by the reaction of most of his senior naval officers, who scoffed at the notion. But all through May and June, news of the rebel activity in Norfolk continued to reach him. In the middle of the 19th century, there was no such thing as industrial secrecy, and Wells knew almost as soon as Mallory did when the Merrimack's hull was raised, when it was placed in dry dock, and when workmen began to reconfigure its superstructure. Southern newspapers proved a particularly valuable source of information and kept Wells up to date on the ship's progress, even publishing the results of the ordnance testing against one- and two-inch iron plate. By the end of June, Wells decided that the Union Navy needed to develop a counterweapon, and on July 4th, he asked Congress for an appropriation of $1.5 million to construct three experimental ironclad warships. To determine appropriate designs for these craft, that same legislation authorized the creation of an ironclad board consisting of three serving naval officers, all of them captains. The bill worked its way through Congress with unusual speed, and President Lincoln signed it on August 4th. Three days later, Wells issued a public solicitation of designs for an American ironclad warship. Like Perry and Barclay on Lake Erie, Wells and Mallory were engaged in a naval arms race for the control of a strategically critical body of water. Despite that, events continued with measured progress in Washington. Fifteen proposals were submitted to the ironclad board, though only two of them received serious attention. One was a gunboat designed by Samuel Pook that was submitted by an enthusiastic entrepreneur named Cornelius Bushnell. The other was for a more or less conventional frigate with iron plating. The Navy captains on the ironclad board, all veterans of the sailing era, were skeptical. Both designs called for the proposed vessels to carry a huge amount of iron plate above the waterline, and some board members openly expressed doubts that either ship would float. This is when Bushnell began to play a crucial, if curious, role. Bushnell had a lot invested, both financially as well as personally, in getting a contract, so he decided to verify his design with the man who he had been told was the nation's most gifted expert on maritime engineering, the Swedish-born immigrant John Ericsson. Visiting Ericsson at his New York residence, Bushnell asked him to calculate the buoyancy of the two vessels under consideration. Ericsson did so, assuring Bushnell rather quickly that both ships would indeed float. But then Ericsson asked Bushnell if, as long as he was there, would he like to see a floating battery that Ericsson himself had designed, and the inventor brought out a model of a flat-bottomed vessel whose salient feature was a rotating cylinder in the middle of its flat deck. Bushnell saw at once the potential of such a vessel, and he asked if he could show it to Wells. Erickson agreed. Bushnell went straight to Wells's home in Hartford, Connecticut, where he declared somewhat melodramatically 
that the country was safe because I had found a battery which would make us master of the situation as far as the ocean was concerned. Wells urged him to present the model to the ironclad board, but Bushnell did more than that. He got William H. Seward to write him a letter of introduction to Abraham Lincoln, and he took Erickson's model straight to the White House. Among his many other interests, Lincoln was fond of gadgets. Years earlier, when he had still been a prairie lawyer, he had obtained a patent for a device to float river steamers over sandbars, and during the war he was a frequent visitor to the Washington Navy Yard, where he liked to observe ordnance tests. Intrigued by Erickson's model, he agreed to accompany Bushnell to the next meeting of the ironclad board. At that meeting, on September 13th, the members of the board remained skeptical. But Lincoln made his feelings known in a characteristic way, remarking, All I have to say is what the girl said when she put her foot into stocking. It strikes me there's something in it. Even with that encouragement, the members of the board hesitated. They recalled that Erickson had designed the screw sloop Princeton back in 1844, and rather unfairly, they connected him with the explosion of one of the Princeton's big guns during a cruise on the Potomac, an accident that had killed the secretaries of state and war, among others. Bushnell protested that the gun that had exploded was Robert F. Stockton's peacemaker, not Erickson's Oregon gun, but the captains remained unmoved. The Erickson-designed Oregon gun did not explode, though because of the failure of Stockton's peacemaker, the Navy never fired it again. It sits now just inside the main gate at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. Charles Henry Davis was weary of Bushnell's impassioned advocacy. He suggested that Bushnell take the little thing, the model, home and worship it. Bushnell decided that the only man who could convince these skeptics of the little ship's technical feasibility was Erickson himself. But Bushnell also knew that Erickson would be less than eager to appear before the Navy captains as a supplicant. With some justification, the Swedish inventor believed that he had been ill-treated by the Navy ever since the 1944 incident on the Princeton, and he had resolved long ago never again to set foot in Washington. Aware of this, Bushnell was not completely honest about the reception the model had received in Washington. He told Erickson that the board members had been impressed by the genius of the design, but that one member had asked a few technical questions that Bushnell had not been able to answer. Well, Erickson replied, I'll go. I'll go tonight. From that moment, Bushnell wrote later, I knew that the success of the affair was assured. Not quite. Both Bushnell and Wells knew that if the captains on the ironclad board greeted Erickson coolly, the touchy inventor was likely to withdraw in a huff. Aware that time was running out, Wells urged Commodore Joseph Smith, the board's chairman, to give the inventor a fair and cordial hearing. Even then, the meeting was nearly disastrous. Erickson was prepared for compliments, not criticism. He bristled from the start, but the mood in the room turned when, in responding to a question about the vessel's likely stability in a seaway, Erickson became so involved in the answer that he delivered a lengthy and technically detailed dissertation that left the board members both silenced and impressed. Impressed, but not yet convinced. It required another presentation in Wells's office to satisfy the board members. At the end of that meeting, Erickson declared that his ship could be built in 90 days. Wells asked him how much it would cost. $275,000, Erickson answered at once, only a fraction of the appropriation Wells had available. Wells then turned to face the board members and asked them, one by one, if a contract should be granted. Receiving an affirmative from each, Wells told Erickson to get started. A contract would be forthcoming. It was the 15th of September. Down in Norfolk, Confederates had already raised the Merrimack, cut away its charred scantlings, and redesigned and reconfigured it as an ironclad. On the other hand, the Tredegar Ironworks had only that month begun to produce the first sections of two-inch iron plate for the vessel's armor shield. The arms race was still winnable, but only if Erickson could make good on his promise to build the ship in 90 days. 
In addition to Ericsson's monitor, the ironclad board also approved two other designs, the Samuel Poop-designed Galena, which proved a great disappointment, and the armored frigate New Ironsides, which performed satisfactorily, if unspectacularly, as the flagship of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Ericsson subcontracted various parts of the ship to other companies, something his Confederate counterparts could not do. But he personally supervised the critical components, the engines, the assembly of the hull, and in particular, the novel revolving turret. This, indeed, was the key design feature of Ericsson's battery. Twenty-one feet across and eight feet high, the turret was constructed of eight layers of overlapping one-inch iron plate and it revolved on a spindle driven by a small steam engine. Inside that turret were only two guns, the ship's entire armament, but they were large caliber guns, and because the turret could revolve, they could be pointed in any direction, independent of the ship's heading. Workers began construction on October 25th, and the vessel was launched 93 days later. At the launching, Ericsson was vindicated, and his critics silenced, when it floated with exactly the draft that he had calculated. For the command of this unusual vessel, Wells chose 43-year-old Lieutenant John L. Warden of New York, a 27-year Navy veteran. Unlike Buchanan, Warden did not have a reputation as an aggressive sea warrior. Most of his active duty service had been spent ashore in the Naval Observatory. But perhaps Wells felt that he owed Warden something. During the Fort Sumter crisis, Wells had sent him to carry secret orders to the commander of Fort Pickens near Pensacola. Warden had completed the assignment, successfully delivering the orders to the post's commanding officer. But by the time he was ready to return to Washington, the first shots of the war had been fired at Fort Sumter. Trusting to fate, Warden nevertheless bought a rail ticket north. He was arrested almost at once by Confederate authorities in Alabama and held as a prisoner for seven months before he was released on November 1st due to his failing health. After a month's sick leave, Warden received orders on January 12th to report to the Brooklyn Navy Yard to take command of the Monitor. In an unconscious echo of the orders Mallory prepared for Buchanan, Commodore Smith, who headed Wells's ironclad board, wrote Warden, this vessel is an experiment. I believe you are the right sort of officer to put in command of her. In receipt of these orders, Warden immediately went down to the Navy Yard to view the famous Ericsson battery, which Ericsson now decided should be called Monitor. Warden was less than overwhelmed by his first glimpse of the strange little craft, and he acknowledged his orders by cautiously expressing the hope that she may prove a success. At all events, he added gamely, I am quite willing to be an agent in testing her capabilities. If Warden withheld judgment about the Monitor, the crew of that little vessel was equally uncertain about their new commander. Warden's health was still precarious when he reported aboard his new command on January 16th, and he did not make much of an impression on the crew. He was thin, pale, and, in the opinion of at least one member of the wardroom, effeminate-looking. But Warden's appearance belied a fierce determination. For the next month, everything was hurry and confusion on the monitor, as Warden oversaw all the thousands of tiny details necessary to a ship's commissioning. The vessel was afloat, but it was not yet finished. As the final touches were added to the berthing spaces and officers' cabins, supplies of all kinds, from dishware to chamber pots, were loaded on board, including powder and shot for the vessel's two 11-inch Dahlgren guns. Since the ship had only two guns, both Ericsson and Warden wanted the biggest caliber guns they could get. Indeed, Ericsson had specifically requested that the Monitor be armed with new 12-inch guns, but none were available. He therefore had to settle for two 11-inch guns borrowed from other vessels in New York Harbor. Those guns came with a stipulation that no more than 15 pounds of powder could be used for any single charge, a legacy of the explosion of Stockton's Peacemaker on the Princeton nearly 20 years before. If time had allowed, 
Warden might have been allowed to proof the guns by firing successive rounds from each one using progressively larger charges until it was clear that the weapon could bear the strain of larger loads without fracturing. But there was no time for such niceties in the current crisis. On February 27th, the same day that the Merrimack was put into commission as the Virginia in Gosport, the Monitor embarked on its first sea trial. It was nearly disastrous. The engines worked well enough, driving the ironclad through the water at a respectable seven or eight knots, but the helmsman called out that the ship would not answer the rudder. The ship's great weight created such a powerful forward momentum that the tiller ropes connecting the wheel to the rudder had no effect. The monitor ran back and forth across New York Harbor like a drunken man on a sidewalk, as one crewman recalled, finally slamming into the Brooklyn dock near the city gas works with a jarring collision. Ignominiously, it had to be towed back to its berth in the Navy Yard. Notified of the problem, Erickson came on board, went below, and began to tinker with the lines and pulleys that transferred orders from the wheel to the rudder. By multiplying the ratio, he soon fixed the problem. But this incident reminded Warden that, as Smith had warned him, this vessel is an experiment. Departure was postponed for a day due to the weather, but on March 6th, the Monitor left the Brooklyn Navy Yard bound for Hampton Roads. The journey itself was an adventure, in addition to relying on its own engines, the Monitor was also under tow, and it had an escort of two gunboats. Despite the predictions of the skeptics, the Monitor rode the water well, and the first day out, no new problems were identified. The engines clanked along satisfactorily, and from the top of the Monitor's turret, the only part of the vessel where a man might stand while the ship was underway, Warden watched the tow line dipping in and out of the water between his vessel and the tug 400 feet dead ahead. Off to each side were the escorting gunboats. More distantly, he could see the sailing vessels running in and out of New York. So far, the ironclad was performing magnificently. This was certainly good news to the 57 men who made up the Monitor's crew, all of whom were volunteers. Rather than accept men arbitrarily assigned to him from the receiving ships in the harbor, Warden had asked for volunteers, and he was gratified when more men volunteered than he needed. But if the men were enthusiastic and patriotic, they were also mostly inexperienced. The ship's executive officer, Samuel Dana Green, was only 21 and just three years out of the academy. Its paymaster was so innocent that he asked Warden if it was really necessary for him to buy a uniform. Couldn't he just continue to wear his civilian clothes on board? Besides Warden himself, only the ship's chief engineer, 34-year-old Albin Steimers, was a veteran of long experience, and he was on board mainly to observe and report on how the monitor functioned at sea. Of the ship's crew of 57, only nine had sufficient experience to be rated as ordinary seamen. Now that they were at sea, they discovered that living and working in the semi-submerged world of the Monitor was relatively comfortable, much more comfortable, one sailor wrote, than the receiving ship North Carolina had been. So far, it seemed, duty in an ironclad was not too bad. The only drawbacks seemed to be that the inside temperature was either too cold or, once the heat from the boilers was tapped, too hot, and the interior lighting was so dim below decks that it was difficult to see. Most compartments had small waterproof windows in the overhead to admit some natural light, but it remained dark in the narrow passageways, and when the ship was buttoned up for combat, it would be almost pitch black. The good weather did not last. On the second day out, the barometer dropped and the wind increased. Heavy waves washed over the monitor's flat deck, foaming and sloshing against the turret. The officers in their staterooms looked up through the glass windows to see green water overhead. Save for the turret, the ship was, in effect, underwater. From the tug, only the monitor's turret was visible above the waves, and occasionally even that was obscured by the rolling seas. Those seas also affected the ship's movement, especially under tow. 
27-year veteran that he was, Warden nevertheless felt the cold, prickly sweat and rising nausea of seasickness. He had not fully recovered from his seven months in captivity, and the confined spaces, the hot oil smell from the engine, and the motion of an iron ship under tow sent him rushing to the top of the turret, where the bracing wind and sea spray provided only partial relief. Despite his personal misery, his own health was not Warden's greatest worry. Erickson had designed the monitor's turret so that it rested on a smooth brass ring embedded in the deck. He had calculated that the weight of the 120-ton turret would press so securely on this ring that it would create a perfect waterproof seal. But just prior to the vessel's departure from New York, Stimers had placed a plated hemp rope between the turret and the deck in order to provide what he thought would be a more secure seal. Now, as the weather worsened, water began to work its way through this hempen seal, and soon water was dripping and then cascading down into the birthing spaces. The men below were now not only seasick, but soaked, and Warden allowed his fellow sufferers to join him atop the ship's turret. There they lay flat on their backs atop the iron grating, shielded from the worst of the sea spray by a canvas tarpaulin. Then, at four o'clock, the ventilating fans in the engine room stopped working. So much water had sloshed down the blower pipes that the leather belts driving the blowers had stretched and lost their purchase on the pulleys. Smoke built up in the engine room, and sailors fought their way out coughing and wheezing. Rushing in to try to solve the problem, Stimers succumbed to the smoke and gas. He had to be dragged out unconscious and taken to the top of the now crowded turret top. Without a fire in the boiler, the pumps would not work and Warden ordered the crew to man the hand pumps. The men went to work with a will, but the hand pumps were not powerful enough to force water all the way from the bilge to the top of the turret, which was the ship's only opening to the outside. Water began to build up below, and Warden ordered the ship's flag to be hoisted upside down as a signal of distress. In such a sea, however, there was nothing the escorting gunboats could do. Eventually, only the easing of the storm saved the ship. That allowed the engineers to restart the engines and re-engage the pumps. The next day was March 8th, a fateful day in American naval history. At noon, Warden sighted Cape Henry at the northern entrance to Chesapeake Bay. And a few hours later, as the land crept closer, those on board the monitor began to hear heavy firing in the distance— which led to intense speculation. Some thought it was only the guns of Fort Monroe, at practice, but Warden feared that the Merrimack had at last come out and that he was too late. He ordered the ship cleared for action and asked for maximum speed. In spite of his eagerness, however, the ship would not be hurried. Our iron hull crept slowly on, one officer wrote home, and the monotonous clank, clank, clank of the engine betokened no increase of its speed. It was evening by the time the Monitor and its escorts entered Chesapeake Bay, and full dark before it entered the roadstead. The tow line was cast off, and a pilot came on board. From him, Warden learned that the Merrimack had indeed come out that day, and that it had all but destroyed the Union fleet. Warden directed the pilot to put the monitor alongside the Roanoke, the flagship of the Union Squadron. Not until he was alongside did Warden learn the scope of the disaster that had been wrought that day by the rebel ironclad. Measured in terms of lives lost, the fighting in Hampton Roads on March 8, 1862, marked the worst defeat in the history of the United States Navy until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor 80 years later. Unlike that later attack, however, there had been no stealth in the assault by the CSS Virginia against the Union Navy's wooden ships in Hampton Roads. Cheered on by a crowd of spectators lining the shore, Buchanan ordered the Virginia to steam boldly out of the Elizabeth River in the bright sunlight of a spring morning, black smoke billowing from its single stack, and head directly toward its quarry the USS Cumberland and USS Congress, waiting at anchor off Newport News Point. Between them, 
Those two Union vessels, both of them sailing ships, mounted a total of 70 guns to the Virginia's 10. But such a comparison, pertinent in the days of Perry and Barclay, was largely irrelevant now. Officially, the Virginia was rated as a ram. A 1,500-pound cast-iron prow had been bolted onto the ship's bow just below the waterline, and though it protruded only a few feet from the ship's stern, it made the ship itself, as well as its guns, a potentially lethal weapon. Buchanan's plan was to steam his vessel directly at the Cumberland and drive that cast-iron prow into the Cumberland's wooden hull. He targeted that ship first because, although it had fewer guns than the Congress, the Cumberland's guns were larger and included two 10-inch pivot guns. Buchanan feared, incorrectly, as it happened, that these guns might be rifled, and since large-caliber rifled guns were the only ones likely to prove capable of penetrating the Virginia's iron shield, the Cumberland had to be dispatched first. The risk was that such a direct attack would enable the Cumberland to cap the T of the Virginia as it approached. That is, the Cumberland would be able to fire several broadsides at the Virginia during its lengthy transit, while the Virginia would be able to answer only with its one bow gun, a seven-inch Brook-designed rifle. The Virginia's straining engines were able to propel the great ship through the water at only about five knots, so the men on both sides had plenty of time to consider the pending encounter. Whatever they felt internally, outwardly, they displayed confidence and a grim determination. Men stood quietly at their posts, some out of a sense of duty, some out of patriotism, some simply because their pride would not let them do otherwise. On the Virginia, one officer noted, the pale and determined countenances of the gun crews as they stood motionless at their posts, with set lips unsmiling. But in at least some cases, if not most, that stoic demeanor belied a deep apprehension. The third assistant engineer, Eugenius Jack, recalled that he felt no little anxiety and was a little weak-kneed as the Virginia closed its foe. For most of the gunners and firemen on the Virginia, this would be their first combat on a ship of war. The majority of them had been recruited from army units nearby, and the slow journey down the Elizabeth River was their total seagoing experience. Jack no doubt spoke for many when he noted in his memoirs, there are few men who do not feel some symptoms of fear when going into battle. Pride has kept many a man's face to the foe when his heart would turn it away. Similarly, on the Cumberland, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge, who commanded the ship's first division, recalled that the men waited at their guns cool, grim, silent, and determined. If they were appalled by the grotesque iron-plated war machine steaming slowly toward them, they took comfort, as soldiers and sailors have done throughout the history of organized war, in the proximity of their messmates. That bond gave them a collective strength that masked their individual uncertainties. Selfridge wrote that they felt the mutual dependence upon each other arising from long association. What was unique about this engagement was not merely that it pitted steam against sail or even iron against wood, but that it marked a confrontation between men on a ship and men in a ship. On the Union warships, the sailors stood by their guns and sighted along the barrels as much as Perry's or Barclay's men had done on Lake Erie. From the weather deck on the Cumberland or the Congress, they had a clear view of the thing that was slowly approaching them. Inside the Virginia, on the other hand, most of the men had to guess at what was happening outside their iron shell. The gunners tried to peer out the narrow gun ports, but the view was constricted, and the officers availed themselves of the privileges of rank to take all the best vantage points. Down below, there was no view at all. In the darkened fire room, E.A. Jack recalled that the suspense was awful. He could track the slow-motion approach of the Virginia toward its quarry only in his mind's eye, and he knew that the battle had begun only when he heard the dull reports of the enemy's artillery, and an occasional sharp crack and tremor of the ship told that we had been struck. But whether those shots striking the shield had penetrated to the gun deck, he did not know. 
Then he heard the sharp reports of our own guns, and soon afterward there came a tremor throughout the ship, and I was nearly thrown from the coal bucket upon which I was sitting. The Virginia had rammed the Cumberland in its starboard side, punching its 1,500-pound ram deep within the wooden hull of its foe. Surely such a blow would be mortal, Jack thought. The cracking and breaking of her timbers told full well how fatal to her that collision was. The sounds and sensations that reached the men inside the Virginia only hinted at the destruction that was taking place aboard the Cumberland. While the shells from the Cumberland glanced harmlessly off the Virginia's iron casemate, the Virginia's bow rifle caused horrible execution on the deck of the Cumberland even before the fatal collision. The second shot fired by the Virginia exploded in the midst of a gun crew that was urgently reloading the Cumberland's forward 10-inch pivot. The explosion dismounted the gun and killed every man in its crew except the gun captain, who lost both of his arms. On board the Virginia, the gun crews reloaded. Lieutenant Charles Sims, captain of the bow gun, called out, Sponge! And the sponge man, Charles Dunbar, leaped over the breaching tackle and thrust his head out through the gun port to obey. A U.S. Marine on the Cumberland, who had been watching the gun port for just such an opportunity, squeezed his trigger, and Dunbar fell back into the Virginia, shot through the head. When the Virginia's iron prow struck the Cumberland, men on both ships were knocked from their feet. Water poured in through the gaping hole in the Cumberland's side. Even then, with the ship literally sinking beneath them and the dead and dying all about, the men on the Cumberland dragged the dead to the unengaged side of the ship and returned to their guns, loading and firing as fast as they could. Because the forward magazine had flooded, powder and shell had to be manhandled from the after magazine, but the guns kept firing. Nevertheless, it was clear that the Cumberland was mortally wounded. A junior officer recalled, The once clean and beautiful deck was slippery with blood, blackened with powder, and looked like a slaughterhouse. Even as the gunners continued to work the big guns, the ship began to settle beneath them. The men on the Virginia had little time to savor their victory. For a few anxious moments, it seemed likely that the Cumberland would take her assassin down with her. The Virginia's ram had plunged so deeply into the Cumberland that although Buchanan had immediately ordered all astern, the ironclad remained embedded in the side of its sinking victim. Water began to rush through the Virginia's forward gun ports into the casemate, and the deck of the big ironclad canted forward alarmingly. The two ships began to settle in tandem until the James River current swung the Virginia's stern slowly to starboard, and the resulting torque on the ship's ram caused a section of it to break off. With that, the Virginia was able to extricate itself from its mortally wounded foe and back away. The Cumberland continued to settle, more swiftly now as tons of water rushed in through the gaping wound in its side, though the men on board continued to serve the guns as long as they were above water. With the decks awash, the sailors finally abandoned their guns. Those who could swim plunged into the water on the landward side and made their way to shore as best they could. Only now did it become evident that carrying the wounded below decks had been a terrible error. There was no time to bring them back up to the weather deck, and dozens of wounded men drowned below decks. As the Cumberland settled bow first, its stern rising briefly before the ship settled on the bottom of Hampton Roads, the tips of its masts still showing above the surface with the vessel's commissioning pennant still flying. Selfridge later claimed that he returned to the Cumberland that evening and rescued the ship's flag, which was still flying at the mizzen. According to his memoirs, he hid it ashore, but when he returned for it later, it was gone. On Perry's Lawrence back in 1813, some 96 of the 159 men on board had been killed or wounded, but only 22 of them had been killed outright. On the Cumberland, more than five times as many were killed, 121 out of 376. Ashore, Lieutenant Selfridge looked back aghast at the scene of disaster. That night, he admitted in his memoirs, he sobbed like a child. 
Buchanan was not done yet. Sea warrior that he was, his goal was to destroy the entire federal squadron, and the Congress was next. Because the James River current had pushed the Virginia's stern downstream, its bow was now pointing upriver. Buchanan, therefore, had to con his balky vessel upriver to gain sea room before executing a slow 180-degree turn to port to re-enter Hampton Roads. The Virginia was so heavy and unmanageable that it took nearly 40 minutes, with its keel scraping bottom most of the way, to execute the turn. At first, the sailors watching from the Congress thought the Virginia was fleeing upriver, and they began to cheer, but the cheers died on their lips as the heavy ironclad continued its slow turn to port and then steadied on a course directly toward them. The destruction of the Cumberland had uncorked the blockade of the James River, allowing the gunboats of the Confederate James River Squadron to steam downriver and join the fight, though they made little difference. A Federal shell fired from the shore ripped through the boiler of the CSS Patrick Henry early in the battle, scalding four men to death and sending it out of the fight. The single gun on the CSS Raleigh slipped from its carriage and became useless. But if these conventional warships proved easy meat for the Federal gunners, every sailor on the Congress had witnessed the Virginia's destruction of the Cumberland, and they could no longer doubt the seriousness of the menace it represented. There were actually two captains on board the Congress that day, both of them named Smith. Lieutenant William Smith had been formally detached from command, though he remained on board as a volunteer, while effective command was executed by Lieutenant Joseph Smith, Jr. The two men were no relation to each other, though the latter, coincidentally, was the son of the Joseph Smith who had chaired Wells's ironclad board. Having witnessed the Virginia's easy conquest of the Cumberland, he saw at once that his own ship had no hope of standing up to the rebel ironclad, and he ordered the anchor slipped, raised the jib, and steered his vessel into shoal water, where the Merrimack, as the Federals continued to call it, could not follow. Aground on the 17-foot shoal, the Congress was safe from ramming, but not from the Virginia's guns. Buchanan carefully maneuvered his ship so that he could hammer away at the Congress from a distance of less than 200 yards, close enough to ensure efficient and devastating fire. Hard aground, the Congress could not maneuver to bring its broadside to bear, and it could employ only its two stern guns. Those two guns fired away defiantly, but uselessly, until the stern of the Congress was so utterly wrecked by the Virginia's constant pounding that they could no longer be served. The Congress was now helpless, a passive target absorbing punishment. Scores died, including young Joe Smith Jr., who was virtually decapitated by a shell fragment. It was evident that surrender was the only humane and sensible option, and the burden of that decision fell on the ship's executive officer, Lieutenant Austin Pendergrast. A few minutes before four o'clock, the Congress's flag fluttered down. The guns ceased firing, and a strange silence settled over the roadstead. Buchanan and most of the Virginia's officers left the acrid casemate and climbed up to stand on the upper deck. From there, Buchanan ordered Lieutenant William H. Parker in the gunboat Beaufort to go alongside the Congress and accept its formal surrender. He instructed Parker to bring the officers and the wounded aboard the Virginia and allow the able-bodied men to escape to shore. Then he was to set the Congress afire. Fifty-year veteran that he was, Buchanan was a sailor of the old school. At this moment, he very likely envisioned a scene similar to the one that had taken place aboard the Lawrence in 1813, when British officers in full-dress uniform had come on board to offer their swords to Perry. Perhaps afterward Buchanan would invite the captain of the Congress to accompany him to his cabin for a glass of sherry. It was even possible that Buchanan's brother might join them, for McKean Buchanan had remained loyal to the Union, and Franklin Buchanan knew that his brother was serving on the Congress as that ship's paymaster. If Buchanan envisioned such a scenario, it evaporated almost at once. When Parker's vessel bumped alongside the Congress, 
Pendergrast offered him a ship's cutlass. Somewhat annoyed, Parker told him to go get his officer's sword. Much more seriously, Federal soldiers of the 20th Indiana Regiment on the nearby shore opened fire on Parker's gunboat as it lay alongside the grounded Congress. Parker later claimed that while he was under fire from the soldiers on the shore, three bullets passed through his clothes, his cap was shot off, and he was wounded in the knee. Outraged at this violation of the traditions of sea warfare, Parker insisted that Pendergrast order the soldiers to stop firing. But even if Pendergrast had been willing to do so, he had no authority over army soldiers, who in any case were not impressed by the traditions of the sea, whatever they might be. When a federal lieutenant ashore tried to stop the shooting, Brigadier General Joseph K. Mansfield overruled him. I know the damned ship has surrendered, he growled, but we haven't. Meanwhile, on board the Congress, Pendergrast urged Parker to hoist a white flag to prevent his crew from being shot to pieces. Parker refused. He would be damned before he would surrender his ship to a gaggle of soldiers. He sheared off and steamed out of range. Watching all this from the Virginia, Buchanan could not understand why his orders were not being carried out. The Congress was flying a white flag of surrender, yet the enemy continued to fire on officers who were attempting to take possession of a surrendered prize. Furious, he exclaimed to no one in particular, that ship must be burned. His young aide, Bob Miner, volunteered to take a ship's boat over to the Congress and set it afire, and Buchanan agreed. Miner put out in the only ship's boat that had not been destroyed in the fight, and to make sure there was no misunderstanding, he raised a white flag of truce. But the boat was no sooner underway when more shots from shore drove it back, one of the shots wounding young Miner. Buchanan was now beside himself with fury. She's firing on our white flag, he sputtered. From the exposed roof of the Virginia's casemate, he put a rifle to his shoulder and fired a shot toward the offending infantry on shore. Unsurprisingly, they at once fired back, and soon Buchanan slumped to the deck, shot through the groin. Though Buchanan was certain that he was struck by a bullet from the shore, a Marine corporal on board the Cumberland later claimed that he had fired the shot and even received a medal for it. Very well. If the perfidious Yankees were going to ignore the rules of war, he decided, they must pay the consequences. Once he had been carried below, Buchanan tersely ordered the Virginia to reopen fire on the grounded and helpless Congress. Each side felt the fury of violated honor. To the Confederates, the Yankees were the guilty party, since they had fired on a white flag while officers attempted to take possession of a lawful prize. To the Federals, the Confederates were at fault, since they now opened fire on a grounded vessel full of helpless men, a vessel that was flying not one, but two white flags of surrender. This was where the time-honored traditions of the Age of Sail collided with the realities of total war in a mechanized age. For the rest of the war, and for decades afterward, each side would point an accusing finger at the other to charge that in Hampton Roads, on March 8, 1862, the traditional rules of naval warfare, indeed the very ideals of chivalry and humanity, were sacrificed to a new template of modern war. A mechanized war without rules, without restraint, without mercy, and without honor. The Virginia fired three deliberate rounds of hot shot into the grounded hull of the Congress. Iron shot was heated on grates in the ship's furnace, rolled out into iron buckets, and carried up to the gun deck. There, it was carefully loaded into the muzzles of guns that had been previously prepared to receive them by placing wads of wet hemp on top of the powder, so that the heated shot would not prematurely ignite the charge. When the heated balls struck the dry, sun-baked wood of the Congress's hull, they kindled the sailor's worst enemy, fire. As the fire spread, small boats ferried the surviving crew of the Congress to shore as fast as they could. Those who could swim leaped over the side and struck out on their own. The dead and many of the wounded had to be left behind. Soon the Congress was burning briskly, 
the flames running up its rigging and lighting up the roadstead, and at last the firing ceased, though the Congress continued to burn through the twilight and into the evening. One hundred and ten of the ship's four hundred and thirty-four men had been killed outright, and another ten died that evening, more than twenty-seven percent of the ship's complement. The Virginia had suffered relatively little. Two men had been killed and a score wounded, though only Buchanan and Minor were wounded seriously. A few, such as Charles Dunbar, had been hit by musket balls aimed through the gun ports by Marines on board the Cumberland. Others had suffered concussions, when shells crashed against the outside of the armor's shield while they were leaning against it. The ship's smokestack was riddled with holes, the anchor had been shot away, and the casemate was pocked with indentations, but otherwise the vessel was intact and ready to fight again. There were still two hours of daylight left and three more Union warships in the roadstead, but it had been a long day. The crew was exhausted and the pilots were reluctant to maneuver the deep draft Virginia in a confined roadstead with a falling tide and growing darkness. After exchanging long-range fire with the grounded Minnesota for about an hour, Jones, with Buchanan's agreement, directed the Virginia to an anchorage off Sewell's Point on the south side of the roadstead, from which point it could renew the attack the next day. After all, the Minnesota would still be there tomorrow. The Congress was still burning at midnight, the flames reflecting dramatically off the inky waters of the roadstead, when the monitor tied up alongside the Roanoke. As the new arrivals watched, the flames reached the ship's magazine, and the USS Congress exploded in a giant fireball. Dawn on March 9th revealed a scene of devastation. The Cumberland's topmasts, with the blue commissioning pennant still flying, jutted above the surface of the water off Newport News Point, while nearby the blackened ribs of the Congress protruded from the sea, which was littered with bits and pieces of the ship's wreckage. In addition, the Federals had lost two small transports and one schooner in the fighting, and most of the Federal ships that had survived were damaged. The Minnesota had been struck a dozen times and was fast aground on the 17-foot shoal. Beyond it, more than halfway to Point Comfort, the St. Lawrence was also aground. Only the Roanoke found relative safety under the guns of Fort Monroe. News of the disaster in Hampton Roads had been telegraphed to Washington, where it provoked a state of near panic. Secretary of War Stanton, in particular, feared that the Merrimack, as he called it, would steam out of Hampton Roads to attack the cities of the eastern seaboard one by one, starting with Washington. During the emergency cabinet meeting that Lincoln called that morning, Stanton repeatedly jumped up from his chair and rushed over to the windows, looking downriver to see if the Merrimack was even then on its way to bombard Washington. On board the Virginia, Buchanan knew that such a scenario was impossible. The Virginia was simply not seaworthy enough to survive in the open water of Chesapeake Bay, much less the Atlantic Ocean, and her draft was too deep to allow her to ascend the Potomac to Washington, in any case. Still, he was determined to finish the job begun the day before by destroying the rest of the Union squadron in Hampton Roads, starting with the grounded Minnesota. That would not only clear the Federal Navy from the roadstead, it would make it difficult, if not impossible, for the Federals to maintain their foothold on the Virginia coast at Fort Monroe. Indeed, though Buchanan could not have known it, his victory in Hampton Roads threatened to overturn the entire grand strategy of the Union Army commander, Major General George B. McClellan. That officer had been waiting all winter to transport his army to the Virginia Peninsula by sea for a thrust at Richmond in a campaign that he hoped and believed would end the war. Now, McClellan had to rethink his plans. The performances of the Merrimack, he wrote, places a new aspect on everything and may very possibly change my whole plan of campaign. Just as Harrison's campaign in 1813 had depended on the control of Lake Erie, so now did McClellan's campaign depend on the control of Hampton Roads. Alas for him, Buchanan's wound was a serious one. 
The bullet that struck him down had grazed the femoral artery, and for a while it was feared that the 61-year-old sea warrior would not survive. Clearly, he could no longer exercise command of the Virginia, a duty that now fell to his executive officer, Catesby Jones. Even so, Buchanan was reluctant to abandon his command. The code of the sea, he believed, required him to stay on board and share victory or defeat with his officers and crew. Despite that, the ship's surgeon convinced him that it was his duty to go ashore, if not for his own well-being, then because the captain's cabin would be needed to treat others who might fall wounded in the renewed contest. Buchanan grudgingly agreed, and soon he and young Bob Miner were being rowed to the Naval Hospital in Norfolk. After bidding Godspeed to Buchanan, Jones made a quick inspection of the Virginia, rowing around the anchored vessel in the ship's one surviving boat. There were a number of dramatic dents in the ship's armor, but none that threatened the integrity of the shield. Apparently, this inspection failed to reveal to Jones that most of the ship's bow ram had broken off after the collision with the Cumberland. The flanges of the ram remained bolted to the hull, and Jones concluded that the ram itself had merely been twisted out of shape rather than sundered. Back on board, he ordered the engineers to get up steam. There was work to be done. Like Buchanan, Jones was a veteran of the pre-war U.S. Navy, though his 25 years of service were only about half that of his predecessor. If Buchanan was a sailor of the old school, Jones was a member of the new class of scientific officers. He had spent much of his career in the Hydrography Office and in the Bureau of Ordnance, where he had been an assistant to John A. Dahlgren, the man who had designed the big guns inside the Monitor's turret. In that respect, Jones had more in common with John Warden, who had spent much of his career in the Naval Observatory, than he did with the old sea dog Franklin Buchanan. Thus, two men of science, each in command of a warship on the cutting edge of naval technology, represented a new generation of naval officers, grounded in engineering, metallurgy, and ordnance, as they squared off against one another in the confined waters of Hampton Roads. Unaware, as yet, of the Monitor's presence, Jones ordered the Virginia to get underway at about 7 a.m. He directed it first toward the northeast, in the general direction of Fort Monroe, until it reached the main ship channel. Then he ordered the helm over, and the great ship swung to port and began to close on the Minnesota, approaching the grounded frigate from its stern, where only a few of its guns could be brought to bear. During the approach, Jones stood atop the Virginia's casemate with the ship's gunnery officer, Hunter Davidson. Off to the south, he could see dozens of small craft filled with the curious who had come out to witness what they were sure would be the final destruction of the Federal fleet. Many of them waved hats or handkerchiefs as tokens of support. To the north was the looming presence of Fort Monroe, its ramparts lined with equally curious, though far less confident, spectators wearing Union blue. After the Virginia turned into the ship channel, Jones focused his attention on the grounded Minnesota. He could see a few tugs around her apparently trying to pull her off the shoal into deep water. But as the morning fog lifted and the range closed, he noted that there was something else there, too. He could not quite make it out. It appeared to be a large water tank on a raft, though it seemed unlikely that the Minnesota was taking on fresh water. Perhaps the Minnesota's boiler had been removed for repair, though that too seemed unlikely. Davidson ventured the hopeful notion that it was a raft and that the Minnesota's crew was abandoning ship. Whatever it was, it was screening the Minnesota from the Virginia. Only when it moved away under its own power did Jones realize that this was the Ericsson battery that he had heard of, and that this day's fighting might be somewhat different from that of the day before? For his part, Warden knew exactly what the Virginia was from the moment it materialized out of the morning fog. The previous night, after hearing a detailed report of the day's slaughter from John Marston, captain of the Roanoke, Warden had been astonished to be handed an order from Wells dated three days before, directing him 
to proceed immediately to Washington with his vessel. But Marston also had in hand another telegram from Wells authorizing him to use his best judgment about the disposition of the vessels in Hampton Roads. And after discussing the situation, Marston and Wharton decided that the monitor should stay. An hour before midnight, Warden conned the Monitor from the Roanoke to the grounded and wounded Minnesota. On board the Minnesota, the news that the Union ironclad had come alongside produced a surge of hope. But most of those who peered over the railing to look down at the odd little craft relapsed into despondency. Much smaller than the Virginia to begin with, its profile was such that with only the 21-foot-wide turret showing above water, it seemed a pitiable little vessel by comparison. Although the Minnesota's captain, Gershom Van Brunt, later insisted that the Monitor's arrival led all on board to feel that we had a friend that would stand by us in our hour of trial, at the time, he sustained little hope that this ludicrous little vessel could do anything to prevent the Merrimack from completing its campaign of destruction. Once alongside the Minnesota, Warden made sure that everything was ready for battle, and having done that, there was nothing to do but wait. He did not sleep. It was already 2 a.m., and dawn was less than four hours away. Instead, he remained atop the turret with his 21-year-old executive officer, Samuel Green, discussing the forthcoming battle and watching for the appearance of the rebel ironclad. The hands were ordered to sleep by their battle stations, though... As one recalled, no one slept. Indeed, few, if any, had slept at all since leaving New York three days before. Several times during the night, false alarms kept the crew of the Monitor on edge, until finally, just past dawn, as the fog lifted, they could make out the dark blur of the rebel ironclad off Sewell's Point. Only when the Virginia made its turn into the ship channel and began to close the Minnesota, did Warden order his own vessel to get underway. As the lines were cast off, Van Brunt shouted across to Warden, If I cannot lighten my ship off the shoal, I shall destroy her. I will stand by you to the last, Warden called back. Morosely, Van Brunt replied, No, sir, you cannot help me. As had been the case the day before, the shoreline was lined with spectators. The local geography conspired to turn the roadstead into a natural amphitheater, and the weather cooperated as well. The fog lifted like a curtain going up, and the sun shone down to light the stage. Most of the spectators on both sides expected the Virginia to continue its track of destruction. Even after the spectators became aware of the presence of the Monitor, they, like Van Brunt, had trouble believing that it would make much of a difference. Warden's plan was to close to point-blank range before opening with his two 11-inch guns. Climbing down from the roof of the turret, he watched as the gun crew hoisted a 165-pound shot into the muzzle of one of the big Dahlgren guns. Send them that with our compliments, my lads, he told them. Then, leaving the management of the big guns to his young executive officer, He climbed down through the hatch into the ship's semi-submerged hull and went forward to take his position in the pilot house, a small, box-like projection forward of the turret. There, he directed the helmsman to steer a course to close the approaching enemy ironclad. Warden's battle station was unique for a ship's commanding officer. Confined within a tiny space only 32 inches wide and 42 inches front to back, a space he shared with both the pilot and the helmsman. He had a letterbox view of the world, since his only window was a narrow slit only seven-eighths of an inch wide. Moreover, because Warden had to peer through nine inches of armor, his vertical field of vision was so limited he could not even see the bow of his own ship. Unlike Perry, who had walked his open quarterdeck with the wind in his hair, and unlike Buchanan, and now Jones, who could walk the length of the Virginia's 170-foot-long gun deck, Warden was a virtual prisoner in his little metal box. Most of his crew shared that sense of confinement. Everybody was shut in, one officer recalled. As they went into battle for the first time, the men inside the monitor, like those inside the Virginia, 
had a strange sense of isolation and detachment. With the hatches closed tightly over the glass windows in the deck, only a few straggling rays of light found their way from the top of the tower turret to the depths below, the ship's paymaster William F. Keeler recalled. In the half-light provided by the lanterns, it was also profoundly silent, but for the steady clanking of the engines. The fact that the ship's hull was already submerged and that it was made of iron impressed all on board with the notion that a breach anywhere in the ship's armor would send them all immediately to the bottom with little chance to escape. Just as E.A. Jack had done on the Virginia, Keeler examined his emotions as his vessel steamed forward into battle. I experienced a peculiar sensation, he wrote later to his wife. I do not think it was fear, but it was different from anything I ever knew before. We were enclosed in what we supposed to be impenetrable armor. We knew that a powerful foe was about to meet us. Ours was an untried experiment, and our enemy's first fire might make a coffin for us all. And like Jack, Keeler was conscious of being strangely separated from the real world outside the ironclad where the sun was shining. We knew not how soon the attack would commence or from what direction it would come. And then, again echoing Jack, he wrote, The suspense was awful. The Virginia fired first. At about 8.30, Lieutenant Sims pulled the lanyard on the Virginia's 7-inch Brook rifle in the bow and sent a shell not at the monitor, but toward the grounded Minnesota, more than a mile and a half away. The first shot passed through the Minnesota's rigging. The second exploded inside the tug Dragon, which lay alongside. The monitor's guns remained silent. Warden was determined to get as close as possible before firing. Communication between the gun turret and the pilot house had to take place by messenger, and Green passed a message to Warden asking if he could open fire. Tell Mr. Green not to fire until I give the word, was Warden's calm reply. As the Virginia continued to fire on the hapless Minnesota, Warden ran the monitor to within a mere 50 yards of the Virginia before stopping its engines and giving the order, Commence firing! Green pulled the lanyard, and a 165-pound wrought iron ball, propelled by 15 pounds of black powder, smashed into the side of the Virginia's casemate with what one of the Virginia's officers called a resounding wham. The Virginia shuddered from the concussion, but its armored walls remained intact. Now, it was the Virginia's turn, as shells from its 9-inch Dahlgrens and 7-inch rifles struck flush on the face of the monitor's turret. Up to that moment, no one, besides the ever-confident Ericsson, was sure if the eight layers of 1-inch iron plate on the monitor's turret would repel shot effectively or if the concussion of a well-aimed shot would knock the turret off its spindle. Inside the crowded turret, Green and the 21 others both felt and heard the jarring impact, and they could see the bulge that one shell made in the turret's wall. Alarmed, Green pointed out the bulge to the chief engineer, Albin Stimers. Stimers was technically a passenger on the monitor, since his role was to assess the fighting capabilities of the new vessel for the Navy. Moreover, engineers were outside the regular chain of command in the Civil War Navy. And although the 21-year-old Green was the ship's executive officer, the 34-year-old Stimers was not overly impressed by that fact. Almost like a schoolmaster instructing a particularly slow student, he asked Green if the shot had come through the armor. No, Green replied, but it made a big dent. A big dent, Stimers exclaimed. Of course it made a big dent. That is just what we expected. What do you care about that so long as it keeps out the shot? Despite Stimer's irreverent tone, Green took comfort from the answer. Oh, it's all right then, he replied. With that, the men handling the guns in the turret breathed out, and their sense of confidence rose perceptibly. As soon as it was evident that his guns had little effect on the monitor, Jones decided to ignore it and concentrate his fire on the grounded Minnesota. But the pilots on the Virginia insisted that they were unable to take him any closer to the Minnesota for fear of running aground, and, 
In any case, Warden kept interposing his little craft between the Virginia and its prey. Both ironclads had trouble elevating their guns, and as a result they fired by ricochet, the shells skipping across the water like stones across a pond, kicking up great geysers at each ricochet en route to the target. With the monitor in his line of fire, Jones had little choice but to accept battle with the interloper. The ships circled each other, firing as fast as the gunners could load. The Virginia fired faster and with more guns, but the Monitor's guns not only were larger, they also fired solid shot, which was better devised for punching through armor plate. Because Confederate authorities had expected to meet only wooden warships, the Virginia had mostly shells in her magazine. Inside both ships, the air filled with smoke and the nearly constant sound of guns firing, of shot and shell smashing against unyielding iron plate and shouted orders. On the Virginia, the orders became a mantra, sponge, load, fire. Rivulets of sweat ran down the backs of the gunners, making tracks through the black powder grime as they executed these orders inside their casemate, unable to see or evaluate the effect of their labor. Powder smoke filled the entire ship, recalled one officer, so that we could see but a short distance, and its acrid fumes made breathing difficult. Another described the scene more poetically. The noise of the crackling, roaring fires, escaping steam, and the loud, labored pulsations of the engines, together with the roar of battle above and the thud and vibrations of the huge masses of iron which were hurled against us, produced a scene and sound to be compared only with the poet's picture of the lower regions. On the monitor, the loading of the twin Dahlgrens required a lengthy process. First, the turret had to be rotated away from the foe to protect the gun crew. Then the guns had to be swabbed out, and a sack containing a pre-measured 15 pounds of black powder had to be loaded and rammed home. Then the 165-pound shot had to be hoisted to the muzzle and seated home against the powder. The gunnery officer fixed a primer filled with fulminate of mercury over the vent as the turret rotated back to face the foe. When the enemy target rotated back into view, the gunner pulled the lanyard, tripping a hammer down on the primer and exploding the black powder. The two big Dahlgrens could not be fired simultaneously because the heavy iron gun port shields on the turret both swung inward toward each other instead of off to the sides and there was insufficient space between the gun ports to accommodate both of them at once. These factors dramatically reduced the monitor's rate of fire, but if it fired less frequently, each shot was more than twice the weight of the shells coming from the Virginia. A few of these 165-pound shots dented the Virginia's armor plate so badly that the 24-inch wooden backing cracked and bent inward, throwing splinters across the deck. The Confederates feared that repeated such blows on a single spot would eventually break down the ship's shield. But the gears on the monitor's turret engine had rusted during the trip down from New York, and it proved almost impossible to stop the turret exactly on target. Instead, Green had to fire the guns on the fly as the turret swept past the target. Another missed opportunity on the monitor was the regulation that limited the gunners to using no more than 15 pounds of powder per charge. Afterward, tests made it evident that if Wharton had increased the charge to 25 or 30 pounds, the shot from his 11-inch guns would almost certainly have penetrated the Virginia's casemate. But the guns on the monitor had never been proofed beyond 15 pounds, and Warden knew that if one of his guns exploded from being overloaded, it would not only instantly kill everyone inside the turret, but disable and perhaps destroy his own vessel. In such a case, the Virginia would have its way with the rest of the Union forces in the roadstead. While Warden maneuvered the monitor from the pilot house based on his tiny letterbox view of the world, Green and the gunners in the turret did not have even that restricted view. With the ship constantly maneuvering and the turret continually rotating, it did not take long for the men in the turret to lose their bearings entirely. How does the Virginia bear? Green would call out to one of the messengers, 
and soon the answer came back, shouted up through the hatch, on the starboard beam, or on the post quarter. But Green had no idea where the starboard beam was. White markings had been painted on the hold below the turret to indicate port and starboard, but they became obscured almost immediately once the fighting started. All he could do was continue to load the big guns as fast as he could and fire them whenever the Virginia's armored walls came into view through the gun ports. It was a particularly detached and impersonal sort of warfare. The officers and men who fed the monitor's engines in the darkened areas below decks, those who controlled its movements, and those who worked its guns, each operated in discreet, confined spaces, cut off not only from one another, but from the world generally. After more than an hour, it became evident that the Virginia's smaller guns, firing mainly shell, were unlikely to overcome the Monitor's heavy iron armor. When Jones noted that one of his gun crews had stopped firing, he asked its officer, Lieutenant John Eggleston, why his crew was standing at ease. Why, our powder is very precious, Eggleston answered. After two hours of incessant firing, I find that I can do to her, the Monitor, about as much damage by snapping my thumb at her every two minutes and a half. Accepting this reality, Jones decided to try to ram the monitor, unaware that most of the Virginia's ram was still inside the Cumberland. Maneuvering the unwieldy Virginia with its 22-foot draft in the confined spaces of Hampton Roads was difficult in the best of circumstances, and while trying to find the sea room to make a run at the monitor, Jones and everyone else on board felt it when the big ship suddenly lurched to a halt. It had run fast aground. Under the circumstances, this was more than bad luck. It could very well be fatal. The Virginia could not maneuver to bring its guns to bear, and with its lighter draft, the Monitor could take a position on her quarter and pound her at close range with round after round. Jones had to get his ship back into deep water. He ordered his chief engineer, Ashton Ramsey, to give him full power. The engines strained, and the ship's huge two-bladed propeller churned up the mud furiously, but the vessel did not move. Jones then ordered Ramsey to tie down the safety valves and let the steam pressure build up past the limits of both safety and prudence, until finally, with a shudder, the Virginia pushed itself into deep water. This brush with disaster did not deter Jones from his determination to ram the little monitor, and somehow he managed to get the much larger Virginia into ramming position. He drove his ship into the side of the Union ironclad, striking it a glancing blow that knocked the men inside the monitor off their feet. But the blow had struck the monitor's five-foot-thick armor belt, and as a result it did more damage to the stern of the Virginia than it did to the monitor. Ramsey reported that the collision had started a leak forward, and only now did Jones realize that at least part of the Virginia's ram was gone. The pumps could handle the leak, Ramsey told him, but it was clear that ramming was not a viable tactic. The gunnery duel continued. On board the Virginia, Lieutenant Davidson ordered some of the gunners to arm themselves with Springfield rifles and try to aim shots in through the monitor's gun ports as the two vessels passed. One young enlisted man, named Richard Curtis, positioned himself accordingly and peered out a gun port, only to see the mouth of an 11-inch Dahlgren gun looking me squarely in the face. His companion yelled, Look out, Curtis! And the two men ducked back just as the gun fired, barely missing the open gun port in the Virginia. Soon, the supply of ammunition began to run down on both ships. This dangerously affected the trim of the Virginia. Each broadside from four nine-inch Dahlgren guns lightened the ship by more than 350 pounds. In an hour, the Virginia shot away more than 7,000 pounds. Combined with the shot and shell it had fired away the day before, plus the loss of its 1,500-pound ram, the Virginia was now more than five tons lighter than it had been when it began its maiden voyage the day before. Since its armored shield extended only a few inches below the waterline, there was a real threat that as the Virginia became lighter, 
its vulnerable lower hull might become exposed. On the monitor, the expenditure of ammunition was less critical. Its armor belt extended several feet below the waterline. But once the ready ammunition in the turret had been expended, more had to be brought up from below, and the only communication between the gun turret and the lower hull was through a single hatch. In order to bring up more ammunition, it was necessary to freeze the turret in place so that the access hatch in the floor of the turret lined up with the one in the ship's deck. During this evolution, the ship would not be able to fire its guns, and Warden ordered the monitor to steam off toward Fort Monroe into shallow water, where the Virginia could not follow. While the crew manhandled the powder and shot up from the ship's magazine, which Green described as a slow and tedious operation, Warden left his post in the pilot house and, making his way up through the turret, climbed out onto the exposed deck to inspect the damage done by the enemy's shells. He was gratified and no doubt relieved to see that the only evidence of the severe pounding it had received was a number of perfectly smooth dents in the turret's armor plate. The moment the monitor steamed away to replenish its ammunition, Jones returned his attention to the Minnesota. The distance, still over a mile, was great, but the Virginia's marksmanship was excellent. The first shot hit the Minnesota amidships, passed through the engineers' berthing spaces, and exploded in the bosun's mess, igniting some stored gunpowder and setting the ship on fire. In return, Van Brunt ordered a full broadside, a storm of shot and shell, that he later claimed would have blown out of the water any timber-built ship in the world, but which had no more effect on the Virginia than so many pebble stones thrown by a child. Once again, Van Brunt worried that his command would be destroyed. After consulting with his officers, he made preparations to abandon ship and destroy it to prevent it from being taken by the rebels. His concern was premature. Within less than 20 minutes, the Monitor was back in the fight, once again interposing itself between the Virginia and the Minnesota. The captains on both ships each sought to find a weakness in the other. The Monitor had not been built as a ram, but Warden nonetheless decided to try to ram his prow into the stern of the Virginia, hoping to disable its rudder. For his part, Jones considered boarding, and volunteers talked about jamming a wedge between the monitor's turret and its deck or throwing hand grenades through the roof of the turret, which, like the overhead on the Virginia, was composed of railroad rails spaced a few inches apart. Such bold efforts proved impossible to execute, however, and Jones told his gunners to concentrate their fire on the monitor's small pilot house, where Warden watched the fight through his narrow viewing slit. Soon afterward, the fight reached a decisive moment when a shell from one of the Virginia's guns exploded square on the face of the pilot house while Warden was looking out through the slit. A flash of light lit up the tiny pilot house and filled it with smoke. Warden staggered backward, his hands to his face. My eyes, he cried out. I am blind. The ship's paymaster and surgeon manhandled Warden down from the pilot house and laid him on the deck of the passageway. The paymaster remembered that blood was running from his face, which was blackened with powder. The wound was not fatal, but clearly Warden could no longer exercise command. He sent for Green, and formally relinquished command to him. Do what you think is best, he told him. I cannot see, but do not mind me. Save the Minnesota if you can. Green had never been in combat before, and his first decision was an instinctive one. He ordered the helm over and took the monitor out of the fight. For the second time that morning, the Union ironclad steamed off into shoal water. But once Green had an opportunity to assess the situation and talk with the other officers, it was clear that his duty was to renew the fight. Leaving the direction of the guns and the turret to Stimers, he took up his new post in the pilot house. The shell that had blinded Warden had bent one of the pilot house's four iron posts, but the little structure was still standing. From it, Green ordered the helmsman to take the monitor back into the fray. From the moment Warden was wounded to the moment the Monitor returned to the fight, about half an hour had passed. 
On board the Virginia, there was celebration when the Monitor withdrew from the fight, and Jones at once turned his attention back to the Minnesota. But it was now nearly noon, and the tide was on the ebb. The pilots told Jones they could not get the ship any closer to the Minnesota than it already was. In fact, they warned that the falling tide might make it impossible for the Virginia to get back over the bar at the mouth of the Elizabeth River, stranding her in the roadstead with no access to repair facilities, ammunition, or fuel. In addition, there was the fact that the Virginia's lightened draft had increased her vulnerability by exposing her lightly armored hull below the waterline. Resupplying the ship with coal and ordnance would not only make her more battle-worthy, but also increase the draft, restoring the ship's armor protection. After consulting with his officers, Jones decided to return to port. Just as the Monitor was returning to the fight, the Virginia steamed slowly back to the Elizabeth River to receive a hero's welcome. Astonishingly, despite the hours of close combat and the tons of ordnance the two vessels had hurled at each other, no one had been killed in this epic confrontation. Both sides claimed victory. Confederates noted that the Monitor had retired from the scene of combat first. Unionists insisted that when the Monitor returned to the fight, it was the Virginia that fled. The argument lasted beyond the war and into the post-war years. If the Monitor was a victor, a survivor of the Virginia's crew asked rhetorically 50 years later, what prevented her from pursuing the Merrimack and destroying her? He and the others pointed out that the Virginia subsequently reappeared at the mouth of the Elizabeth River, challenging the Monitor to renew the combat, but that the Monitor ignored her and remained by the wooden vessels of the squadron. The reason for this was that the Lincoln administration was simply unwilling to risk the Monitor in another round. The officers and men on the Monitor chafed at being thus tethered. Paymaster Keeler opined, The fact is the government is getting to regard the Monitor in pretty much the same light as an over-careful housewife regards her ancient china set, too valuable to lose, too useful to keep as a relic, yet anxious that all shall know what she owns and that she can use it when the occasion demands. Somewhat defensively, Union veterans explained that the Monitor's job was to protect the Minnesota, which it did. If the Virginia really wanted to renew the fight, why didn't it come out into the roadstead to threaten the Union squadron? Eventually, both sides grudgingly decided to call the battle a draw, and so it has been described in most history books ever since. Such arguments illustrate both the continued partisanship between the sections and the importance of a warrior's code among naval combatants. In reality, deciding which ship left the scene first, or even which vessel won the fight, is no more historically valuable than deciding whether North Carolinans or Virginians ascended further up the slope of Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg. The more important question is how the action of March 9th affected the campaign. And in answering that question, it is clear that the Little Monitor's timely arrival effectively neutralized the offensive potential of the Virginia and preserved Union control of Hampton Roads. The Federal Navy remained in the roadstead after March 9th, and McClellan's long-planned peninsular campaign went ahead as scheduled. Moreover, the Union Navy remained in Hampton Roads for the duration of the war. When, in the spring of 1864, Ulysses S. Grant sought to outflank Lee's defenses in Virginia, he took advantage of the Union possession of Hampton Roads to send a force, the Army of the James, to Richmond's back door. That winter, when the Confederacy sent delegates to talk with Lincoln to discuss a possible end to the war, they met on board a Federal vessel anchored safely and securely in Hampton Roads. By then, both the Virginia and the Monitor had departed the historical stage. When McClellan's troops advanced up the Virginia Peninsula in the summer of 1862, the Confederates were forced to evacuate Norfolk. Because the Virginia could neither ascend the James River nor survive without its base, Confederate leaders felt compelled to destroy it to prevent it from falling into the hands of their enemies. On May 12th, two months and three years after its epic fight with the Monitor, 
The Virginia's own crew did what federal guns could not. Behind Craney Island, on the west bank of the Elizabeth River, a massive explosion broke the mighty Virginia into pieces. Then, the surviving pieces were destroyed in subsequent explosions. Eventually, its anchor and a piece of its crankshaft were recovered and are now on display outside the Confederate Museum in Richmond. The rest of it lies buried, presumably forever, in the landfill west of the river's mouth. The Monitor lived only seven months more. En route to Charleston, South Carolina, under tow, it encountered a storm off Cape Hatteras, that graveyard of the Atlantic, and in a deadly reprise of its experience off the New Jersey coast, water worked its way through the seal between the turret and the deck, and sea spray inundated the blower pipes, putting out the engines and making the pumps unworkable. This time, however, the storm did not abate, and on the last day of the year, the monitor sank in 240 feet of water 17 miles off the coast, taking 16 men down with her. The wreckage was discovered in 1973, and since then, various parts of it have been recovered. In August 2002, a team of U.S. Navy divers and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration scientists raised the 120-ton turret and its two Dahlgren guns, and these, along with the engine, crankshaft, and propeller, are on exhibit at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, only a few miles from the site of its 1862 battle with the Virginia. Franklin Buchanan survived his wound. Promoted to the rank of full admiral, the only Confederate naval officer ever to bear that rank, he assumed command of the rebel squadron in Mobile Bay in 1863, where he oversaw the construction of the ironclad Tennessee, which he took as his flagship. On August 5, 1864, the day that Farragut damned the torpedoes, he fought a hopeless action at close range against Farragut's entire Union squadron until his vessel was overwhelmed. Again wounded, this time he was compelled to surrender his ship and was taken prisoner. Catesby Jones did not get to keep command of the Virginia. Supplanted by the more senior Josiah Tatnell, he escaped the painful humiliation of ordering the ship's destruction. Jones subsequently commanded the Confederate Naval Facility at Columbus, Georgia, where his principal duty was to supervise the manufacture of naval guns, including the guns that made up the battery on Buchanan's doomed Tennessee. John Warden, too, survived the battle. Eventually, he recovered his sight and was restored to active duty. He commanded the monitor Montauk in operations against Charleston in 1863 and finished the war as a captain. After the war, he was promoted to rear admiral and served for five years, 1869 through 1874, as superintendent of the Naval Academy, where the drill field is named for him. On Friday afternoons in good weather, midshipmen to this day march past Buchanan House en route to Warden Field. As for the young Samuel Dana Green, who commanded the Monitor during the brief period of fighting after Warden was injured, he spent the rest of his life defending himself from the charge that instead of continuing the fight, he initially fled the scene before bringing the Monitor back to renew the duel. Although Warden supported Green without reservation, Green suffered, almost physically, from the whispered imputations of others. In 1884, when he was asked to write a short article for Century Magazine's Battles and Leaders series, Green described his role in the battle in some detail, providing the best view we now have of what happened inside the Monitor's turret during the fight with the Virginia. He wrote the article out in longhand, addressed and mailed it, then returned to his office in the Portsmouth Navy Yard, put a gun to his head, and took his own life. As one authority notes, his death is perhaps the only fatality directly attributable to the Battle of March 9, 1862. The Monitor's success against the Virginia led to a severe case of Monitor fever in the Union States. Gideon Wells in particular decided that the Monitor was a kind of magic bullet and ordered the construction of ten more. Eventually, the United States constructed scores of Monitors of various sizes and design including the Montauk, 
which Warden commanded off Charleston. The Confederacy, too, tried to replicate the success of the Virginia, but the lack of the needed industrial support system made this largely an exercise in frustration. Confederate authorities began construction on a total of 52 ironclads, and they succeeded in completing, or nearly completing, 31 of them. But most of these had to be destroyed by their builders before they ever fired a shot when Yankee armies captured their bases. Only a half dozen Confederate ironclads ever saw combat. After the Battle of Hampton Roads, writers and pundits fell over one another in predicting that the advent of ironclad warships in Hampton Roads marked not merely a milestone, but the passing of one era and the beginning of another. And more than a few mourned the transition. The writer Nathaniel Hawthorne, who visited Hampton Roads a few weeks after the battle and went on board the Monitor, was one such. Describing the Monitor as looking like a giant rat trap, he predicted that its very existence proved that all the pomp and splendor of naval warfare are gone by. Men would no longer be warriors of the sea, he wrote, but rather servants of insentient machines. No more would personal bravery and calculated audacity decide the outcome of battles. Human strife is to be transferred from the heart and personality of man into cunning contrivances of machinery, which, by the by, will fight out our wars with only the clank and smash of iron, strewing the field with broken engines, but damaging nobody's little finger except by accident. Such predictions were premature. Warfare remained very much a human activity, and death and dismemberment would remain its cost and consequence. Nor did armored ships mark so clearly the end of one era or the beginning of another. Iron plate, after all, is not the same thing as a steel hull, and it would be 21 years before the U.S. Navy commissioned its first steel-hulled warship. After an initial enthusiasm for armored ships in the years following the Civil War, by the turn of the century, it became evident that no amount of armor, even several feet of it, could fully protect a vessel from the larger and heavier naval guns that were being built at the same time. Then, too, heavy armor made ships not only slow, but also prodigious consumers of fuel. To save weight, Warship designers began placing armor around only the most vulnerable parts of warships, such as the engine and the magazine. Eventually, even this became superfluous, and armor plating was scaled back further until by the end of the 20th century it had all but disappeared. Iron armored they may have been, but the Confederate ram Virginia and the Union Monitor were not the lineal grandparents of modern steel warships. Those two vessels did, however, significantly redefine the character of naval combat. The officers and sailors in either vessel would not have felt terribly out of place in a World War I submarine. And even if they would not know what to make of the vast array of electronics in a modern combat information center, at least they could intuit the feeling of being part of a complex machine of war. For it was not in the technology of armor plate or solid shot that the duel in Hampton Roads showed the path to the future, but in the roles played by the officers and men who fed the fires, manned the guns, and fought one another in the world's first battle between floating, self-propelled machines of war. Part 3. Armored Cruisers and Empire The Battle of Manila Bay May 1, 1898 In the third of a century between the end of the Civil War in 1865 and the American declaration of war against Spain in 1898, the United States was transformed. Even as the nation struggled painfully through the period of broken pledges and sectional resentment that history has labeled Reconstruction, it also strengthened its hold on the North American continent, strapping it together with railroads and telegraph wires and stamping out the last resistance from the native tribes. At the same time, American industry became a force of historic proportions. Triggered in part by the mass production of war materiel from 1861 to 1865, fueled by new developments in engineering and metallurgy, 
and fed by a cheap labor pool of immigrants, the United States became an economic and industrial powerhouse by the 1890s, establishing the foundation that would eventually make it the most powerful nation on earth. If the rest of the world failed to take sufficient note of this historic phenomenon, it was in part because until the very end of the century, the transformative significance of these developments was not immediately evident beyond America's insulating and protecting oceans. The U.S. Navy did not keep pace with the economic and industrial explosion. The fleet of ironclad monitors was placed in ordinary, what later generations would call mothballs. The blockade fleet, composed of mostly converted merchantmen, was sold off. The fast cruisers, designed to hunt down rebel raiders such as the Shenandoah and the Alabama, were scrapped. By the 1880s, the United States Navy consisted of little more than a handful of antique steamers, museum pieces by the standard of most European navies, all of them fully equipped with masts and sails for their day-to-day -day work of showing the flag on distant station patrols. In his 1880s short story, The Canterville Ghost, Oscar Wilde provoked a knowing chuckle from his British audience when his central character contradicted an American who declared that her country had no ruins or curiosities. No ruins? No curiosities? the ghost exclaimed. You have your navy and your manners. For Americans, however, there seemed to be little reason to pour public money into a revitalized navy. For unlike Oscar Wilde's England, the United States had no proximate enemies, unless one counted the Western Indians, who would not have been impressed by American battleships in any case, nor did it have any overseas colonies to protect. To most Americans, the small, antiquated U.S. Navy of the 1870s and 80s seemed perfectly adequate to the limited task assigned to it. Indeed, it is possible to argue that there was little reason for the Navy to abandon its low profile, even at the end of the century for in the 1890s there were still no perceivable threats on, or even over, the horizon. Change was coming, nonetheless. It was evidenced in 1883 when Congress authorized the first three vessels of what would eventually become a new generation of steam and steel warships, the new Navy. The very next year, Stephen B. Luce founded the U.S. Naval War College at Newport, Rhode Island, and hired an otherwise undistinguished naval officer named Alfred Thayer Mahan to lecture there. At the end of the decade, Mahan published his collected lectures in book form as The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 through 1783. Citing Britain's domination of the Age of Sail as his case study, Mahan declared that naval power was the principal instrument of national greatness and by implication at least, suggested how the United States, too, could achieve the status of great power. It was the existence of a dominant battleship fleet, Mahan declared, that had allowed Britain to secure control of the sea, and thereby control not merely three-quarters of the globe, but also the trade routes and the colonial empire that brought her wealth, power, and influence. The astonishing success of Mahan's book was more a matter of good timing then keen insight. The same year that it was published, the U.S. Census Bureau noted that there was no longer an area in the western United States that could properly be designated as the frontier. Not only did this prompt young Frederick Turner to offer his interpretive essay about the wellsprings of the American character at the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago, it also foreshadowed a turning point in America's role in the world— by implying, at least, that the United States might now begin to look outward, beyond its protecting oceans, to find a broader outlet and a bigger stage for its national energy. Mahan's essay thus provided a credible rationale for the program of U.S. naval expansion that was already underway. At the same time, it provided a justification for Europeans to compete in what amounted to a naval arms race, a competition that would last into the next century and play a role in the catastrophe that engulfed Europe in 1914. It is entirely possible that the United States would have built its new navy even without the influence of Mahan's book, for at the end of the 19th century, 
the United States was a nation emerging from its awkward teenage years. A bit gawky still, its clothes a bit too short at the wrists and ankles, but bursting with the strength and power of imminent adulthood. At the end of the decade, the United States found employment for its new steam and steel warships by fighting what Secretary of State John Hay famously called a splendid little war against the fading Spanish Empire. It was a war with broad implications and historic significance, for it thrust the United States into the ranks of great powers and thereby signaled a dramatic sea change for both the United States and for the world. Though the conflict was ostensibly rooted in American concern about Spanish misrule in Cuba, the milestone naval engagement of this war in the age of the battleship was one that involved no battleships at all, and which took place almost exactly halfway around the world from Cuba, in a remote bay that most Americans had never even heard of. On the night of April 30th, 1898, a column of six American warships, trailed by three small support vessels, steamed purposefully toward the three-mile-wide gap of water that marked the entrance to Manila Bay in the Spanish Philippines. The U.S. ships were all but invisible from the shore. They had recently been repainted, their peacetime white covered by a wartime gray-green, so that they would blend with the sea, and they were running blacked out, each vessel burning only a single fantail light that was carefully screened by baffles to ensure that it showed only from directly astern, thus allowing the ships to follow one another single file through the unfamiliar waters of the channel. The lead vessel was the 5,870-ton protected, that is, partially armored, cruiser USS Olympia, and on its open bridge wing, Commander George Dewey peered into the dark waters ahead. At age 60, Dewey was of medium stature, with a compact but no longer trim figure, looking much like a man who was entirely comfortable with himself. His pale brown hair was graying at the temples, and except for a rather spectacular walrus mustache, he was clean-shaven above the constricting stock of his white uniform. His face was dominated by a slightly hooked nose and a high forehead, on which rested a pillbox-shaped officer's cap, its brim decorated with the gold scrambled eggs of his rank. As usual, however, his expression was unreadable. Like the surface of the water around him, he projected placidity and calmness. Indeed, there was little that appeared warlike in this tableau. When the new moon broke through the patchy clouds overhead, it left a bright sheen on the calm water, though Lieutenant C.G. Culkins recalled that in the distance, dancing pillars of cloud pulsating with tropical lightning provided dramatic backlighting. As the Olympia turned into the channel between the dark headlands, high volcanic peaks, densely covered with tropical foliage, jutted out from the water on both sides. Late as it was, there were a large number of sailors topside. At 10.40, the word had quietly been passed for the men to stand to the guns, and they now stood at their battle stations, happy to be there, not only because of the excitement of impending action, but because it was oppressively hot below decks. The ship, one officer recalled, was like a furnace. Or at least it was until around 11, when a light shower passed over the column of warships, cooling the air but also dampening the white duck uniforms of the men, though, as one recalled, nobody noticed such trifles. Behind the Olympia, the other ships of the American Asiatic Squadron followed at regular intervals. They were all relatively new, built not of wood or iron, but of steel, an alloy that was stronger and lighter than raw iron, and their coal-fired steam engine plants powered not only the screw propellers that drove them through the water, but also the onboard electrical generators that lit the passageways below decks so that lanterns were no longer necessary. The oldest of the ships was the Boston, launched in 1884, the same year that Luce had founded the War College, one of a trio of small cruisers all named for American cities, Atlanta, Boston, and Chicago which, along with their consort, the dispatch vessel Dolphin, had come to be known as the ABCD ships. 
Commissioned in the late 1880s, they had been the first ships of an American naval revival that had continued through the 90s and turned the United States from a third-rate naval power into, if not quite a first-rate power, then at least a top-tier second-rate power. Though the Boston still bore masts and spars, giving it the silhouette of a sailing ship, it was designed to operate as a steamer, and it boasted a powerful battery of rifled guns, including two 8-inch guns and a half-dozen 6-inch guns. The newest and largest of the ships was the Olympia, which led the column, and on whose bridge Commodore Dewey stood watching the approaching headlands. Commissioned only three years before, in February 1895, the Olympia's battery was even more impressive than that of the Boston. It carried a quartet of 8-inch guns, which, in testimony to the continuing influence of John Erickson's design for the Monitor, were mounted in two gun turrets, one fore and one aft, plus 10 more 5-inch guns carried in broadside, as well as 21 small-caliber quick-firing guns. The Olympia had a top speed of 21 knots, three times as fast as any Civil War monitor, though it was making only about eight knots now, as it slipped into the channel between the southern headland to starboard and the dark bulk of Corregidor Island to port, which looked to one sailor like a huge, ill-molded grave. There were two entrances into Manila Bay, and Dewey had selected the wider of them, Boca Grande, primarily to maximize the range from the Spanish shore batteries. Dewey had received reports that the Spanish had sown mines in the channel, but he was skeptical. He knew that mooring contact mines in the deep water of the Boca Grande channel would be difficult in any case, and he doubted that the Spaniards had either the time or the expertise to do it effectively. Even if there were mines in the channel, he believed the tropical waters of Manila Bay would render most of them inoperable, and he suspected that all the reports he had received about mines were part of an elaborate ruse by the Spanish to discourage him from forcing the entrance to the bay. On the other hand, the threat from the Spanish shore batteries was very real. Dewey knew that the Spanish had several 5.9-inch guns on Corregidor, as well as 4.7-inch guns on the smaller islands in the channel, El Fraile to starboard and Caballo to port. He had no intention of stopping to shoot it out with them. His goal was to get past them into the bay and seek out the Spanish naval squadron. In making this determination, he was not only thinking of Mahan's declaration that the primary object of any naval campaign must be the enemy's main battle fleet, but also recalling his own experience more than 30 years before, when, as a young midshipman during the Civil War, he had served under David Glasgow Farragut in that officer's dramatic run up the Mississippi River. Just as Farragut had run past Forts Jackson and St. Philip to capture New Orleans, so now did Dewey intend to run past El Fraile and Caballo into Manila Bay. The narrow part of the island was now at hand. It was just before midnight when the Olympia came abreast of Corregidor. That was the hardest part, one sailor recalled, not knowing which moment a mine or torpedo would send you through the deck above. As the island slid past, men held their breaths and hearts almost stood still. But there was no sign of life ashore. Dewey may have begun to wonder if his entire squadron might slip into the bay undetected, and he passed the word for the crew to stand down. Then, just as the Olympia was passing El Fraile, which appeared as a jagged lump only half a mile to starboard, Dewey changed course from due east to northeast by north in order to enter the bay. The Olympia's stern swung toward El Fraile, and its fantail light became visible to the watchers on shore. At almost the same moment, the soot in the stack of one of the support vessels caught fire, and a bright plume of flame shot up into the night, a beacon to anyone watching. At once, a light from El Fraile blinked out a signal, a response blinked back from Corregidor, and a signal rocket streaked skyward. An orange stab of flame on El Fraile was followed in a few seconds by a muffled thump, and a shell whistled overhead. The crew raced back to man the guns, and there was a moment of confusion in the dark as running men collided into one another, falling over hoses, ammunition, etc., 
Behind the Olympia, the Boston, the Concord, the Raleigh, and even the supply ship McCulloch all returned fire. But the flagship's guns remained silent. Dewey was looking ahead. His goal was to get past the batteries and into the bay, where he would find the Spanish naval squadron and destroy it. Consequently, the gun duel with the batteries guarding the Boca Grande was short. The El Fraile battery fired only three rounds. The Americans fired only about eight or ten shots. By 1 a.m., all the ships of the American squadron were through the Boca Grande and into the bay. The Americans had found no evidence of mines, nor had there been any other resistance beyond those three shots from the battery on El Fraile. Dewey pointed the Olympia toward the faint glow of the city lights of Manila in the distance. As the American squadron cruised slowly eastward, the white glow on the northeast broke into bright points of electric light, marking the avenues of Manila. The fox was inside the hen house. Somewhere on the broad surface of that bay, perhaps under the glow of those lights from the city, was the Spanish fleet of Rear Admiral Don Patricio Montoyo y Pasaron, and with the day's first light, Dewey intended to find it and sink it. Dewey passed the word to his flag captain, Charles Gridley, to have the crew stand down from general quarters and get some rest. If the day unfolded as he planned, the men would need all the rest they could get. Dewey, however, remained on the open bridge wing, his face impassive. But that public demeanor was a pose. His orders were terse and brusque, and his unsmiling visage concealed roiling emotions. At 4 a.m., with the eastern sky beginning to brighten, a steward appeared at his elbow with a cup of coffee. Dewey brought it to his lips and sipped. When the bitter caffeinated liquid hit his stomach, he turned and vomited violently on the spotless deck of the Olympia. The sequence of events that brought Dewey's squadron to Manila Bay at midnight on April 30th, 1898, had begun a quarter of a century earlier and half a world away. By the middle of the 19th century, the enormous Spanish Empire in the Western Hemisphere, an expanse of territory that dwarfed the Roman Empire at its height, had all but disappeared. One by one, pieces of that empire had been stripped away as they secured their independence, cheered on by Americans who saw in these revolutions Latin versions of their own struggle to break free of a colonial power. For the Spanish, it was a cruel and painful process. It was a Spanish tradition that their American empire had been a gift from God for the Reconquista, the military campaign that in 1492 had driven the forces of Islam from their toehold in Europe. Was it mere coincidence that in the very year of that victory, Christopher Columbus had sailed under Spanish colors to discover the New World. Yet 400 years later, the gift was all but gone. Of all that vast territory, only Cuba and nearby Puerto Rico were left. Though Cuba was a profitable colony, it was more for pride than greed that the Spanish clung to it, dubbing it the ever-faithful isle and resisting sporadic revolutionary outbreaks. American interest in Cuba was more than a century old. Up to the time of the Civil War, one element of that concern had been the ambition of Southerners to acquire Cuba as a new slave state to balance the growing power of the free states in the North. In 1848, at the end of the war with Mexico, President Polk had tried to buy the island from Spain for $100 million, but Spain was not interested. Another element of the American concern was strategic. The location of Cuba, corking as it did the bottle of the Gulf of Mexico, made it of great interest to American strategic planners. In 1854, these twin interests combined when, in Ostend, Belgium, a trio of American diplomats announced what amounted to an ultimatum. They declared that Cuba was a natural part of the United States, and that if Spain did not agree to sell it, the United States would be justified in seizing it. The Union can never enjoy repose, these Americans declared, nor possess reliable security as long as Cuba is not embraced within its boundaries. 
The United States subsequently disavowed the Ostend Manifesto, however, and Southern hopes for a slave state in Cuba died with the Civil War. While the United States struggled through the Reconstruction years after the Civil War, Spain survived a long and wasting revolution in Cuba that was subsequently named the Ten Years' War, 1868 through 1878. When not distracted by their own internal problems, Americans watched with interest and often with open sympathy for the rebel cause. A few American citizens did more than sympathize. Motivated by ideology, by profit, or simply by the romance of it all, these sympathizers, known as filibusters, smuggled weapons to the insurrectos and even volunteered their own services. In the middle of the Ten Years' War, in 1873, the Spanish Navy stopped and searched a chartered steamer named Virginius that was headed for Cuba under the American flag. Its captain was a former U.S. naval officer named Joseph Fry. The crew was a mixed group of Americans and Cubans, and the cargo consisted of arms that were certainly intended for the Cuban rebels. Though the men were unquestionably filibusters, it would have been hard to make an ironclad case against them, for their vessel was still on the high seas when it was intercepted. Nevertheless, the Spanish conducted a quick trial, condemned the officers and crew of the Virginius to death, and shot 53 of them before the protests of a British official halted the executions. It might have led to war. President Grant sought to make a statement of sorts by ordering a concentration of the U.S. fleet at Key West, though there is no indication he intended any more than that. Instead, the U.S. State Department obtained an apology from the Spanish, who also agreed to pay an indemnity. The fact that the United States was then wallowing in the worst financial crisis of the post-war years, the so-called Panic of 73, may have muted American outrage. Still, it was sobering to some when the attempted mobilization of the fleet betrayed the weakness of the U.S. Navy in the 1870s. The monitors, called out of mothballs, were so crank and unseaworthy that they were a greater threat to their own crews than to any potential enemy. In short, the Virginius episode demonstrated that in 1873, the United States lacked the capacity to express its outrage, even against a tired and fading empire such as Spain. That was no longer true in 1895, when a second round of revolutionary activity broke out in Cuba. By then, Luce had founded the War College, Mahan had published his book, and the United States had begun building the steam and steel ships of the new Navy. That very year, in fact, the United States launched the USS Olympia, the newest vessel of its expanding fleet. It was not that the United States had any particular opponent in mind when it constructed this new Navy, just a vague sense that the time had come for the United States to possess a war fleet worthy of a great nation. After all, the possession of modern weapons would give America options that were otherwise not available in a diplomatic crisis. A few skeptics noted that great power status brought dangers as well as options, but they were largely ignored. The renewed insurrection in Cuba was led by the poet José Martí, who quickly became its first martyr, and by two gifted field generals, Antonio Maceo and Maximo Gómez who focused their campaign on the sources of Spanish wealth in Cuba, especially the sugar mills and tobacco fields. By 1896, the scorched-earth policy of these rebel generals had caused so much damage to the Cuban economy that Spanish authorities turned to the ruthless Lieutenant General Valeriano Whaler y Nicolau to bring order to the island. Whaler had served as a Spanish observer during the American Civil War, and was a great admirer of William T. Sherman. He responded to the destructive tactics of the rebels by adopting a hard-line policy of his own, designed to deprive the rebel armies of the wherewithal to continue the fight. In order to protect loyal Cubans from the rebels, Whaler relocated, or concentrated, them into armed camps, a policy remarkably similar to the strategic Hamlet program adopted by Americans during the Vietnam War 70 years later. Overcrowded and often unsanitary, these camps spawned both hunger and disease, 
and the term concentration camp took on a very negative connotation. Outside the camps, the rebels took or destroyed whatever of value they could find that was unprotected. The Spanish controlled the cities and the harbors, the rebels controlled the countryside, and the people of Cuba suffered. Americans professed to be shocked by the brutality of the conflict. The major urban newspapers, especially the big New York dailies controlled by William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, vied with one another to present horror stories of destruction and brutality. In almost every case, the Spanish were portrayed as the principal instigators of violence and the rebels as victimized patriots. A representative example is the report filed by a New York World correspondent in May 1896. The horrors of a barbarous struggle for the extermination of the native population are witnessed in all parts of the country. Blood on the roadsides, blood on the fields, blood on the doorsteps, blood, blood, blood. The old, the young, the weak, the crippled are all butchered without mercy. There is scarcely a hamlet that has not witnessed the dreadful work. Is there no nation wise enough, brave enough, to aid this smitten land? Recognizing that Whaler's tactics not only failed to suppress the rebellion, but also produced bad publicity, Spain's rulers dropped the Reconcentrado policy and replaced Whaler with the moderate Ramon Blanco. It was too late. The momentum of outrage, combined with Spain's tendency to brush off U.S. complaints, all of it fueled by the nearly hysterical popular press, had created a climate in which war became almost irresistible. Under these circumstances, another incident like the Virginius episode would very likely have far different consequences. Though the Spanish-American War is commonly associated with the presidency of William McKinley, who was elected in 1896 over the populist William Jennings Bryan, the new American president dreaded the prospect of war and found the mounting martial drumbeat a distraction from his primary goal of ensuring the continued prosperity of the nation's business interests. Though his predecessor in the White House had suspended courtesy visits by U.S. naval warships to Cuban ports for fear of inciting a negative reaction, McKinley decided to renew them. In January, he responded to a request from the U.S. Consul General in Havana, Fitzhugh Lee, Robert E. Lee's nephew, to send the second-class battleship USS Maine to Havana Harbor. The Maine was America's first modern battleship, and as evidence of its transitional status, it incorporated a hodgepodge of design features. Like Perry's Lawrence, it boasted a full set of masts and spars, though the sails for those spars were never delivered, and throughout its short history, it operated as a steam vessel. Like Buchanan's Virginia, Merrimack, it was equipped with a forward ram, and like Warden's Monitor, its main battery was housed in revolving armored gun turrets. But the main had a curiously unbalanced appearance. Its two main turrets were offset from the center line. The forward turret overhung the starboard line, and the after turret was cantilevered over the port side. The idea was to allow the 10-inch guns of its main battery to fire both forward and aft, but the result was disharmonious, and only an especially proud captain would ever have called it a beautiful ship. Captain Charles Sigsby was the Maine's captain, and whether or not he thought his ship was beautiful, he was very much aware of the sensitivity of his assignment. Even after bringing the Maine safely to anchor in Havana Harbor at mid-morning on January 25, 1898, he kept the ship on alert, with one quarter of the crew on duty around the clock and two of the ship's four boilers on line. Publicly, however, he carried on as if his presence in Havana Harbor were nothing more than a routine port visit. He greeted dignitaries on board and gave them tours of the ship. He allowed officers though not the men, shore liberty. And Sigsby himself attended a bullfight in Havana as the guest of Blanco's deputy, Major General Julian Gonzalez Parado. He later wrote that he had but one wish, and that was to be friendly to the Spanish authorities as required by my orders. Meanwhile, McKinley became the center of a new crisis when the Spanish minister in the United States, Enrique Dupuy de Lome, 
wrote an indiscreet private letter to a friend who happened to be the editor of a Havana newspaper. A worker in the editor's office who was sympathetic to the rebels stole the letter and passed it on to others who made sure that it landed eventually on the desk of William Randolph Hearst. It was published on the front page of the New York Journal on February 9th. In that missive, Delome referred to the new American president as weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. He was, Delome concluded, a common politician. It was a pretty astute analysis, but diplomats of foreign governments are not supposed to say such things. Delome resigned, and Spain apologized, but the damage had been done. Six days later, the Maine blew up in Havana Harbor. In the crisis mentality of February 1898, it is not surprising that Americans assumed, as a matter of course, that the Spanish had somehow managed to detonate a mine or some other infernal machine under the main and destroy it, killing some 260 American officers and men in the process. The penny press in America reached a crescendo of outrage about Spanish perfidy, encouraging most Americans to assume that the Spanish had deliberately destroyed the American ship and murdered most of its crew. Even those who doubted that Spain was complicit in the destruction of the main insisted that the Spanish were nevertheless responsible because they had failed to ensure the main security. And even if none of that was true, there was still the lingering resentment of Spain's repressive regime in Cuba and the accumulated sympathy of Americans for the suffering of the Cuban people. In the end, angry Americans justified hostilities against Spain by arguing that its repressive regime in Cuba by itself was sufficient grounds for war. In much the same way, the advocates of an American invasion of Iraq in 2003 argued that even if Iraq was not complicit in the September 11, 2001 attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the wickedness of Saddam Hussein by itself was sufficient reason for war. The difference was that in 1898, a belligerent Congress pushed war on a reluctant president, while in 2003, a president determined on war secured a congressional resolution despite widespread doubts. The influential Vermont senator, Redfield Proctor, soberly described Spain's administration in Cuba as the worst misgovernment of which I ever had knowledge. Calm reflection, something few seemed interested in at the time, would have suggested that of all the possible causes of the main disaster, a deliberate attack by Spanish agents was the least likely explanation. After all, the destruction of the Maine was an even greater disaster for the Spanish than it was for the Americans, for it resulted in a major international crisis at a time when Spain already had its hands full. Indeed, if any group had a motive to destroy the Maine and thereby widen the rift between the United States and Spain, it was the Cuban insurrectos, whose tactics were certainly consistent with such an act. In fact, neither the Spanish nor the rebels were responsible. Though an early post-war investigation initially confirmed that the main had been destroyed by an external explosion, the most thorough post-war analysis demonstrates convincingly that it was the victim of an internal accident, a smoldering fire in the forward coal bunker that flared up suddenly and ignited the magazine for the ship's six-inch guns. Coal was a volatile fuel, and it was not uncommon for small fires deep inside the fuel pile to burn for hours or even days, undetectable from the outside, until they burst into flame. A team of U.S. Navy analysts, headed by Admiral Hyman Rickover, included in 1975 that the characteristics of the damage to the main are consistent with a large internal explosion, and that there is no evidence that a mine destroyed the main. In this case, however, it was not the actual cause of the explosion that mattered, but the perceived one. The destruction of the main provoked a national outcry, including public pleas such as, Remember the main, which was often rhymed with, And to hell with Spain. McKinley was determined not to be stampeded by the popular sentiment. I don't propose to be swept off my feet, he told a Republican senator but he lacked the courage or commitment to stand against the tide of public opinion. In the end, 
The outbreak of the Spanish-American War took place not only because many sought it, but also because too few made any serious effort to oppose or prevent it. Those who saw war as unwise or unnecessary kept quiet, out of either diffidence or a fear of being ostracized by the groundswell of public opinion, whereas those who sought war did so loudly and publicly. In addition, many Americans were enthusiastic about war in 1898 because an entire generation of young men, raised on stories of the Civil War, had not seen a war in their lifetime. Someone who was 22 years old in 1898 had been born in 1876, the year Reconstruction ended. Many feared they would miss out on the kind of great adventure that had defined the lives of their forebears. Recalling the time years later, Carl Sandburg wrote, I was going along with millions of other Americans who were about ready for a war. Like the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 or the destruction of the World Trade Center towers in 2001, the sinking of the Maine was such a traumatic national event that Americans felt it necessary to strike out and strike back. Thanks to the recent expansion of the Navy, they could. In 1884, the year that Luce opened the doors of the Naval War College at Newport, the United States had possessed no battleships at all, and its appropriation for the Navy had totaled just over $10.5 million. Five years later, Secretary of the Navy Benjamin Franklin Tracy called for the construction of an American fleet of 20 battleships and 60 cruisers, and the next year the Navy's budget topped $25.5 million. In March 1898, in the wake of the Maine crisis, Congress passed a supplementary national defense bill authorizing an additional $50 million, and by the end of the year, naval appropriations had reached $144.5 million, a staggering sum at a time when the entire national budget did not exceed $450 million. When the supplementary appropriations bill unanimously passed the House, the former Confederate Cavalry General Joe Wheeler, now a Democratic congressman from Alabama, greeted the vote with a ringing rebel yell that echoed through the House chamber. McKinley continued to hope that war could be avoided. When he offered a long-awaited speech to Congress in April, he reviewed the frustrating history of U.S.-Spanish relations over Cuba, but stopped short of asking for a declaration of war. Instead, he requested the authority to use military and naval forces as may be necessary. Congress dutifully granted McKinley his request, but a week later the legislative branch demonstrated that it was on the verge of seizing control of American policy from the executive when it passed a joint resolution declaring that Cuba was an independent country, demanding that Spain leave the island at once, and directing McKinley to use the nation's naval and military forces to enforce these pronouncements. This piece of legislation also contained the self-denying Teller Amendment, in which the United States forswore any territorial concessions in Cuba. Many Americans began to regret the passage of the Teller Amendment almost at once. Congressmen who had voted for it in the enthusiasm of the moment repented their vote, insisting that they had supported it in the words of Albert Beveridge, in a moment of impulsive but mistaken generosity. The subsequent Platt Amendment, inserted into the 1901 Cuban Constitution, effectively repudiated the Teller Amendment by declaring that the United States could intervene in Cuba any time Cuba's security and stability were imperiled. Unwilling to be made entirely superfluous, McKinley, three days later, issued a call for 125,000 volunteers, and three days after that, he requested a formal declaration of war backdated to April 21st. That same day, Navy Secretary John D. Long telegraphed Dewey in Hong Kong, War has commenced between the United States and Spain. Proceed at once to Philippine Islands. That George Dewey was in Hong Kong to receive that historic message was due, at least in part, to the influence of the brash young assistant secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt. The relationship between Long, the dignified 59-year-old Navy secretary, and his hyperkinetic 39-year-old assistant was a curious one. 
Long looked upon the antics of his young assistant with an avuncular tolerance, going so far as to acknowledge that since his own tendencies were innately cautious, it was perhaps a good thing that Roosevelt was there to prod him. Long, it appears, found Roosevelt amusing, even entertaining. Thus encouraged, or at least not discouraged, Roosevelt frequently took liberties with his office, acting more in conformance with his own perceptions of what America ought to be doing than with administration policy. Even as McKinley worked to prevent or postpone a clash with Spain, Roosevelt acted as if war were a settled fact, and he did whatever he could to make it so. When Roosevelt learned that the steady and temperate John A. Howell was in line for the command of the Asiatic fleet, he urged Dewey, whom Roosevelt considered more of a warrior than Howell, to use whatever influence he could to obtain the position for himself. Thus prodded, Dewey, who was originally from Vermont, visited the powerful Vermont Senator Redfield Proctor, who lobbied Secretary Long on Dewey's behalf. Secretary Long denied that Proctor, Roosevelt, or anyone else, for that matter, had had any influence on his decision. In his diary, Long wrote on October 9, 1898, that while he had received the usual letters of support on behalf of both candidates, those letters had no weight at all, and that he had made up his mind to appoint Dewey before the receipt of any of them. Perhaps. But Long's peak at being manipulated is evident in his decision to withhold from Dewey the rank of rear admiral, which was traditional for the commander of the Asian squadron. Instead, Dewey took command as a commodore and did not receive his promotion to admiral until after his victory in Manila Bay. Officially, at least, Dewey's orders said nothing about a possible war with Spain. He was to perform the traditional tasks of the American squadron in the Far East, guard the interests of U.S. merchants, protect Western missionaries, keep an eye on the state of affairs in Korea, or Korea, as it was often spelled then, and otherwise stay out of the way of the great power rivalries along the China coast. Those rivalries had reached new heights with the German seizure of Kaichau Bay. The European powers at the turn of the 19th century acted toward China the way American settlers treated the Western frontier as unoccupied territory available to anyone willful enough to claim it, and strong enough to defend it. The British, French, and Portuguese, and now the Germans, had all grabbed chunks of the Chinese coast to use as naval bases and or commercial ports. And while the Chinese mostly resented it, they were too disorganized and too weak to do anything about it. The fact that the United States did not assert a claim of its own in China was less out of consideration for Chinese sensibilities than an acknowledgment of the relatively minor role that America played in world affairs in the waning years of the 19th century. That, however, was about to change. Dewey made the usual round of formal calls on local rulers and officials. He visited the Emperor of Japan, who greeted him in full military dress, surrounded, as Dewey recalled in his autobiography, by an anxious group of court chamberlains, gentlemen-in-waiting, etc. In many ways, it was a measure of how much Japan had changed in the 45 years since Matthew Perry's first visit there in 1853. Then, Japan had been an exotic regime of such mystery that no man was permitted even to look upon the face of the emperor. Now, Dewey found it but little different from any court in Europe. Indeed, much like the United States, Japan was a country on the cusp of becoming a major naval power. It had defeated China in a naval war in 1895, and the first two modern Japanese battleships were even then under construction in British naval yards. The delivery of these ships would make Japan a major player in the Asian balance of power. But even as Dewey fulfilled the traditional functions of American squadron commanders abroad, he remained acutely aware of the possibility of imminent war with Spain. He knew full well what was expected of him. The minute war was declared, he was to steam to the Philippines and destroy the Spanish naval squadron there. Though the Philippines had nothing whatsoever to do with the independence of Cuba, it was a central tenet of Admiral Mahan's famous doctrine that the sea was a seamless cloth, or as Mahan himself dubbed it, a great common 
and that the existence of an enemy fleet anywhere on its surface was a threat to sea control. As early as 1895, officers at the Naval War College in Newport, where Mahan had developed his theories of naval warfare, were drafting plans calling for the U.S. Asiatic Squadron to attack the Philippines in case of war with Spain. The first blow for Cuban independence, therefore, would take place 11,000 miles away in the principal harbor of the Spanish Philippines. In considering such an attack, Dewey confronted logistical problems as perplexing in their own way as those Perry had encountered on Lake Erie. For one thing, none of his ships had a complete supply of ammunition, a commodity not easily found 7,000 miles from the nearest U.S. naval base. Before he had left the United States, Dewey had urged Navy authorities to forward ammunition to him as quickly as possible. But despite the near-hysterical tone of the public press, peacetime lethargy dominated the Bureau of Ordnance. Navy officials shook their heads and declared they could not guarantee a speedy delivery of ammunition because commercial shippers quite reasonably refused to carry Navy powder and shells as cargo. That meant that Dewey would have to wait until the USS Charleston, then under repair, was ready for a Pacific crossing. Demonstrating that Roosevelt had chosen a kindred spirit for the command, Dewey overcame these obstacles and convinced the department to use the gunboat Concord, which was at Mare Island Navy Yard in San Francisco Bay, to carry the ammunition. He even visited the Concord personally to cajole its skipper into cramming as much powder and shell on board as possible. As a result, the Concord arrived in Yokohama on February 9th, the same day the Delome letter was printed in New York, and Dewey took 35 tons of ammunition on board the Olympia the next day. To supply the rest of the squadron, Dewey eagerly anticipated the arrival of the cruiser USS Baltimore, which carried a second load of ammunition. Dewey's next task was to concentrate the fleet. When he arrived in Japan in January, the handful of ships belonging to what was rather grandly titled the American Asiatic Squadron was scattered all over the Western Pacific, in Korea, in Japan, and along the China coast. If it came to war, as Dewey surely expected, this would not do. Consistent with the Mahanian prescription that fleet concentration was the key to victory, Dewey sent out orders for all the vessels to concentrate at Hong Kong, and as soon as he loaded the ammunition brought by the Concord, he set out with the Olympia and Concord for the British Crown Colony on the South China coast. News of the destruction of the Maine was waiting for Dewey when the Olympia arrived at Hong Kong on February 17th. All over the harbor, the ships of a dozen nations had lowered their flags to half-staff in recognition of the disaster, and throughout the following days, boats plied back and forth across the harbor as representatives of the various squadrons delivered the formal condolences of their nations to the American visitors. Much like the international response to the September 11, 2001 disaster, the world reaction in 1898 was horrified amazement at such an act. Meanwhile, other U.S. vessels arrived to augment Dewey's squadron, including the veteran cruiser Boston, a dozen years old now but armed with 8-inch guns, and the newer but smaller Raleigh with 6-inch guns. Most welcome of all was the Baltimore, another 8-inch gun cruiser that originally had been dispatched as a replacement for the Olympia, but which, in the new circumstances, would join the American squadron as a reinforcement. Equally important, the Baltimore brought with it enough ammunition to bring the ships of the squadron up to about 60% capacity. This was probably sufficient even for a large-scale battle, but Dewey's awareness that his ships did not have a full complement of ammunition and that there was no source of resupply closer than California remained a nagging worry in the back of his mind. The most serious of Dewey's logistical problems concerned fuel. The Americans had no naval bases in the Far East and were therefore dependent on the hospitality of the Japanese at Yokohama or the British at Hong Kong. In the case of war, even those bases would be closed to them, since international law forbade neutrals from allowing belligerents to operate from their ports and harbors. 
Lacking an American naval base in the Far East, Dewey's steam-powered ships would have no place where they could recoal. The solution, though not a perfect one, was somehow to acquire a number of coal ships, or colliers, to provide floating logistic support. Dewey cabled Secretary Long for permission to purchase both coal and a collier to carry it. Long approved the request and suggested that Dewey might purchase the British Nanshan, due any day in Hong Kong with a cargo of Welsh coal. Dewey did so, and he also purchased the British revenue cutter McCulloch and the small supply ship Zafiro. All three vessels became U.S. auxiliary warships, but although Dewey put a U.S. Navy officer and four signalmen on board each vessel, he kept their original English crews and registered the ships as merchant vessels so that they would not have to leave Hong Kong with the rest of the squadron when war was declared. To sustain the deception, Dewey filed papers listing Guam in the Spanish Ladrones as their official home port, an island that was then so remote it was, as Dewey said, almost a mythical country. Dewey also had to resolve some personnel problems within the officer corps. Two of Dewey's senior officers, Captain Charles F. Gridley of the Olympia and Captain Frank Wilds of the Boston, were due to rotate back to the States. Both men begged Dewey to be allowed to stay with their commands until after the fight. Having spent a lifetime in a peacetime navy, neither wanted to miss the one chance they were likely to have for martial glory. Dewey was sympathetic. He allowed Gridley to stay in command of the Olympia despite his precarious health, and he asked Captain Benjamin P. Lamberton, who had orders to take command of the Boston, if he would instead accept an appointment as chief of staff on the flagship. Finally, there was the problem of what to do with the old monitor Monocacy, relic of a former age. Aware that the Monocacy would be of little value in a fight with the Spanish, Dewey decided to leave it in Shanghai under a skeleton crew, and he distributed the rest of the men to fill out the crews of his other ships, bringing her skipper, C.P. Rees, onto the Olympia as the flagship's executive officer. Another addition to the Olympia's wardroom was Joseph L. Stickney, a Naval Academy graduate who had resigned his commission to become a journalist. He asked Dewey for permission to accompany the squadron into battle. Dewey not only agreed, he made Stickney a volunteer aide, and Stickney was therefore present on the bridge of the Olympia throughout the campaign making him an early embedded journalist. Dewey had already completed most of these dispositions when he received a cablegram from Roosevelt that confirmed most of his decisions. Order the squadron, except for Monocacy, to Hong Kong. Keep full of coal. In the event declaration of war Spain, your duty will be to see that the Spanish squadron does not leave the Asiatic coast, and then offensive operations in Philippine Islands. Keep Olympia until further orders. Dewey labored daily to ensure that the assembled squadron was ready for combat. He had the ships scraped and painted, covering their traditional peacetime white with an equally traditional drab gray-green that the sailors called war colors, and which the Spanish later referred to as wet moon color. When Lamberton arrived in Hong Kong aboard the small steamer China, he had been out of touch with unfolding events during the long Pacific crossing. As he peered ahead into Hong Kong Harbor through a lifting fog and saw the American squadron at anchor, he cried out to a fellow passenger, They're gray! They're gray! That means war! All of these preparations had to be conducted in the open. There were no secrets in the roadstead at British Hong Kong. Most of the British openly sided with their American cousins, but despite that sympathy, international law compelled the British to ask Dewey to leave as soon as the United States became a formal belligerent. On April 24th, Dewey received a formal message from the Governor General of Hong Kong, Major General Wilson Black, who notified him that he would have to stop taking on coal and stores in Hong Kong and leave port by four the next afternoon, though in a private note, Black confided, God knows, my dear Commodore, that it breaks my heart to send you this notification. By this time, the Americans had completed most of their preparations, and Dewey had already decided to quit Hong Kong and take his fleet to Mears Bay, some 30 miles up the coast. 
Mears Bay was indisputably Chinese territory, but in 1898, the notion of Chinese sovereignty was little more than an abstraction. Dewey believed, correctly, as it proved, that he could anchor his squadron there without fear of international complication. The same day he received Black's notice, therefore, Dewey sent his four smaller ships to Mears Bay and planned to follow them the next day with the rest of the squadron. He used the extra day to complete the scraping and painting of the Baltimore and to make engine repairs on the Raleigh. Ensign Harry Chadwick would be left behind with the chartered tug Fame to accept delivery of a new circulating pump for the Raleigh and to bring the latest information about the Spanish squadron in the Philippines. That night, one of the British regiments hosted the American officers at a farewell dinner, and afterward one British officer remarked lugubriously, A very fine set of fellows, but unhappily we shall never see them again. At ten the next morning, six hours in advance of the British deadline, the American squadron steamed slowly out of Hong Kong Harbor, as British sailors manned the side in a gesture of silent support and patients on the British hospital ship offered up three rousing cheers, which were answered by the Americans. Safely anchored in Mears Bay, Dewey ordered that the ammunition brought by the Baltimore be distributed to the ships of the squadron, and he kept the crews busy day and night preparing for battle. A few of the ships were short-handed. Like most 19th-century navies, the U.S. Navy accepted sailors of virtually any nationality, in addition to native-born Americans, about 20% of the crew consisted of Englishmen, Irishmen, Frenchmen, Chinese, and others. On the eve of the departure from Hong Kong, a handful of these foreign nationals had disappeared. The rest, however, worked with a will. They tore off the decorative gilt woodwork and threw it over the side so that wooden splinters would not add to the casualties. Though on the Olympia, Dewey merely ordered the woodwork covered with canvas and splinter nets. Sailors also kept busy constructing makeshift barricades of iron to protect the ammunition hoists and draping chains over the sides to add another layer of armor to otherwise unarmored areas. In the midst of all this activity, on April 27th, officers on the Olympia saw the little tug Fame enter Mears Bay at top speed, its whistle blowing shrilly. And soon, a grinning Ensign Chadwick was on the quarterdeck delivering a cablegram from Secretary Long. War has commenced between the United States and Spain. Proceed at once to Philippine Islands. Commence operations at once, particularly against the Spanish fleet. You must capture vessels or destroy. Use utmost endeavors. Even without the two references to acting at once, Dewey planned to waste no time. He ordered the signal for all captains, and within the hour he was meeting with his senior officers. He gave no fiery speeches, such as those offered by Perry and Buchanan before their battles. Instead, he explained the squadron's mission quietly and dispassionately, and after a businesslike meeting, he dismissed them to their ships. At two that same afternoon, the nine vessels of the American Asiatic Squadron hoisted their anchors and shaped a course for the Philippine Islands. 630 miles to the south, Rear Admiral Don Patricio Montoyo y Pasoron was contemplating his alternatives, none of which looked particularly good. Montoyo had been in the Spanish Navy for 47 years, having obtained his commission three years before Dewey had entered the Naval Academy at Annapolis. He was a proud man who loved his country, but he was sufficiently realistic to appreciate that his aging squadron of two small cruisers and five gunboats had virtually no chance against the newer, bigger, and faster American warships. From the start, therefore, it was evident to him that his role was not so much to win as it was to lose honorably, and if possible, heroically. Three years earlier, in contemplating a war with the United States, the Spanish governor-general of Cuba had declared that honor is more important than success, and that could well have stood as Montoyo's motto. Unlike Dewey, Montoyo had a secure base from which to operate, and that should have given him a significant advantage, 
but no one in the Spanish chain of command, from the governor general on down, seemed willing to undertake the kind of energetic measures necessary to prepare for the coming fight. The correspondence from the Ministry of Marine and the governor general was characterized more by banal generalities than realistic planning. They proclaimed their confidence that Montoya would do his best without ever suggesting what that might involve. Typical of such documents was a broadside penned by the Archbishop of Manila that was intended to inspire resistance to the pending American attack. He referred to the United States as a country without a history, whose leaders were men of insolence and defamation, cowardice and cynicism. Such a country dared to send a squadron manned by foreigners, possessing neither instruction nor discipline, with the ruffianly intention of robbing us and forcing Protestantism on a Catholic population. Such swaggering fatuousness not only failed to inspire resistance, it gave the Americans increased determination, since a copy of it found its way to Hong Kong and eventually to Dewey, who had it read aloud on board each of the American vessels during the transit from Mears Bay, provoking predictable vows of revenge. Montoyo was equally complicit in the general malaise, offering little guidance to his subordinates beyond a general instruction to do everything possible to guard the honor of the flag and the navy. Whether from conviction or fatalism, the Spanish leadership clung to the notion that the old values of personal bravery and heroic behavior would be sufficient to overcome the technological advantages of America's new navy. Even if the Spanish had been more focused in their preparations, it would probably have made little difference, for Montoyo's ships were hopelessly overmatched. His newest and biggest vessel was the 3,500-ton cruiser Reina Cristina, whose six 6.2-inch guns were the largest in the Spanish squadron, but which could be easily outranged by the 8-inch guns on the Olympia, Boston, and Baltimore. Montoyo's second largest ship was the much older 3,260-ton Castilla, which was built partly of wood, had no armor, and had ancient engines that had broken down completely. Her carved and gilded woodwork gleamed in the sunlight, but she was, in fact, no more than a floating battery that had to be towed from place to place. The rest of his squadron consisted of five small gunboats of just over a thousand tons each, none of which had a gun larger than 4.7 inches. After the battle was over, American journalists and some naval officers tried hard to suggest that the opposing squadrons had been roughly equal in strength. A few even declared that the Spanish squadron had been superior. Most such efforts involved adding the guns of the Spanish shore batteries to the enemy total, or counting as part of Montoyo's squadron any vessel that might have been used for hostile purposes if it had been armed. But these stark facts demonstrate the disparity between the opposing squadrons. Dewey's oldest ship was newer than Montoyo's newest ship. Dewey's slowest ship was faster than Montoyo's fastest ship. And while the Spanish had no gun afloat larger than 6.2 inches, the Americans had three cruisers that carried 8-inch guns. Early on, Montoyo concluded that if he had any chance at all, it was to fight the Americans from the protected anchorage at Subic Bay, some 30 miles up the coast from Manila. This harbor, now the site of a major U.S. naval base, was then called Subic Bay. As war clouds gathered following the explosion of the Maine in February, he ordered that four 5.9-inch guns originally intended for Sangley Point near the Cavite Naval Yard in Manila Bay be sent instead to Subic Bay and installed there to provide support for the fleet in case the Americans attacked. He placed this crucial duty in the hands of Captain Julio del Rio, but having given the orders, he did not bother to follow up on them or exercise any personal oversight, and, predictably, the work lagged. On the very day that Dewey left Hong Kong for Mears Bay, Montoyo took his own squadron to sea, steaming out the Boca Grande, and then turning north along the coast of Bataan for the anchorage at Subic Bay, the Castilla towed by the transport Manila. En route, the Castilla began taking on water through her propeller shaft bearing, and her crew had to fill the bearing with cement. 
That stopped the leak, but it also ensured that her engines would never work again. When Montoyo arrived at Subic Bay, he learned, with much disgust, that none of the four guns he had sent there had been mounted, and that no mines had been laid. Very little at all, it seemed to him, had been done to prepare for the coming fight. For a few hours he nursed the hope that it might still be possible to complete the work before the Americans arrived. But the very next day, he learned that the Americans had left the China coast and were already en route. Confronted with this reality, Montoyo called a council of war on board the Reina Cristina, where to a man, his captains voted to return to Manila Bay and fight the Americans there. It is a measure of Spanish fatalism that the decisive argument in this discussion was that the water in Manila Bay was shallower than it was at Subic, so when the Spanish ships were sunk, the crewmen would have a better chance of surviving. With such logic ruling the day, Montoyo resignedly led his squadron back to Manila Bay, where it arrived late on April 29th, one day ahead of the Americans. At Manila, Montoyo assessed his few remaining options. One, undoubtedly his best, was to anchor his fleet under the walls of the city of Manila. A sprawling metropolis of some 300,000, Manila sat on a coastal plain where the Pasig River flowed into the bay and it was well fortified on both its landward and seaward sides by 50-foot-thick masonry walls 30 to 40 feet high. Atop those walls were a total of 226 heavy guns. Most of them were old muzzle loaders of little practical use against modern ordnance, but there were also four 9.4-inch rifled guns, two of which faced the bay. They were the biggest guns in the theater, and could outrange even the 8-inch guns of the Americans. If Montoyo wanted to even the odds between his ornate but elderly cruisers and Dewey's more modern armored ships, his best bet was to anchor under the guns of the city. But that would mean that overshots from the American fleet would land in the city itself, with the result that hundreds, maybe thousands, of civilians would die. Montoyo therefore rejected the idea. I refused to have our ships near the city of Manila, he wrote, because far from defending it, this would provoke the enemy to bombard the plaza. Montoyo's second option was to fight a battle of maneuver with the Americans. But there was no hope that this ploy would be successful. The Castilla could not move at all, and even the fastest of the Spanish ships was slower than the slowest American vessel. His only remaining option, then, was to fight from anchor, and if he could not or would not do so from Manila, his only other chance was to anchor his fleet near the Cavite Naval Yard on the southern edge of the bay, where two 5.9-inch guns and one 4.7-inch rifle could add their weight to the coming fight, though only one of the 5.9-inch guns faced the bay. Montoyo anchored his seven ships in the traditional line-ahead formation, stretching out in a gentle curve from Sangley Point, which enclosed Bacoor Bay on the southern shore of Manila Bay. He moored several lighters filled with sand alongside the immobile Castilla to give that unarmored vessel some protection, ordered the top masts taken down, removed the ship's boats, had the anchors buoyed, and all in all prepared his doomed command for combat. As he made these preparations, the telegraph brought the news that the Americans had stopped to look in Subic Bay and finding nothing there, had shaped a course for Manila. The day passed with no further news, but then, at midnight, Montoyo heard the sound of gunfire from the Boca Grande as Dewey's squadron ran into the bay. It would be only a matter of hours now. I directed all the artillery to be loaded and all the sailors and soldiers to go to their stations for battle. It was 5 a.m., and the sun was rising above the hills behind Manila, when the American cruisers arrived off the city. Dewey had not moved from his position on the Olympia's starboard bridge wing, and as he surveyed the waterfront, it was evident, even without the reports from the lookouts, that the Spanish fleet was not there. The Manila batteries opened fire from long range, most of the shots falling well short, though one of the shells from a 9.4-inch gun landed directly in the wake of the Olympia as it steamed past. Boston and Concord replied with two 8-inch shells each, 
which landed near the Spanish batteries, but it was little more than a gesture, since Manila was not Dewey's target, and in any case he wanted to husband his ammunition. As the sun spread its light across the misty haze of the bay, lookouts on the Olympia spotted a line of gray and white vessels, four miles to the south, anchored in an irregular crescent off Sangley Point, near Cavite Naval Yard. Dewey immediately ordered the Olympia to turn toward them and increase speed to eight knots. The Baltimore, Raleigh, Concord, Petrel, and Boston all followed in the Olympia's wake, large battle flags flying from every masthead and with bands playing patriotic airs on at least two of the ships. The three transports remained behind, beyond the range of the Spanish guns, but close enough to tow crippled ships out of the battle line if necessary. Dewey's battle plan was a simple one. The Olympia would lead the American warships past the Spanish vessels, each firing in turn, and then it would circle back to pass the enemy again on the other tack. He was determined to come as close to the Spanish as he could without running aground. He remained concerned about his squadron's limited ammunition and wanted to make sure that every shot counted. The Americans had a chart of the bay, and it showed plenty of deep water up to within 2,000 yards of the Spanish position. But Dewey was taking no chances. From the Olympia's bluff bow, a leadsman regularly hurled a weighted line out in front of the ship, reeled it in after it struck bottom, and called out the depth of the water under the hull. At a few minutes past five, the Spanish battery on Sangley Point opened fire, though the shots fell well short. The Spanish had a virtually unlimited supply of ammunition and could afford to be wasteful. Dewey held his fire. Still attired in his dress-white uniform, the constricting collar buttoned up to the chin, Dewey was the very picture of stoicism, though others on the Olympia had made pragmatic adjustments to their clothing. The gunners had stripped to the waist in the tropical heat, and they stood silent in the tension-filled run-up to battle. One participant recalled that there was no sound but for the steady chunk, chunk, chunk of the engines and the monotonous voice of the leadsman. Down below, in the engine room, the stokers fed the fires, ignorant of what was happening topside, except for infrequent updates shouted down to them by thoughtful sailors. They had been allowed a break at 4.30 a.m., but once the action began, they would remain shut up in their little hole until the battle was over. At about 5.15, the Spanish ships opened fire, the 6.2-inch guns of the Reina Cristina throwing up large plumes of water in front of Olympia, the shells landing closer now, but still well short. The American ships remained silent for another 15 minutes, a passage of time that seemed like hours to the waiting gunners. Finally, at about 5.40, with the two fleets nearly parallel to one another, and about 5,000 yards apart, two and a half nautical miles, Dewey turned to the Olympia's captain and said laconically, You may fire when ready, Gridley. Gridley passed the order, and the eight-inch guns of the Olympia's forward turrets spoke. Immediately, the guns on every U.S. ship opened as well. A witness on the Olympia recalled that the Americans poured out such a rapid hail of projectiles that it seemed to him that the Spanish ships staggered under the shock. Down below, in the Olympia's engine room, the stokers were aware that the battle had been joined at last. We could tell when our guns opened fire by the way the ship shook, recalled stoker Charles H. Twitchell. We could scarcely stand on our feet, the vibration was so great. The ship shook so fearfully that the soot and cinders poured down on us in clouds. Like the battles on Lake Erie and at Hampton Roads, the Battle of Manila Bay was a gun duel. Neither mines nor torpedoes played any important role in the fight, nor did any of the opposing warships get close enough to ram one another. Early in the battle, two small vessels came out from behind the main Spanish battle line, and one of them steamed toward the Olympia with apparent hostile intent. The Americans concluded that it was a torpedo boat bent on a suicide mission. A hailstorm of American shells sank it, and the other vessel turned back and ran itself aground near Sangley Point. After the battle, 
A British businessman claimed ownership of the wreck of the small boat that beached itself near Sangley Point and insisted that it had merely been trying to get out of the way of the fighting by running to Manila. Most Americans, however, continued to insist that it, or its consort, or both, had been Spanish torpedo boats. Except for that, both sides relied exclusively on gunfire. The American ships cruised slowly past the Spanish battle line, the guns of the port side battery firing as fast as the gunners could load them, both sides firing at will. When the entire fleet had passed, Dewey ordered the Olympia to make a 180-degree turn to port and retrace the same course back again, this time a little closer to the target and with the starboard batteries firing. His plan was to run back and forth in a figure-eight pattern in front of the Spanish fleet, moving closer at each pass and firing alternately from the port and starboard batteries until the Spanish surrendered or were destroyed. The noise was tremendous, and visibility was soon significantly limited due to the clouds of smoke that roiled up from the opposing battle lines. Both sides were using black powder, which generated great clouds of white smoke. That, mingled with the black smoke from the funnels of the American ships and the mist of the morning fog, enshrouded the scene of battle with a smog-like haze. From a range of nearly two miles, it was hard to tell what effect, if any, the guns were having. Near misses sent geysers of water onto the decks of American vessels. Overhead wires and signal halyards were sheared, and a few shells actually struck the American ships, though none of them found a vital target. For the most part, the Spanish remained anchored in their stationary battle line. At one point, Montoyo's flagship, the Reina Cristina, made a short-lived effort to come out and attack the Americans, more, perhaps, for the sake of honor than because it promised any tactical advantage. But as soon as the Reina Cristina moved from its anchorage, it became the target of every gun in the American squadron and was battered by a number of hits, including one from an 8-inch shell that tore through the vessel bow to stern, killing a score of men and wrecking the ship's steering gear. A fire in two places, the Cristina ran aground off Sangley Point, and Montoyo shifted his flag to the Isla de Cuba. Showing no concern for the scarcity of ammunition, the American gunners loaded and fired as fast as they could. The routine of firing the big naval guns had changed a bit in the three and a half decades since Hampton Roads. One change was that the guns were now loaded at the breech rather than at the muzzle. After each round, it was the responsibility of the gun captain to unlock and throw open the breech block. He then stood aside while others washed off the powder residue from breech block and the bore and shoved another round of shell and powder into the chamber. The second captain then closed and locked the breech with a heavy clang, put in a new primer, and reported the gun ready. But at this point, the routine reverted to the time-honored practice of Navy's past. As a contemporary noted, each gun was loaded and fired independently, and it was up to each gun captain to select a target, determine the range, aim, and fire his weapon. As in the age of sail, the gun captains at Manila Bay leaned over the gun barrel, sighting with the naked eye. The difference was that now they sighted on a target that was as much as two miles or more away. Determining the range to the target was a matter of sighting on cross bearings while glancing at a chart. Though the target was motionless, the U.S. ships were underway, and as a result, each gun captain had to wait for the target to pass across his line of vision. At the same time, the American ships were also rising and falling as they responded to the gentle swell in the bay, and the target therefore swam before the gunner's eyes, moving up and down as well as right to left. As each gun captain watched and waited for the right moment, he called out a series of orders to the men of the gun crew, who trained the gun to the right or left using a series of hand wheels connected to gears. Right, he would call out, as the target moved across his line of sight. Then perhaps, as the result of a slight shift in the helm of his own vessel, he would shout, Left! Finally, when the light of sight strikes the target, the gun captain would jump aside and yank the lock string in his hand. At once, 
there was a thunderous crash and a great stifling cloud of smoke, and the gun's recoil sent it flying backward as if it were a projectile itself. But thanks to a hydraulic cylinder, it quickly slowed and stopped, and the whole process started over again as the gun captain flung open the breech block to receive the next round. It is not surprising that American marksmanship was terrible. Post-war analysis showed just how awful American marksmanship was. Out of 9,500 shells fired by ships of the American squadron, only 123 of them actually hit a Spanish vessel, an efficiency of about 1.3%. The best record was achieved by the largest guns. Of 405 shells fired by the 8-inch rifles on the three big American cruisers, 16 of them, nearly 4%, found their target. Spanish marksmanship, however, was even worse. One American officer admitted candidly that in the early part of the action, our firing was wild. Lacking any more effective way to determine the range or aim the guns except by line of sight, hitting a target at 5,000 yards was more a matter of luck than skill. The fact was that the range of the naval guns had outstripped the ability of the gunners to put their ordnance on target. On Lake Erie, and especially at Hampton Roads, the gunners had fired into targets so close they could hardly miss, even with smooth-bore iron cannon. On Manila Bay, the rifled steel guns dramatically increased the range, but without any way to coordinate the fire or put the guns on target, most of the shots flew high or wide. Moreover, firing by ricochet, skipping the shells across the surface of the water, as the ironclads had done at Hampton Roads, was no longer practical. A gunnery officer on the Olympia noted that although direct hits were difficult, ricochet effects were worthless. He recalled a sense of exasperation as he noted a large percentage of misses from our well-aimed guns. It was hot work, literally as well as figuratively. The men at the guns had stripped off their shirts even before the action had begun, and they fought now with their heads bound up in water-soaked towels. Those who served in the steel-jacketed gun turrets, where the air was stagnant and the heat all but unbearable, stripped to their undershorts, a few keeping on only their shoes to prevent their feet from burning on the hot deck plate. Down below in the engine room, where the temperature neared 200 degrees, it was so unbearably fierce at times, one stoker recalled, that our hands and wrists would seem on fire, and we had to plunge them in water. The oppressive conditions did not stifle enthusiasm. On the Raleigh, a junior officer went down into the fire room to check on the stokers and found the men singing, There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight, as they worked. On the Olympia, however, three of the stokers passed out from the heat and had to be hoisted unconscious up to the deck. After the third pass, the Americans had come within 2,000 yards, one nautical mile of the Spanish battle line. From this range, the American guns should have been doing serious damage, and in fact they were. But that was not immediately evident to the knot of senior officers watching from the bridge of the Olympia. As one of them reported later, at that distance in a smooth sea, we ought to have made a large percentage of hits, yet so far as we could judge, we had not sensibly crippled the foe. Though Dewey's stoic expression never changed, he was growing increasingly worried. If the Spanish fleet remained intact after the Americans fired off all their ammunition, it would not matter if his own ships remained substantially unhurt. He would have to abandon the contest and withdraw. The Olympia had been hit five times already, one shell striking the hole just below the bridge where Dewey was standing, though by fate or by chance, none of those shells had done any serious damage. But Dewey did not know the condition of the other vessels in the American squadron. As far as he knew, they had suffered grievous casualties, and the Spanish ships continued to fire defiantly. One American officer noted that the Spanish ensigns still flew and their broadsides still thundered. An American sailor wrote simply that they fought like beasts at bay. By the time the American ships began their fifth pass, just after 7 a.m., 
there were still no visible signs of the execution wrought by our guns. Then, at 7.35, after two hours of battle, Gridley approached Dewey with a startling piece of information. He had just been informed that the Olympia had only 15 rounds of 5-inch ammunition left. 15 rounds could be fired away in a matter of minutes. The Olympia would still have her four big guns, but without the five-inch guns, its rate of fire would fall off dramatically. And if the five-inch ammunition was so badly depleted, how long before the eight-inch ammunition began to run out? This was the scenario Dewey had feared most. His ships would be out of ammunition, with no way of getting any more, in the face of a still-defiant Spanish fleet possessed of unlimited quantities of ammunition and ready for battle. He would be helpless. It was a most anxious moment for me, he later recalled. So far as I could see, the Spanish squadron was as intact as ours. I had reason to believe that their supply of ammunition was as ample as ours was limited. He saw no option but to call off the fight and withdraw out of range in order to redistribute ammunition among the ships and perhaps reassess the situation. He ordered the fleet to withdraw from action. The Olympia turned away from the roiling smoke and led the American squadron off toward the center of the bay. Though he retained his characteristic impassive expression, his mood was dark. A volunteer officer on the bridge wrote later, I do not exaggerate in the least when I say that as we hauled off into the bay, the gloom on the bridge of the Olympia was thicker than a London fog in November. Ironically, while the mood on the bridge reflected disappointment and despondency, the men at the guns were upbeat and optimistic. The embedded journalist, acting Lieutenant Joseph Stickney, while making the rounds of the ship, was stopped frequently by the smoke-blackened gunners, who wanted to know why they were breaking off the action. Not wanting to depress their obviously high morale, he told them that we were merely hauling off for breakfast. When Stickney returned to the bridge and reported what he had said to Dewey, the Commodore replied that he could give any reason he wanted, except the real one. But Dewey's dark mood soon improved. Once the fleet had hauled off and some of the battle smoke lifted, it became evident that the Spanish fleet had been considerably damaged after all. He could see flames rising from both of the Spanish cruisers, and occasional muffled explosions aboard both ships indicated that they had been badly hurt, perhaps fatally so. Then Dewey got even better news. It turned out that the previous report about the scarcity of ammunition had been an error. It was not that there were only 15 rounds left. Rather, only 15 rounds had been expended. There was plenty of ammunition left, more than enough to continue the battle and finish off the Spanish fleet. Dewey needn't have broken off the battle at all, for he was clearly winning. Having done so, however, he now issued the order for the crews to go to breakfast and for commanding officers to report their casualties. He still did not know how much damage his own squadron had suffered. As the American captains came aboard, one by one, they reported the absence of any casualties. Most of them offered this information diffidently, even apologetically. Raised in the age of wooden ships and iron men, they had become accustomed to the notion that the heroism of a ship's crew could be measured by its butcher's bill of killed and wounded. Perry's victory on Lake Erie had been particularly glorious, in part, because the casualties had been so heavy. Now each of Dewey's captains reported that they had suffered no fatalities, none at all, and no serious damage to their ships. The ship that had suffered the most damage was the Baltimore. Montoyo had incorrectly identified her as a battleship and had ordered his gunners to concentrate on her. In consequence, she had been hit six times, though not seriously. Indeed, the hand of Providence seemed to have guided the flight of some of the shells. In one case, a five-inch armor-piercing shell had passed through two groups of sailors on the Baltimore without hitting any of them struck a steel beam, and was deflected upward through a hatch cover, hitting the recoil cylinder of the port six-inch gun. Then it fell to the deck, where it spun like a top before it finally skittered over the side, all without exploding. The Boston 
had been hit four times, and one 6.2-inch shell had exploded in the officer's wardroom, but since the room had been unoccupied at the time, there had been no injuries. It was all right then. The ships of the American squadron were uninjured, there was plenty of ammunition on hand, and the Spanish fleet was seriously damaged. As soon as the men had a chance to grab something to eat, Dewey could renew the action and finish the job. The sailors munched away happily, though many of them passed up the opportunity to eat in order to grab a few moments of sleep. The breakfast laid out by the stewards in a corner of the officer's wardroom went largely untouched. One reason, perhaps, was that the sardines, canned beef, and hardtack lay on the same table as the surgeon's knives, saws, and probes, since the wardroom served as the surgeon's cockpit during battle stations. All this time, fires continued to burn out of control on the Spanish ships, and even from a dozen miles away, the men on the American vessels could hear frequent explosions from deep inside the hulls of their adversaries. The second round of fighting began at 11.15. By now, there was no doubt left about the outcome. The Baltimore led the American battle line, which closed to within less than 2,000 yards to finish off the badly crippled Spanish vessels, all but a few of which had retired behind Sangley Point. Spanish fire was slow, irregular, and inaccurate, and the few vessels still able to resist at all fired only about a dozen shells while being pounded by the American warships. If American casualties were minimal, Spanish casualties were horrific. The grounded Reina Cristina was hit 70 times, and out of a complement of 493 men, some 330 were either dead or missing, and another 90 had been wounded, a casualty rate of over 80%. The unarmored Castilla, her wooden hull still painted peacetime white, burned out of control. The Don Antonio de Ulloa 